Hi, and uh, welcome back to the fourth day of the sixth edition of Node Forum 2020 here in uh, Musantum in Frankfurt. I'm Jana Nora Kummer, and with me in, uh, is the tablet Jeremy Bailey, the famous <laughs> new media artist. Hi, Jeremy. It's the tablet, yeah. <laughs> yeah hi. hi, how's it going? Yeah, I'm, um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, yesterday, you, you remember, I was really depressed, got better over the day. And yeah. I thought what really helped actually were uh, the, your jokes in the end. <laughs> Maybe, <laughs> actually, well, who, who, what, what are you, Jeremy? Oh, today I'm a polar bear. Ah, okay. Yeah. Yeah, makes um, sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or do you want to yeah, elaborate? <laughs> no, no, you know, just a polar bear. Well, you know, like, first of all, I live in Canada and polar bears are like, you know, second citizen. They're just, you know, have a neighbor who's a polar bear, basically. Uh, and uh, I think as a symbol of climate change, right, it's a, it's a great s symbol, of course, a symbol of, um, you know, the polar bear stranded on the iceberg, everything melting around them. It, it, it like kind of, kind of brings like a visual sense to, oh my, the urgency, uh, the you know, this, their, their territory is literally melting away. So oh. um, also I, I have some jokes, polar bear jokes. That I uh, and, you know, about. do you remember like the, the would you rather? We can we can um, ask our guests the would you rather with the polar uh, bear. Oh, yeah. What was it? Would you rather be a polar no, no, bear? No, no, don't, don't, don't spoil it yet. I oh. know it. We will, we will ask <laughs> okay. them in a second. Okay. Oh, okay. Okay. Katia is there. Just say. Okay. Um, oh, cool. <laughs> uh, so, okay. Yeah. Let's start with the jokes, no? <laughs> and then we go over. Okay. Okay, yeah, totally terrible jokes is a great way to start the day. Okay, so let's do the first one. What what happens to polar bears if they sit on the ice too long? Ooh, this is a hard one. Polaroids! <laughs> anyway, that's a terrible joke. <laughs> okay, here's another one. I think you'll like this one. Okay, what do pe polar bears like to eat? Mm. Penguins. Rob, well, no, 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 see, no, no, seagulls are not, uh, Rob, Rob, Robin, Robin. <laughs> what, what's Robin? Mm, no, burritos, burritos. <laughs> oh, man, these uh, are really okay. Uh, <laughs> okay, okay, one last one. One, one uh, last one, then we go over. Okay, okay. So Why do polar bears live only in the North Pole? Okay. Otherwise, they'd be bipolar if they lived in the South Pole. So anyway, they're, <laughs> it's a ter terrible, another terrible joke. Okay, maybe that was actually maybe, potentially offensive. Actually, I apologize. Maybe we should. Uh, uh, maybe we should uh, uh, widen up the camera camera image so it's not only me not laughing. <laughs> yeah. Okay, yeah. That was just to warm us up. Those are icebreakers. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. This was good. A good one. Okay, hi. Uh, with Hello. us on the Appetizer TV oh. is uh, Irene Rodenas. Mm -hmm. uh, Irene is a product designer, a digital that no digital fabrication tools. Ah, that produces digital fabrication tools uh, to develop products. Actually, ah. <laughs> and um, yeah. So Irene was part of Note 2017 as a volunteer, and now. Rene is doing day by day this wonderful speaking corner I keep telling you about. And uh, yeah, so I'm glad Irene is with us today in persona. Then so we have again Jan Vogt. Jan, the festival artistic director of Note 2020. And, um, and Katia, Katia van Roth. And you wanted to introduce hey. Katia. <laughs> Oh, I did, because Katia is a good friend. We've worked together many times. Katia is a German artist and activist. Um, she explores theater and game design as tools of resistance and, and, and revolution. I think she's here today because she's hosting a panel on taking action on agency and making your voice heard. Like, what can we do as artists uh, in this time of, of, of a need where there's a great need for action? So, hi, Katia. Great to see you. Hi, Jeremy. Nice to see you. Bear. <laughs> Polar bear. Katia, how how I like if you don't want to talk about it, that's fine. But Katia just rushed in, so are you? Are you? Oh yes, I'm are fine. Okay? Yeah, I'm I'm used to rushing in to th things. I'm fine. I'm really looking forward to the panel and to talk about how to not fail the planet. I think this is what we want to do. And for those people that stay here and think to the panel and have some time, I have also a question 
maybe you think about what your voice is, because the title of the panel is about raising your voice. So the question that I wanted to bring in now, everybody reflect on what's your voice. Maybe we can, as, as you already start talking about your panel, maybe we can just like uh, keep talking a bit more about it. I would be super interested in who's going to be there on the panel, like who are the people you invited, why did you invite them, maybe you can... I didn't invite oh, them. Like, Maybe oh, this is for John. Yeah. I didn't invite them. Yes, yes I actually, uh, we invited a couple of people, including Katia. Hi, Katia. It's so nice to see you. We just um, um, distance hugged while uh, you were uh, introducing everything. So nice that you're here. I'm so happy because, as Jeremy said, uh, Katia was already here in 2017, and we invited Jeremy as well as Katia and a couple of other artists to undermine Note 17, that was their job back then, and to question whether it was an actual, a festival is actually a hopeful place, and whether Note 17 was actually a hopeful place, and how it could be and become one. So that was amazing back then, and I got to know Katia also in Hamburg, and as she's like regularly questioning festival structures and just social structures and structures of uh, artistic encounter and everything. So um, with her uh, activist and really critical practice, she's just the right person to question people who um, bring in actually very different uh, forms of activism, I would say, that we invited for today's panel. For example, we have Dr. Samane Moafi, who's a member, researcher, member of um, forensic architecture, the famous um, artist, activist, research group, I would say. And especially she's um, in working for the Center of Contemporary Nature. And what they do is, um, as far as I understood, and I'm very glad to hear more details about it later also, because I never met her in person. This time it will be a digital meeting in person, but she will elaborate on those practices where it's all about how violence and global violence are destroying nature. Then we have Matthew Plummer Fernandez, who is, um, he brings in a very different form of activism, a very beautiful, small, like um, elaborate and, and fine, re refined form of activism, I would say, where he's, for example, he created, um, he's co uh, currently working on a vertical farming project and, and researching on it, so very practical form of activism. Maybe, um, and at, at the same time, he's supporting um, uh, movements such as Extinction Rebellion, but also the clim youth for climate strikes with apps and technology interfaces and devices. May I correct you? He's yes. part of. He's part, part of not working for, it's not possible to work for like movements. Yes, that's correct. Yeah, we've been talking about this. I made this mistake constantly. That's, that's right. You spend, I also have it sometimes. Yeah. Actually, that's going to be a very interesting question next day, is how you can actually f create groups of movement, movement groups, right? And how you can actually constitute yourself as a group to become active, I would or say. Or if group is the problem. Maybe. Of group is the problem, okay. Wow, uh, yes. What is, what, I didn't get the problem. No, I was just saying like, or like maybe we find out how to be a proper group, but we can also find out if group is a problem or the right form to do stuff. Yeah, I Nowadays. As, as well, I don't know whom, who raised the question that was in the, um, in the prequel and short one to the panel, but like I wrote down, uh, how, far, like how far are you willing to go with your own practice as well, or with like uh, inspiring people? Or yeah. So that's, I feel that's a related question as well, within like being in a group or like acting individual. So, uh, a lot to talk about. Yeah. Yes, let's but not let, let's not uh, start now because that will be at the actual panel, and I think. <laughs> but it's it's important that you that you mention this and also uh, point out my uh, mistake in, in in talking about it. And um, then there is Theresa Schubert, who is a German act, uh, activist artist, and uh, she's. I, we, we, we've been discussing in which way uh, this is uh, what she does as, as, as activism, but we've both, uh, Alex, uh, Alexander and I felt this was really activist. Um, she was making, she's making um, visible or like reflecting on, or I, I really even lacking the right verb for this, um, because uh, she, she um, 
started to prepare and, and work with in vitro meat and her, like deriving from her own cells. And that's, for me, this is very radical and also so intriguing and really um, moving myself um, work uh, and eating her own meat, basically. So this is a really radical move, I would say, and a very different form, again, of activist action, <laughs> if you will, or... Um, yeah, and then uh, we are also very happy that Joanie Le Mercier is uh, part of the panel, who's also a regular at Node and who's a long-term member of the community. And he's been reflecting recently as far as we discussed very much about the impact, well, A, on the impact of his own artistic practice on the environment, and he's questioning his own form of distribution, etc. But at the same time, he's being part of and so like yeah he's being part of uh, extinction rebellion and the galenda ah, i made it better <laughs> and and the galenda and uh, applying his um, um artistic practices his artistic forms for these movements and and joining in and, and and sharing and he's actually been pointing me as well to this problem of my formulation there by the way so you can go back to it and and chat about me, how I fail to talk about it later. So we have an amazing group together yeah. and then, um, yeah. That sounds, uh, that sounds pretty amazing. And I'm actually really, I'm really looking forward uh, to this panel because I feel that there, in the last days, lots of things have been addressed, but I felt we are still lacking on how to actually make all these changes. Everybody sees that, that they are so urgent to make, but like, what does it, mean for your own personal practice, for practice in the group. So I'm, yeah, I'm very excited uh, about this panel. Yeah, I really like how you use the word practice a lot. And I was thinking about using praxis later as my praxis. So maybe I will use praxis. And I have one more question talking about a, a, a hopeful place. Because uh, on the one hand, that would be... Uh, um, how, how I could, how I would want to address Irene with the speakers corner, but before, what came out in Note 2017? It, was it a hopeful place? <laughs> Jeremy, you too, <laughs> and Katia? I mean, I recently found a bunch of business cards people gave me that told me that where they would be willing to do political work because I was telling a lot of people that there's a lack of graphic designers in politics because there's still money to earn in graphic design, so we're lacking them. And I recently found this like number of people and thought again about sharing it with political movements again and to readdress. And I think maybe later I will see if I can meet some people again who did this. I think there might be some people in the audience today. And you can meet them in the speaker's corner then? In the really hopeful place, internet. Yeah, speaker's corner. Yeah, maybe we, maybe we just come to Irene then because I really feel... Uh, yeah, I've been I've been talking about it. I saw it every night uh, happening, and, and you were taking part of it. I was taking part of it as well, but like as well, I really enjoyed watching you. Uh, maybe you can you can lose a few words about the speakers corner. Yeah, so um, this idea came to because as we are having this new format of festival, um, we wanted to share um, like be let the participants be part of it also in a more interactive way. So uh, the speaker's corner is like the backstage of the festival where we can meet, we can discuss what has been discussed already, have more thoughts and let the participants participate for uh, at the festival. So I will show you a little bit how to enter it because I, we, we did yesterday, like most of the guys that were coming um, to the B after the keynote of B4, they, they didn't even know what uh, the speaker's corner was and how to enter there. So I will screen share my screen and then show you how to enter there. Perfect. And then you can, yeah, we can talk later. So um, I don't know if it's already uh, shared. Is it shared? Yes, it is. I can yeah. see it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> So this is the talk up. Um, for those who are you, who are watching uh, online, you need to have an account here, and then um, here on the event main screen, you will find this tab. That it's called a speaker's corner. It's really easy, actually. And then here every day um, we are streaming during the whole day um, what is um, happening there. 
you have to follow this link uh, and then insert this um, password that it's node 20. So we will try it now. And let's see, this is Spanish because I'm from Spain. <laughs> and now should be running. But who's running it when you're here? <gasps> Johannes, actually. <laughs> and Maybe I hope he is there. <laughs> Maybe before be, uh, we can lose a few words about Johannes. Ah, Johannes sure. is actually uh, running the screening infra infrastructure, the app, the work units, and that's just a few things he's doing. So he's actually uh, the person behind, or one of the main person behind the whole infrastructure, the technical. So the backbone. Yeah. Big, uh, big thank you to Johannes. Hello. Oh, uh, Hello. And as well, Naoto wow. is sitting and there. Naoto is sitting there. <laughs> so now we are performing as participants somehow, and we can have a conversation with Naoto and Johannes that are sitting there in the cafeteria. I don't know if you guys have any discussion already going on, but can we join you? And Actually, we were watching you inside of the studio. Okay. We are here now in front of the studio in the cafe. And normally at this time, the speaker's corner is not opened. So okay. for all the ones who are watching us, please feel free to join us at half past six. I'm now here with Naoto. He's one of our speakers. Hello. Hello. And we were just giving, actually, we were just giving comments to the, the what's happening in the studio. Okay. <laughs> it's weird to see you from the other side. <laughs> Like seeing the, the cafeteria where we are all the time there. So it's super nice to... And there's able. Noel and Maya in the mm -hmm. back. Yeah. Hello, Noel. Hello, Maya. Hello. They're also constantly helping out here at Node. So actually, like this place, um, it, it was... It was working really nicely and smoothly because it's an, an informal place where, I don't know, like people is much more free to, you know, participate in it. And like there was a bunch of discussions, really nice talks with um, B4 community and also the speakers were joining. And I don't know, it was super fluid. We ended up yesterday having a how to fix the UI of, <laughs> of uh, B4 and everyone was super engaged. And I mean, they had to kick us off at the end because it was so late already. And I, yeah, so if you have the chance to join, it, it will be really cool to talk to you wherever you are connecting from. Yeah. So, so you would summon your experience as a good experience. So Absolutely. Far. Yeah. 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 Completely. I didn't expect this. I mean, no expectations. Yeah. Someone told me to <laughs> not have expectations. <laughs> and this was super cool. Um, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I got to thought about like I, I had a lot of thoughts afterwards of what it means this to be connected directly. It's not just like unidirectional, but you have all these discussions with people that is really um, making the action also to be part, to be able to make this running. And you know, like it's not just about us; it's about them also, and letting them come in. It's and and you know have this loop kind of. Um, uh, debate or thoughts, it's, it's a really nice experience. Let's and say. how did you come up with the Speaker's Corner? Because I think we haven't... We had, uh, so you <laughs> came up with it or in... Okay. Mm, how was the no was credit the for me there. That was actually um, Johannes and David who... Ah, Johannes is there. Yeah. Maybe yeah. he can talk oh. about it. Johannes, actually you can respond to that question. Yes. How did we came, come up with the Speaker's Corner? They are frozen. Uh, they are frozen. No. Is it a little bit delayed? Oh, oh no, they are no. really frozen. They are frozen. Oh, they are not frozen. It's just delayed, maybe. No? I think, yeah. I'm very familiar with things freezing. <laughs> <laughs> now, yes. Oh, no, you're no, it's, it's, it's no, still snowing. Then it's not cold enough. <laughs> so how did you came up with the idea of the speaker's corner, Johannes? Yeah, as Irene ah. already explained, we wanted we try here at now twenty to create a space where participants can connect in very different ways, and the speakers' corner is the idea of where people can have a beer, sit at home at their couch, connect and just chat to each other. So it's like 
inviting everybody to just join. It's very friendly and warm place, and there will be random guests and uh, like me, and uh, you'll have a chance to talk with me. That will be amazing. And, uh, yeah, please find the space in front of the bar. Or, or on or in your line. Couch. <laughs> Actually, online, yes. Sorry, I'm very confused because now I live in online. And it's, yeah, the connection is not working really because and now here. <laughs> but normally it works. Prepare. So we would like to see all of you later at 6 for the Hispanic Corner. Okay. So they, they close it. <laughs> okay, <laughs> cool. But Super. I think actually I find I find the format or try to, to create a space where people can can talk to each other like non hierarchically and meet each other and just like join in and join out whenever they want. I would love to give the word to you, back to you, Katia, because uh, I know your your practice and I know your works as well. And uh, as Jeremy already um, Jeremy already was uh, um, announcing Katia as uh, desi like a game designer, you could say, or like an artist well, coming from theater, but as well activist and using like gaming tools to, to create your work or like as a base for your work. Just one example of what you do. Um, but I feel like Katia does a lot more and what I experience in all of your works that I've seen is to create, you create, try to create a space as well where people can meet and interact with each other. And so my first, it's not even a question, it's maybe more like why, you know, why are you doing this? And since Corona, how are you doing it? Yeah, how I spent my Corona summer. One thing I, I was thinking about, I wanted to tell Jeremy, I finally made it to be at two festivals at the same time this summer, that was really cool. I participated in uh, one uh, remote um, experience experiment was the title then I think from Chaos Computer Club people and at the same time spent time in like meet up online with I think 60 people about participatory theater stuff. So it was the total glitch between open source and com commercial software. I was just sitting yeah. here while we were sitting like, oh, it would be so nice to send a link with a panel to all the people I know, but I think they have to enter the app with a ticket to see it. Mm -hmm. Ah, no, John is saying no, that's cool, that's hopeful. Um, how I was doing it in summer, actually in summer, I was doing some activist work on my own, I created a moving home for myself to be able to change spots because a lot of my work is research work in different environments. I did a lot of traveling and stopped this during Corona. And I think, like you said, like what I would say now, because the text also Jeremy was taking words of is, is some weeks, months ago, years maybe also. So what I'm... <laughs> What I'm doing now is also lecturing a lot, and I call it activating environments. So what and why I do it is, like I I found out I am kind of skilled in reading, um, reading how environments feed back to people, mm -hmm. and environments includes other people, and I learned a lot about it with like really really high level idea of I really don't want to have any hierarchies even if I build software I don't want to have hierarchy in the architecture of the software because it's wrong and then we find a really nice idea how to not have it so I'm really like trying to keep the approach really high with it and since corona a lot of people ask me for contacts local contacts this is one thing that happened like my Revolution consulting part of my job became a lot bigger because people needed contacts in their like local areas and was a lot like searching for people that are skilled with computers and asking for like, oh, we have this idea. A lot of people came up with like game ideas and I was, yeah, I was kind of like uh, free time teaching a lot of like friends and colleagues that were asking me. And I was giving some input to different groups that try to do stuff online and like, I don't know, with CCC, there's the, like 
huge question because it's a huge event. It's one of the biggest conferences in Europe that's normally happening between Christmas and New Year's Eve, which is like really hard Corona time maybe this year. So it's really interesting to think about how can this, how can stuff like this happen? And then also how can stuff happen online without excluding other people or without making smaller what happens offline? Because actually I met also a lot of people that were scared that of internet taking away like all the physical meetings. So I think I was mostly teaching and lecturing uh, in this time and also created an activ activating environment for my own. Like I kind of used my theory to create a home in a really progressive way, which I might share soon as an artwork. <laughs> I'm looking forward to that artwork. And I just, because uh, I, I just remembered from yesterday's panel, which was called Green Tech and how the internet is a dark cloud and how to decarbonize it. And as well, I mean, I think the last part of the panel was, okay, how, what, what are we going to do? And it came to giving, like, educating each other and giving away, well, not, not away, but like sharing your knowledge. And then I had a glimpse at the speaker's corner, and then uh, two of the panelists were there as well, and one panelist, and I, 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 now I don't have her name. Not, hmm? Ingrid, Ingrid. She was saying, like, okay, she, oh, she, she was just like, talking about like two different seminars she gives, like one which is like a really kind of professional, I don't know, computer science kind of uh, uh, managing seminar, and she got, gets a lot of money, and then there is like this uh, critical seminar where like she would teach engineers of like an ethics, like computer science ethics, whatever, and the, I don't know, she got like a, f a fifth of this, uh, of the money she gets. And I feel this is like a really important thing, like what knowledge is paid for as well, because as you said, you, you were doing this in a circle of friends, like you give, give your knowledge for free, which is, uh, which is great. But I mean, there are like, there are institutions which are there to... I also, I also do jobs sometimes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I know that as well, but you know, I just like, but I know as well that this is a subject, you know, for you. But so I, I had a discussion yesterday with a friend about it. I think two things are really important to be more powerful as a like diverse movement. One is to be clear when we reflect on our own praxis with each other and to not do it too much. And the other thing is to use our energy to address other people that are way behind with their praxis and to activate them. I think it would be more useful to tell people to stop using offices because they also like to work at home and give it to homeless people instead of reflecting all the time about how we can be more eco, more like uh, how we can change our shopping behavior and all the stuff. I mean, mm. what I can share now, like the home I built, I built only with found material, at least on the wood part. So this is a praxis I can share. It's cool, you don't need a lot of money. And the other thing for me is teaching is cool and it's cool to talk with each other, how to be paid and more and more in universities, like students have the possibility to decide about money and whom to give it to. And there's like some funding for like female lecturing in university context. I was really happy to come here and to see all of you, by the way, it's a nice panel, oh, nice, nice TV. So one thing I do for, for a living or where I got money from is I'm researching at university about a place where everything is changeable. We found this place. I think maybe Jeremy have been there. Maybe I think Yanni, you also have been there sometimes. It's more or less mm -hmm. everywhere, but I will not say the name because then I will leak something. Okay, uh, mysterious thing, place. Gonna, uh, oh. what, what, like, sorry, now I was talking all the time, Jeremy, and I didn't give you, and we just have one minute left. No, but this it's minute okay. Comes I mean, to you. Uh, <laughs> no, 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 I've been listening really uh, intently. Polar bears are, are often uh, come last, so I understand how it is. <laughs> we're not always included in the conversation. But I, I will say, like, one of the things I think that Katia uh, touched on and that, you know, so far everything that we're learning uh, through this, this, this amazing festival and, and what I learned from the previous festival about hope is that hope uh, and, and any change cannot happen alone. So if you're thinking about how I as a person can change, you're already thinking potentially in the wrong ways because this is how capitalism wants you to kind of think about how change happens. But actually Katia has taught me that through teaching others and working collectively 
and removing hierarchies, we're able to achieve a lot more. And I think this is something we can learn from polar bears too. Like, no, actually, no. Polar bears are very selfish. <laughs> maybe, they, maybe this is why they're in trouble. But if the polar bears work together to form a polar bear society <laughs> and a polar bear system of decision making, you know, maybe they would be part of the solution. Instead, they're victims of the problem. Anyway, that's a terrible analysis, <laughs> probably. Um, but I, I, Katia, if you have any notes on this, I think this idea of individualism is potentially at the crux of like, hey, if I stop flying, maybe that'll save the world. No, it won't. We have to think on bigger macro societal levels. And you're really good at that. I think working with 60,000 people is something you're, you're capable of doing. But, you know, if we will all work together at, at that scale, it would be incredible. That's hopeful. Anyway. Thanks. I think that are, super, that are the best words to close our little uh, appetizer. And uh, so I announced the next panel, which uh, is called Distributed Imagination. And uh, it will be moderated by David Brüll. You know him already. On the panel will be Refik Anadol, oh, it's called Ref yeah, but remotely. With David uh, on stage will be uh, Luna Nane and uh, Aristides Gar Garcia. And uh, as well remotely, Simon Weckert and Sebastian Barbieri. And I hope you have a great panel and um, see you soon. Can you hear me? Let me take off my mask first. <laughs> so, welcome to the panel with Refik Anadol and Simon Weckert. You guys are already connected. You can hear me. I cannot hear you yet. Maybe you can have a little check. If can hello, hello. Hello. That works pretty hello. good. This we're still waiting for Luna Nane and Aristides Garcia. And how about Sebastiano? Is he also connected? Can I? Maybe not. Hey. Hi. Luna. Hello. Hi. Ah. Uh, so coming. Oh, nice to see you guys. Good to see you. This is so fun, by the way. <laughs> I mean, the, the, the generally, the setup, everything, super awesome. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah, we're waiting for Aristides, but uh, can can the regie give me a sign what happened with Sebastiano? Is he still uh, in the onboarding or? I think so. He just pink while we were getting ready. Okay. Ari, I'm seeing you. Hello, lovely hello, people. Hello. <laughs> we cannot see you yet. We're waiting for him as well. Mm -hmm. We have that time. That's fine. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so um, this uh, little session that we have here, we have a little bit of time, I think one and a half mm -hmm. hours. And um, I thought it's, it's nice to come together as, you know, a, a open... A collective of artists and designers um, who work across the world, basically. Aristides is living in Berlin. Mm -hmm. um, Sebastiano is living in Italy. Uh, Refik is connected from LA, is that correct, today? Yes. The I other day you were connecting from Texas. You, you, you are yeah. <laughs> on the run. Um, Luna, she is from uh, Berlin as well. 
And then there's a couple more people who, who could not be part of the panel, but they're also like very deeply connected to mm -hmm. this overall uh, scene. Um, exactly. So we thought we'd come together and talk a little bit about it and uh, introduce um, yeah, the, the people um, beside and behind amazing projects that um, uh, Refik is doing with his studio and with his artwork and also like give the highlight and stage to the people behind um, to really um, understand um, a little bit more about your own personal praxis, practice. Um, yeah, so I still don't see Sebastiano on a screen here. He said he is joined. Let's see. Well, anyways, I'm I'm talking over it. May, he will join. It's yeah. I'm. Uh, there's a very professional team upstairs. They know what they're doing. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so Sebastiano Barbieri, um, he is uh, also known as Noir. Uh, this is his nickname, and he's an Italian visual artist. He graduated in stage design and received a master degree in digital environment design in Milan. Um, and during his artistic research, he developed a strong sense for aesthetics, immersive spaces, and an emphasis on real-time generative content. Um, he has a pretty uh, well-known uh, Instagram feed, and he's really well-known for the aesthetics he produces. But not only him, um, it's also Ari and Luna uh, here on site, and Simon as well. They're all pretty brilliant generative designers. And we are super curious to see, mm -hmm. first of all, what, what you've been doing generally, and, uh, and, and second of all, um, also, yeah, how, like, what kind of contribution and content you, you have been giving in the projects with Refik. Um, Luna is a visual artist and creative de developer based in Berlin, and she uh, has been working freelance with artists and agencies from around the world. She holds a master degree in interface culture at the Art uh, University in Linz. Uh, that is uh, from my research what I've got. Um, That's right. Um, cool. And Luna works often combine real-time computer graphics, procedural generation, interface development, and data visualization. And then we have Simon connected from Berlin. Simon Weckert is an artist, um, also living in Berlin. He likes to share the knowledge in a wide range of fields from generative and design and physical computing. And he's uh, often also the mastermind uh, behind the, the overall software infrastructure, behind complex installations, um, yeah, pro providing uh, everything we need to um, yeah, collect the data and, and understand the data and transform the data, um, yeah, giving access to that. Mind and then, of course, we have Refik connected and um, here I don't uh, pr probably have to tell so much and I would rather give the word directly to, to Refik and uh, would ask you to have a little self-introduction from your side, um, yeah, how you got connected to the community, um, how, you, how you started your journey basically. Roughly like let, let's t don't take too long. We have first a little round for everybody um, to to showcase um, a little self introduction and some projects behind before we deep dive into yeah. uh, patches and uh, mm -hmm. projects uh, that we've been doing together and you've been doing together. Thank you, thank you. May, may I share my screen quickly? To, I have like a five of six course, slides. Yes. Um, there is no sound. Um, just this to. Yeah, a couple of slides. Um, okay, so again, super happy to be here again. First of all, uh, deeply appreciating everything about VVV, but also the community, but also wonderful friends with me today, working and thinking and imagining together. Um, so just for the people that I'm a media artist and currently working in Los Angeles, um, teaching at Design Media Arts Department, where I got my second MFA degree on media arts, um, worked with Casey Rias, Christian Moller, Jennifer Steinkamp, Arki Huftamo, and um, was very lucky to be working with the mentors that shaped my life. Origin from Istanbul, Turkey, and uh, where I learned a lot about media arts while I was studying also at Bilgi University. But I mean, very cheesy start was just this movie. I mean, I, I saw it a lot, I show it a lot, but really, really the first movie I got very into imagination. Got my first computer, eight years old, 128 Commodore, 
I was addicted to games, like literally, I mean, medically. And uh, end of high school, I stopped uh, that addiction. Now I'm still playing games, but not that much. Um, I witnessed VVV community actually while getting prepared for this exhibition in Istanbul. And also in this exhibition, he is not here, but Sebastian Knight, Clank Light. I think maybe I'm reading his nick wrong, but but he was also artist in this exhibition. And I came to Berlin 2008, and really came to like learn about this specific for my research media facades. And there, uh, I learned about VVV. Like it was 2008, the the software, the community, and it was incredible. Like last almost 12 years, I never disconnected with the community. And then in the same event, I also met Lev Manovic, and he was a wonderful mind and who was really pushing everyone in the, in the event to say, like artists and architects should collaborate. Like, they are two different independent environments, but actually data that flows around us doesn't belong to artists or architects. It's basically a combination of two like disciplines. And 2004, he was predicting this. And I took this as an inspiration, go back to Istanbul. This is, the, by the way, the first project in VVV that I have a chance to make, and ask Sebastian to help me how to literally 3D map this building in the very early homography tools, like 2008. Um, and that's how it started. That's how I just learned about the V4, the community, and then, of course, uh, in Linz, the opening of, like, Arsitonica in essen in Germany, the another project. Again, it just grow and on and on and on. But what was really inspiring happened, I guess, uh, literally six years ago, right after graduation at UCLA, we opened our studio in Los Angeles. So the whole idea was dream together, of course, like genius and pe great people like Simone, Sebastiano, Luna, and Ari, and Kyle, and many others, just imagine together to create public artworks. So public art was always the idea of embedding media arts into architecture in public space. And additionally, now we are 12 people, can speak 12 language. As you see, we have a decent male and female distribution <laughs> in a good way. And we can like really um, um, like understand how we do this together. So I'm not alone, I am on the shoulders of giants. Um, and as a studio, we start 2014 and last uh, several years is really fruitful. So we are not only creating projects for a classical clients. When I say client or collector, that means like giants like this. And this is a very interesting moment in life because as you see, these are very unique collaborations, like which I will explain more. But today I just don't want to take it long and just want to thank every single person in this literally last 11 years uh, who helped this journey. And today I want to give the, of course, as long as appreciation, first of all, Simone, Sebastiano, Luna, and Ari. And Kyle is not with here with us, but Kyle is also saying, I'm sure, hi, <laughs> if he could join from uh, where he is. I think Just he's giving a workshop everyone. at the moment. I think, I yeah. think he's, he's, he's teaching what we're talking about. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, I just want to just thank you today, every single one in the V4 community and every single one who touched these projects involuntarily. Just a thank you day today for me. Super, Refik. Thank you so much um, for this little, yeah, starting point of, uh, <laughs> yeah, how you get connected to us. Um, yeah, now, meanwhile, um, we have Sebastiano connected, uh, waving hand. Hello, hello. <laughs> Hi, David. Hey, good to see you. You're a bit off, uh, off the center of your... Yeah, now we see you much better. <laughs> Very nice. Uh, Sebastiano, um, I don't know how, how long you've been using VVVV in general, and I don't even know how long you've been working with Refik now, mm -hmm. but hopefully you can give some light on that. Yeah, absolutely. Let me share my screen. <laughs> cool. We cannot see it yet. Well, maybe it's only me. Now I uh, see no. it. Yeah, yeah. It's here in the studio. Super. Good. Good. So, hello everyone. 
I'm Sebastiano Barbieri. Thanks, David, and the other note guys for having me. I'm deeply honored to be here at Node, at least uh, virtually. Uh, I'm a big fan of Node. Uh, my first one was Node 10. Uh, such a wonderful memories. Uh, I know it feels different from the past edition, despite everything is uh, uh, happened this year for the Corona and other stuff. But thank you very much to making this happen again. Sure, so, sure. Um, <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll do our best, <laughs> as usual. It's great. But where are you yeah, connecting from today, shortly? Uh, just, just a home studio. Where? Home studio. Home studio, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. Uh, so, uh, I'm a generative interactive designer based in Italy, and in this short presentation, I will introduce myself, and I'm gonna try to, to give you an idea, an idea about my role in the project, uh, a kind of behind the scene from a designer perspective, and um, plus for the V4 fanatics uh, out there, some technical details. Uh, regarding my background, I have a bachelor degree in stage design and a master's degree in uh, interaction design. I'm uh, passionate about real-time generation of content and I'm interested in software as creative tool and I'm a VVV user since 2010 with beta 23. So, I have an Instagram account, maybe some of you already know this account, where I used to post some exploration, visual exploration or research, mostly based on particle system, uh, generative stuff, and procedural and stuff like that. Uh, I started working as interaction designer and uh, I develop interactive system for brands and events. And I found from the beginning before a perfect tool for all kinds of hardware and interaction, cameras, multitouch, sensor, lights, uh, multi-screen, networking, you name it. And yeah, uh, I've, I've opened collaboration with a lot of artists and ag agencies as Creative Candle Studios, Viola, and yeah, I'm fascinated uh, by algorithm inspired by natural process. And as you can see in, in my Instagram, I'm very into visual uh, uh, result and I'm interested in the aesthetic and focus on the final uh, result. And I pay super careful attention to, to the detail. Uh, as designer, I'm generating a kind of virtual abstract world, for instance, a particle system uh, with its rules and its behavior and it's basically a space or it could look around in order to find interesting frame or view and eventually uh, driven all the system by inputs from camera, audio, or, or data. Over, over the years, uh, I had the opportunity to collaborate with different working reality and in different fields, such as fairs, museum, exhibit, theater, immersive installation, audiovisual performance, and I have worked with various teams, and probably uh, one of the most important thing uh, that it, it was also a kind of learning process for me. So I'm thankful that I had the opportunity to learn from skilled hatchers, coders uh, during the, during this during the project. The projects. Um, yeah. Tools, of course, using VVV as a main tool. Key aspect, real-time visual life programming, creative framework, prototyping, design, and of course, community. Community is probably one of the most important thing before uh, on my side. Works. It is a list of recent projects where I worked in the last two years. Uh, let me just open something. Uh, this performance. This is a Doom projection for Joanie Le Mercier, also in collaboration with Nikolai Matviev and Kyle, of course. A 
as I mentioned before, uh, I used to work also for theater. Um, and there is a company, uh, a Swiss Canadian company called Compagnia Finzi Pasca. And I used to work with the company uh, as a uh, creative coder, uh, VVV patcher, of course. And here we have uh, an opera uh, called Einstein on the Beach, where I wrote some software based on before for controlling lights and, of course, visuals. So you're doing you're doing live sets. I mean, you, you're doing in, in in the performing arts, in in theaters, in yeah. for dance yeah. shows. But also, exactly. like, do you also like create prints in a in a sense? I mean, you're uh, yeah yeah. Not really, um, Where I'm can we get them? Uh, let me just show this thing first. Let me just check here. <laughs> okay. Uh, this is Bashiba. This is a funny name of Roberto Vitalini. Uh, I collaborate with him, uh, I don't know, like 10 years now. And what we did is immersion and theater, you know, uh, yeah, like this generative ocean large-scale projection and uh, stuff like that. So, so here you help like creating the actual aesthetics and real-time systems yeah. for... Yeah, exactly, exactly. For the stage uh, design. Sometimes our pre-rendered content, I mean, you know, for uh, video scenography, uh, I generated the thing in real-time, but it's just pre-rendered thing. I mean, just create content. Okay. Uh, just one. I, I feel like the screen is, has a strong delay somehow. I don't know. Ah, okay. I, <laughs> I'm a bit worried that we're missing some slides. <laughs> oh, probably. <laughs> yeah, probably. Oh, yeah. Let me just check here. Can you hear me, guys? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's all good. We're just waiting a little bit for his um, screen. I don't know. Let me just check on the web. I mean, if you if you want to prepare something, we can we can go over to to Simon maybe for a bit and then. Okay. I don't know why the links doesn't work at the moment. So. <laughs> okay. Just... But how? Is there, is there, how many more projects you wanted to show us, just for, for uh, the timing? I have a collaboration for Quayola since 2013, so I have three projects basically to, to, to share. One is Flexur, the other one is Giardendete, and the last one is Impermanent Painting, that, that yesterday there was the premiere in Rome at Teatro Argentina. Mm -hmm. So, it's three basically. Okay, and... Um, when you work with Refik, what do you do mainly? Yeah. Uh, it depends. I mean, I'm a generative designer for uh, Refik and I have an open collaboration. I started two years ago almost, and I did several projects for him, but also a lot of research. I mean, not for a specific client, but something for more for a uh, topic, as being data paintings, as I will show you uh, later. Mm -hmm. um, another one for Rafik is this one in January. Yeah. It's future of the uh, in collaboration also with, with Kyle. Oh, no. work. The, the, the new website is yeah. so slowly loading, I have no idea mm -hmm. why. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you so, have to so, fix it. I'm, uh, I'm waiting for the images as well, all the time. Yeah, okay. too high. 
Let's have a look in this in, in this project one more, and then we have to keep going uh, to the others because it's taking a little bit too long, and we really want to um, see some. Oh, okay, sorry. some more. Uh -huh. Okay. Yeah. Are you done, or we're waiting? Uh, just show the another one. This is a Jardin de Terre. Okay. Uh, it's, a pro, it's a project from Coyola Studio. And a long time describing the artistic purpose behind. Uh, but just the project is inspired uh, from the late, late work Claude Monet, a sort of uh, digital paintings uh, with a, an obsessive attention to the detail. Uh, technical, technically, technically, there is a uh, a feedback a shader in order to mimic the brushes. And this is coded uh, from a shader machine called UNC, probably for the VVVET, I guess it sounds familiar, this name, uh, with the possibility to influence the simulation using textures such as optical flow, velocity, uh, frame difference, uh, stuff like that. So uh, my role in the project was uh, I just take everything, put everything together, and uh, all the patches, the presets, and create a texture rig to animate the, the paintings, basically. And wow. the project wow. takes me a, a lot of time. And last year, uh, also Kyle and Nathan joined the team, also other guys from all, uh, for the audio part. And the new software has been developed for this project using VV Beta, Gamma, and Ableton Live. So we have these digital brush trophies in, in, on a large scale projection, but uh, this time uh, the project turns into a concert with a piano. I don't know if yesterday you had a chance to uh, see something uh, on talk. So Fayola showed something about the Yeah, yeah, the of course we saw yeah, this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. That's it. I mean, okay. I, keep, I kept myself busy. I have a lot of, lot of projects to show, but uh, I think it's, it's, uh, it's enough for now. Yeah, thank you very much, Sebastiano. I think uh, sorry it sorry a... for the inconvenience of, of the network. I think I just missed something, probably for the connection or. Yeah, I don't know. Like you have a. Sorry, guys. But it's all right. Okay, let's keep let's keep going. Simon, um, how about you? Who are you? <laughs> I'm Simon. <laughs> <laughs> um, let me also share my screen here. Let's do it briefly. We have to catch up. Wait, how much time do I have left? Uh, five minutes. I gave everybody five minutes, but we're oh, way really? over because time. Like I mean, we started late. We started late. It's fine. But okay, we have, see, we see. have to. We have to do this a more, bit more. Okay, quickly. so then be quick. So yeah, hi. Um, I'm Simon Weckert. I'm based in Berlin. Also right now, I'm I'm in Berlin. I'm also happy to be um, part of this panel here. Um, I'm trying to remember because Sebastiano said like his first note was uh, note ten. I think for me it was. Now it's seven or six or seventeen, I guess. Um, so also at this note, I was a part of an um, exchange program between Node and um, the TEDAX festival in um, Tehran, where, where I was basically uh, working together with an uh, Iranian artist, um, Lilian Nijapur, and we did um, basically like a, a yeah like some kind of um, exhibition uh, installation there at, at the Note Festival um, in uh, Note 17. And this is actually what I remember it was uh, my first note I was uh, participating. And so yeah, for me, it's like this, that I studied um, um, new media art at the University of Art in Berlin. And um, in that time, I also did an internship at um, Quadrature, uh, namely also I was getting in contact with Sebastian Neitsch, as uh, Refik already mentioned it. He was working with him together quite early in the days. And I was an intern of him. And after a while, I was, you know, getting also into V4 because I you know he was working with this tool. And then also I got in more and more in, in touch with the U V4 community and so on and so on. And after a while, um, you know, I also was uh, getting um, to know Refik and his projects and um, then it was somehow developing in a way like some kind of cooperation between me and uh, 
um, basically this kind of new media art world. And um, right now I am um, part of um, Analog Native together with uh, Juliana Götz and Sebastian Knight. This is the website, as you can see here, you have just a few projects um, of uh, yeah, the past, uh, uh, while there are some bells in the background. Um, uh, basically some um, projects we did. And um, I mean, as you can see, there are a few of them also graphic projects. Um, and so this is actually uh, like, the, this is basically this kind of, let's say, we refer, forward and um, projection mapping. We do basically, we also do um, um, installations for museums and um, of course also live projections, for example, the um, opening of the um, uh, Philharmonie and so on and so on. And then quickly also about me. So here is my web page, just to let you know. So basically, I'm also, again, working also as a media artist in um, different fields, working with different materials, different methods. And uh, for example, in the beginning of the year, I did uh, a project which is called Google Maps Hex, where I was carrying 99 smartphones in a little red wagon. And by doing so, I was able to generate virtual traffic on Google Maps. And this had the effect that um, cars were being rerouted around me and uh, probably have seen it. Um, yeah, it, uh, it, has, was, it had a huge response. <laughs> so remember. yeah, that's actually what I am, let's say, as an, let's say when, when I do some art and basically I'm, I'm interested in into somehow, let's say, hack to question these tools and to yeah, use them in a way how they are not made for. So a pretty, well, pretty critical, a pretty critical guy at the same time. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, should we go on? Then um, I would like to ask Aristides to okay. have a few words about your background. I think you, you made already a little presentation of my background. I'm, I'm living in Berlin since uh, 2009. And I have been working with several companies and agencies in, in, in Germany. And also in my webpage, you can see also uh, I have been doing uh, monumental installations or inter uh, immersive installations in, in different fields, also with uh, dancers, like this project in, in New York with uh, Daniel Simkin. Uh, it was pretty much in like a uh, dance performance with uh, uh, real-time graphics, and yeah. And this project was in Guggenheim, in the in the Guggenheim Museum, also with uh, uh, costume designs by Christian Dior. So pretty pretty pompous, somehow. So if you want to check it in my page. Feel free to do that. And in the last uh, three years, pretty much, I was investing my energy with uh, Refik and this amazing team of people doing also very interesting installations from Las Vegas to Oakland, Berlin, so, and also pretty close to, to Simon. So working, working together, so, yeah. Okay. It's brief enough. It's brief enough, yeah, yeah, we, we, we see some more later. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then uh, we have Luna Nane, and we're curious about to hear some background from your side. Um, yeah, hi, nice to be here. Um, I uh, want to introduce myself shortly. My name is Luna, and I'm working with interactive media since eight years. Um, yeah, and I'm, but I'm actually coming from a scientific background um, and I was lucky enough to um, combine these fields like um, natural sciences and, um, and like all, I was kind of, I guess, always trying to learn all these um, new technologies um, for rendering and um, interfaces. Um, and basically creating large media environments, um, making 
data accessible for the user. In the end, I guess I was mostly working with huge amount of data, um, starting from natural sciences, then at one point I was encountering Refik and it was just like such an awesome match because um, Refik at that time had these, um, all these projects coming that required exactly what I was working on, like having, having um, large media um, spaces that are like immersing the viewers in, in data basically and like and we were always using cutting edge technology, like we were pushing the, like, I guess when we were working on these projects, um, like it, ha it wouldn't have been possible like one year before, but just like literally when Refik came with this project, the newest hardware came out and we were like getting our hands on it and then like pushing all the data on the graphic cards and like really where like it was like always such a, um, uh, amazing experience to work with Graphic Studio. And I can shortly show what, I, what else I've been doing. Um, so this is my website. It's funny, I actually realized it's the same, must be the same website builder like Analog Native, so that we see before. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I can just start. Like I have really, literally only the projects that I really love, that I'm really enthusiastic about. Like, there were like tons of other commercial projects with like tons of touch screen interfaces for trade fairs. I did also these kind of things, but I'm more like, I'm actually more like an artist kind of person. Still like coming from tech and from science, but that's like really what I like to do, have uh, aesthetics and in, in large media spaces. And so I was working on all these projects over the years and I want to start like with this one because I also encountered Science Communication Lab and there was, just before I met Rafik actually, and we were wor working on these um, really in-depth um, ecological and like physical and biological processes and we were like working together with scientific institutes um, closely and like all the scientists basically had um, it doesn't go large for some reason, I don't know why, but um, so all the scientists had put their inputs and recent papers uh, into making this installation real and we had like um, different levels of detail, like we were starting with the ocean, um, a side cut from the Atlantic Ocean, um, it's basically that one that you see here, it's, it's from Europe um, to the US and in between there's this large ridge so it was actually pretty amazing to see different processes um, in detail um, going on here and I will just jump to the next project that I did with Science Communication Lab. Um, we were just like catching on on this flow and made it even like larger instead of visualizing a section of earth we said Let's do it with the whole earth and um, just throw in like tons of data. And we were also working with another institute um, for marine biology, basically. Um, and I don't know why this full screen doesn't work, but anyway, I just want to make a short um, view. So you had like literally different layers you could watch through the ocean and see like um, underwater geologic structures and combine it with visualization of flow of different kind of, you know, there's like how, how research probes were tracking the ocean, how, how um, cold and hot water streams are so all making these, up biodiversity, all these kind of things. All these uh, um, animations and simulations, uh, you're mm -hmm. basically developing uh, the shader pipeline for it and the patches. Um, for the details, there was also a lot of like rendering from Cinema 4D, but like the main, like the Earth and the planet and the data visualization rendering was in real time and with V4. Um, yeah, I just 
jump over to the next project. Um, so before I come to Refix projects, I shortly want to, yeah, because I have also my own artistic output. It has been like a bl much less than I actually wanted it to be in the last years because I was al always so densely going from one project to the other. And like just now with Corona, it was like all like a bit more time for myself. And like, I actually, like, I couldn't say that I'm happy about it, but I had some time and I'm starting to make some, um, some, it's actually wind patterns and also inspired from Rafik, but not because Rafik did it, but we did it actually at the same time with this planet rendering and I just took it and transferred it to prints. So I'm working on these prints and I'm um, going and trying to different plotter technologies to make actually physical art with it. Um, so this is like one thing and and the other thing that also is actually, so that's like one project that, I'm, that is um, super important for me. It is basically um, a, a large data visualization of bot activities from Russia that aim to influence US election and uh, to, that aim polar, to uh, polarize political discourse, and um, you see it's starting here in um, February 2012, and the particles are basically um, tweets. The bigger it is, the more reach it has. And you see the hashtags going here from the, each day. So um, when looking at that, you see like there's like so much interesting structure that actually these bots from Russia, like they are like huge troll farms that feed in these um, content into Twitter to, to um, alter political discourse. And like, it's really interesting to see like how they have been like developing this and how it gets more over time, how they find like more hold, how they put more effort and the content is changing. It relates to, it relates to events. For example, you see often photos like President of the United States, when still Obama was it. So it, then it's like anti-Obama um, content. And um, you see also often Berlin. Sometimes AfD pops up. That political party that is right wing in Germany and um, basically like. All around the world, like they were pushing with these tactics, um, right-wing regimes. And why I'm interested in it is that, like, I guess, like when you're a trans woman, you get really radicalized about such stuff and about power structures and how um, how minorities, how women and trans people are discriminated, and basically how how white old cis men are thinking they have to, uh, the right to decide of, about our bodies and to, to decide about our reproduction and like um, gender identities. And um, basically like these um, bot networks are facilitating the re-election of um, right-wing parties or like the election of Trump or things like that. And um, and in return, we have things like these huge racial um, justice movements um, that you see as an outcome, as a reaction to actually that. And like, um, because there are people that are really suffering from it, just like how trans people are um, um, experiencing through these. Um, through these um, American politics right now, a lot of cutbacks in um, medical health. And like, yeah, it's like really moving for me. And I want to like show that what's going on. Like mm. there's like this big factor in social networks that we need to be aware of. Um, yeah. And is this, um, I mean, this opens up obviously a, a, mm. a a, a very uh, important topic that you're addressing here. And um, yeah, 
I, I mean, this would like extend the time that we have uh, completely. But um, what I would like to know is, is this project that you're developing there somehow accessible to mm -hmm. to the public? And what I show is here like ongoing. Um, it it is like um, I have been developing it uh, over the past years, and it's like kind of. Um, almost finished and I'm in the phase of like applying and like wanting to show it in um, a large media of, uh, space with also ha having it made interactive. I'm still like figuring out how that will be possible now with Corona. Maybe uh, I have to um, think a bit um, beyond our, my usual touch screen or uh, crowd interaction. But yeah, there will be something going on. and. Yeah, just to shortly show that, like, you can, I stopped there in the video, just, just to show that there's, like, suddenly an event and uh, increase of activity, like, the larger the spiral, the more activity is going on and what is happening, like, um, yeah, you can just get across. What, what kind of what events, uh, what kind of events could, could this be? There could be, for example, like what you see a lot is the, f for example, Ferguson protests mm -hmm. um, back in, I don't know actually, but, but when that was like, there's like a lot of fake Black Lives Matter activists from Russian bots that um, want to convey, the, that want to polarize, that like, at the one hand, like, um, steer up um, alt-right, um, M movements to to confront Black Lives Matter activists, but on the other hand, like to pretend there are Black Lives Matter activists and to say things like uh, fake news, like um, there have been a couple of Black Lives Matter um, protesters shot from police, even though it's not true, just to um, to to uh, like to to make this whole protest more violent. Mm. Yeah, so. Okay. Is, uh, I will also talk about that project um, tonight. Um, again, like 10:30. Exactly. We invited you so to have to have you in the wrap up as yeah. well to 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 go deeper um, a little bit shortly there, and then yeah. also we have the speaker corner where we catch up conversations awesome. about, about these topics. And I would I would move on to Rafix project now. Um, so. Um, the big first project with Rafik was um, that archive streaming that probably like most of the people would have seen because it was so popular at that time. And like, I think until now it also won like a, lot, a couple of awards and it was shown like all around the world. Um, and I think we, sh we would have shown it like, Rafik would have shown it like much more everywhere if there wouldn't have been Corona. Like basically my whole year of projects got canceled. Because that is like a project that really de de relies on people. Like p there's like really? huge visitor masses going through, and that's just not possible anymore. Um, by, the, by the way, so so quickly to give a context, yeah. um, Luna, a little bit. Uh, what was really interesting about the projects, I think it is context was 2016. Yeah. Um, I was very uh, fortunate to join Google Arts and Mission Intelligence Group, and and um, that was the year. We were so lucky that um, I think it may be the first AI project truly using um, TSNE algorithm and real-time graphics public in public space, um, as far as I know. Can we still see the screen here in the studio, Luna screen? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. And yeah. So, okay. Rafa. So that has like a kind of a kind of a very pioneer approach to the project, as far as I know. But if anyone knows better, please let us know. We are researching mm. what was the early steps of using AI in, in public space. Yeah. So what exactly have you been doing in, in this project, in this particular one? Um, so, so basically, um, I first heard of that project when I talked with Sebastian Neitsch. Um, and they were like, um, literally like approaching me with like, we have this um, amazing project with Revik, um, but we really don't know how to solve it because it, invo it involves uh, 1.5 uh, million images of an, an archive of a, mu of a museum. And, um, and they need to be shown all at once in real time. So, and that was like, um, that was, Huge. yeah, just 
<laughs> for me, it was like, okay, I, I wait, I have to think a bit, but actually it was a good timing that they approached me because at that time I was researching about, about um, in my master thesis, um, that was about procedural word generation. I was researching about um, vegetation rendering. And that is kind of the same field. So you, ha you have to visualize a lot of data and textures. And so we basically, um, um, yeah, just jumped on that. And I said, yeah, probably I can do it. <laughs> And you, <laughs> you, you, you did it in the end? <laughs> then we did it. I was really working out, yeah. And, and I'll show some pictures. The video doesn't work. So um, the AI uh, sorting algorithm, uh, that was the first one, the first, I think the first cloud that you pr produced, traffic. Yeah. that was yeah. like um, really awesome in the way that it could, um, it could cluster um, different images that were um, similar in a way, so like two people standing next to each other, you could find them in one of these edge clusters. Maybe in this cluster there would be um, like medals. You know, it was about museum. There was also like a lot of um, a lot of uh, museum content, like old medals or like mm -hmm. old artifacts. Like in one corner, a lot of artifacts, a lot of documents. And, oh, by the way, so yeah. sorry, just to give 1.7 million documents, 49 oh, yeah. columns of metadata per uh, document, and each of them was 10 to 24 pixels by 10 to 4, like a default exported from the library. I mean, we were very lucky to have a really good metadata for the project. Mm. By the way, and it was a free public art uh, library, so the data was public and oh. all like free for everyone, actually. Yeah. And it was so interesting, and like not just that we managed to make that work, but in the end, like um, the whole setting was amazing with this 360 degree projection, and um, ceiling and floor being like a mirror. So you were basically in an endless mirror of millions of images that you could fly through with that console in the middle, um, and like. While you were flying through, like it was loading the high resolution images, so you could really have a clear look. You could spend hours mm. just seeing always new images. So, and, and once yeah. you, you, you researched deeper um, and you had the technology to really solve that, that problem to like really browse through this huge data set, yeah. you applied it in, 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 in different projects as well, right? Yes, exactly. So this project was then running and being installed like while we were installing it in different locations like Beijing and New York. Um, we had like other projects going on and there was like this one that I'm actually, um, that's like one of my absolutely favorite projects. Um, so um, the thing is like, um, it was a bit overshadowed because of the huge hype that Refix um, Disney Hall Concert Hall, Disney Concert Hall um, projection mapping was doing. But actually in that time, um, we also had a, a, a gallery inside Disney Concert Hall in LA um, being set up. And the gallery had the same, like basically had the Disney Concert Hall archive and images in uh, a cloud. But it also had the same thing uh, for the audio archive because they had like, um, from the last decades, they had like, uh, seven yeah. seven point seven terabyte data. If you want to listen, it will take thirty to eight years, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> including like uh, pretty much every single recording ever done, sixty five years from starting from the original uh, first analog recordings, like Frank Zappa, Bach, Mahler, <sighs> Stravinsky. Like you imagine, like you just imagine. Mm. <laughs> yeah, and it was like so amazing to work on that. Like I was um, in my home office and setting up that cloud and like. It was also like a time when I was making more research into particle rendering and you see this like super um, crisp and popping cloud that have different colors mean different kind of sound samples, 10 second samples. So basically you could go in and be in a cluster and then it would, it would start playing these 10 second sample and fade them in each other like in a little DJ mix. Mm -hmm. um, and in like one corner, it was so amazing. You could 
you could find all the Star Wars Imperial March um, sound recordings. It was like just such a gem to be like suddenly in the Star Wars orchestra. And then like move the cloud and be like in a percussive area where all the, tr all the sounds are percussive. And so and and um, from from the yeah. team who who are here now, who else was part of this project? Was it Simon? Have you been have you been developing here? Yes, sir. Huh? Simon was. You were doing the this interface here, right? That we see. Yeah, I think I was involved in the interface, um, controlling the basically the the controllers to uh, to to coordinate yourself into into the cloud. Yes. And how do you how do you work on this? Like, do you develop this in Berlin uh, completely? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we also met. In Berlin? Mm -hmm. Yes. We, we with, met with in Berlin, Berlin. Mm -hmm. and we did that together. Yeah. 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 And then the installment, installment was, uh, was done by your team, Refik, or how, yeah. do you, how do you guys work then together? So by the way, all of the projects we will be hearing today, except I think Leighton Bing, which was um, impossible to spec simulate, are all done actually, we always have an identical, you know, um, software running, like a screen running, some kind of a demo always running because all this like communication gets very complicated, right? And this hardware is not always the same. So like we are trying to be sure, like, I mean, for example, what Luna is explaining, like this is putting the entire like a LOD of 1.7 million documents of on the GPU buffer or like when Simon is like coding the, the interface, like we always have this like, you know, demo already here in Los Angeles to like, you know, check together, evaluate, have a dialogue. Um, so that's a very common mm -hmm. late night Skypes or Zooms. Uh, yeah. It's a very common pattern. <laughs> okay. Um, I, I want to um, go over a little bit to the next topic. Um, mm -hmm. Or is there something important to add to the, to, uh, to the TSNE say, cloud? So I mean, just may I say one more thing, but what actually, honestly, one of the most inspiring things that Luna developed in just not only cloud, uh, image um, transformation of major data. I think like this idea of accessing information without using a boring search bar or like, you know, like deconstructing the idea of searching information is exactly, I think, what is doing this. And I think what is so important that we are discovering with this project is we are not anymore waiting to search because AI allows us to show what is there first. And then as humans, we can ask the question, what else I can find here? So I think what is amazing from my humble perspective as a nerd researching in libraries, I was always like overwhelmed, like what exactly here in this library? Like what is here? Like how can I see that is here? And I think these tools are directly answering this question by not you know, taking you a, just a tour, but showing you directly and openly and honestly. So I think this is really fresh. So, so yeah. you get as a as a visitor, as a user, you get into this explora explorative mode more and more, right? But then, yeah. then of course, the questions go um, comes up like, how do you navigate this? What is your narrative of navigating exactly. through the mass of data that you mm -hmm. you are now able to explore? And it's open up obviously new questions that, um, yeah. yeah, how what is important in that data and and, and yeah, I wonder if it's on the not. screen what is running right now, like for the for the online visitors. Um, you see it, how it's, this is like super intuitive. You're like in this huge data universe and it's immersing, but it, does, it, it doesn't lose you. It's like, it's not like yeah. completely overkill. It's, it's still like, you know, still like within the dimensions that people can actually perceive. Yeah. Mm. And I think it's a feature of the library, to be honest. I think we will invent it, I'm pretty sure. Okay, uh, thank you so much for giving mm -hmm. us these insights on the on the technique and the projects mm -hmm. behind like this research of how to actually navigate through mass data uh, images and also audio. And uh, the next topic we wanted to address is the latest um, research when it comes to weather and uh, wind mm -hmm. data paintings yes. and visualizations. And I know that a couple of you have been working in this field because uh, it became obvious that uh, there's a lot, obviously there's a lot of data there, and then um, cities and governments develop this idea of, you know, accessing that data in a, in a different sense, uh, more also in an artistic way, and approached traffic, I guess, a couple of times now. 
And maybe so you, can, the, you can give a little bit of context about these requests that come to you, and then we step into... Yeah. So 2013, actually, I was in my uh, second year at DMA, uh, and Casey Rias was my mentor. So the first question I think I challenge to him, and, I mean, Casey was teaching processing back in time, and everyone was getting his amazing class, and of course, he has like teaching some particle simulations, and he was showing how to use agents, and it was a perfect time. Like, I just like learn about a little bit, of course, if there's an agent and particles moving purposefully, that is a pearly noise can be applied, but also the class was challenging everyone's mind, like what you would like to move forward in that you know, universe of particles. And that was a time I talked with Casey and said, like, can data become a pigment? And can, I mean, speculation of a pigmentation of data, basically, 2013 uh, spring. So he said, like, why not? And then I first learned about like creating super simple 2D, 3D Perlin noise algorithm, like, I mean, particles back in time in processing. And then the data from LA was <clears throat> was given in the in the in the class for me. I mean, everyone, we were eight people, everyone getting their own, you know, data sets for some reason. So there I, I started using um, Win data actually. And then 2016, uh, sorry, 2015, after the San Francisco project. A collector from Boston asked for, I want a moving painting. Like, I want a moving painting. Like, it was a very weird request. And 2015, in Boston, um, the collector really brought the data from the city, uh, Boston uh, Logan Airport. And the early one was using actually processing um, and a little bit of VVV for the particles. So 2015, start from the Boston. And now in 14 cities, like Dubai, Seoul, New York, Chicago, San Francisco, Auckland, Las Vegas, like it just went all around the world. So what was really inspiring is like, even though wind data is very common, right? Temperature, gust, wind, direction, but the poetry inside data is like intense. Like it doesn't get finished. It doesn't feel, you know, it doesn't get like stuff. So, and I think what we discovered both with, I mean, Ari and Sebastiano, I think last three, two years, constantly looking for patterns in the data and what else we can do. And the good news, we were al always able to use really good media walls, mostly LED screens. You will be seeing visuals are mostly in a high pitch, like two millimeter, 1.9 millimeter, very high quality screens, showing the gamut of color, and of course, a wonderful support for, you know, revisualizing the wind patterns, invisible patterns. Super, let's have a look at it. Ari, can you, can you start? Explaining I can show what, you you, what your research and your exploration has been coming up. Yeah, actually, this is for for the installation we we have already running in Auckland. Can we see Ari's screen yeah. here in the studio nice. as well? And this is basically a weather uh, analysis or weather visualization. I think we can see on the on the bottom which kind of data I'm I'm using to generate the graphics. And this is fully running in real time. So, and it's updated every day based on the data set that Simon collect with uh, several weather stations, I think. And where, uh, true, where is that? There's a real time weather station data. It's real time, yeah. And where, where is that weather station? Sorry? I could, I could, show, I could share uh, my screen afterwards to show you that. Yeah, uh, maybe. And this is one of the modules I, I prepared for that. This is more based on, on solar radiation. So the wind data is not really present here. So this is more also the illumination change depending on the, on the time of the day. So it's pretty much evolving the, the whole time, depending also on the season. So there is a lot of work behind so how to, how to get interesting data because not always you get interesting data. So you have to, to tweak a bit the data in order to make it more appealing for the observer. And other uh, module I, I prepare for this one is more based on, on wind uh, visualization. This is not really a particle system. This is more based on agents. So, and they also, there is a, a start uh, image at the beginning. There are all sunsets. And I start with it, this image. And every time we, we run this uh, module, there is a, a new data set loaded and a new image loaded. So, 
every time you have a different feeling in the foyer. So, and, and as you can see, the data I'm using is mostly humidity, wind direction, wind speeds on different levels. Um, yeah. What do and you mean by agents? How, how can we? So this is not really a particle system uh, running. So this is more like a sprites. So a set of points moving along the in the a field that I defined previously, based on the data. So that field is based on the data, and then you basically. I run just my my little friends through the through the field. And they have some parameters, so they. Yeah. They behave differently. According For example, to when there is a lot of humidity, the the canvas looks more more blurry, and when there is uh, less humidity, it looks more more defined the lines. And yeah. Wow. Pretty much. So it's quite uh, hypnotic. Yeah. As you can see. If so I've been researching into these two mm -hmm. worlds, and then I know that. Um, Sebastiano also did some research. Uh, would you would you show us this as well? Yeah, sure. And Simon, uh, in 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 between, where's that weather station? Like, what what kind of data we're looking at? I mean, so yeah, we had the radar station on the on the rooftop of the building, and um, I think we got different data. So first of all, was as I also been already mentioned, wind data. But the, with this radar station, we could also capture temperature. Then there was also a humidity sensor and also a light sensor. And I think in addition, uh, which uh, nobody mentioned, is that we also had an um, Raspberry Pi installed close to the screen. And there was the aim to capture Wi-Fi data as well. So basically, um, one of those um, animations, uh, I think uh, Kyle made it, um, was using um, basically the data stream of Wi-Fi inside of the building. So basically, we were somehow capturing the, the Wi-Fi um, close to the screen. And, and a microphone. We had also a microphone. Yeah. To get there. So basically, the project was called Sense of Place. And the idea was like sensing invisible signals, including the wind pattern, um, environmental data, um, sonification of the sound, and the invisible signals such as Bluetooth, LTE, 5G, or Wi-Fi as much as. So that was a big picture we, we tried to tackle. By the way, Kyle just sent a message. I think he finished the workshop. He had the beer. So if he's there, uh, he also like has a lot of a lot of work in all these projects, just to say. His name. Yeah, I think uh, I think to mention this once, I think a lot of uh, a lot of the work is based on on software contributions that is provided by Carl McLean, who is uh, one of the um, yeah most advanced graphical engineers in the VV community that we uh, that we know probably, and uh, yeah, but he couldn't make it, so uh, nevertheless um, we cheer him uh, to contribute that, and uh, we can work on his code base. Uh, Sebastiano, have you been sharing your screen in the meantime? Yeah, yeah, yeah. super. Then, yeah, I see you now as well. Uh, I was part of the team for the Oakland project, but uh, I'm going to share other projects based on wind data. So we have this visualization here and using data as a base of narrative and is a data-driven data painting, uh, basically based on historical records and directly fed into a visual system. So wind statistics are uh, synthesized into a form and wind parameters are uh, contextualized into a cinematic mo uh, moment in a painting uh, uh, evolution. So uh, basically here, uh, I'm, I'm using uh, wind direction uh, for the direction of the particles and the agents and the lines and based on the wind speed, we just, uh, wind speed is linked directly to the size of the particles. And wind dust is basically a, a velocity of the wind. So uh, it's something like uh, accelerate uh, the, the canvas, right? something like that. OK, thank you. Um, <laughs> Is there any more uh, to add, Refik, from your side, maybe yeah, for, yeah, the, yeah. for the whole? 
So, so what is really, I mean, Sebastian, would you want to also show the latest ones or? Um, yeah, I'm just showing some screenshots for the project. So we have uh, statistics from wind gas to wind speed, and this is a vector field, as Ari said before. So basically, behind the paintings, so vector field is a, is this one basically uh, is a arrow with direction and the magnitude, so it's a vector. So we use a vector field for drive agents through space and uh, combining. We, we don't see it in the studio. Sorry to interrupt. We don't see it in the studio yet. Ooh. Yeah, thank you. Uh, okay. Yeah, you can go on. Um, but do you want a couple of maybe steps back? Sebastian, you were showing the vector field, the two, two slides before, I guess. Yeah. That was so cool. So start from the beginning. I mean, uh, just just for mention, art, this is an, an artwork series developed by Re, with Refi Candle Studio, uh, for, designed for site-specific installation. Um, so this is a screenshot from from the uh, from the renderer. Uh, we have this vector field on the top and some plotted the function and uh, the data uh, for the speed and the gas. So just behind the paintings, we have this vector field. So I think it's perfect using vector field to visualize uh, wind. I mean, also in the uh, water chart, is a, they represent the wind as, uh, as a vector field. So I just take the same idea and using to drive particles to space, basically. Uh, look in the patch, we have, uh, we have a wind data parser where we have the data and we generate a vector field behind uh, and use the, the vector field uh, to drive agent and use this agent and convert in a, into a geometry and use the super physical for shading uh, the scene, basically. We also use sprite and lines just to give more uh, details, but we have the same uh, uh, properties. Uh, and size and color are also influenced uh, by data uh, so speed, direction, and gas is using for uh, manage size and and the colors also basically. This is another visualization. Uh, these little arrows basically are the uh, our field. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This is another one, but basically with the same principle behind. And this is another one with a uh, completely different uh, principle behind. Uh, basically, is done by a surface deformation with a fluid simulation. So we generate a, a, flu a texture based on this fluid simulation, and in we influence the, uh, the simulation itself uh, with, with the parameters. I mean, wind speed is for the time step, wind direction is used to drive the tendency of the, I mean, the direction. Air pressure is linked to the dissipation of the fluid simulation. The fluid simulation. This is the patch. We have always have this wind data parser, and we have this fluid scenario. So basically, we use air pressure, wind speed, the wind direction, and air temperature uh, to, uh, I mean, animate this canvas here. I have some videos, probably. By the way, just to give a context, for example, here, especially this last one, um, what is very funny is sometimes, for example, a client or a collector like really enjoys, let's say, porcelain, right? So, for yeah. example, what Sebastian show, I think this will be like imagine these impossible materials also like to contextualize why just you know, this shiny porcelain surface can be very inspiring for the audience to say, all right, this material will never move unless, you know, there is this imagination of like moving the subatomic world of porcelain, right? So just, I don't know, it's so poetic to see the... It is indeed. But, but what's the idea about the porcelain? That's an interesting... Oh, so, so for example, sometimes like a collector is uh, from uh, Beijing and, and or like this is a, for example, an upcoming project, uh, by the way, um, for hopefully they will be very major in many, many um, TVs. So every project has a different request. For example, again, like, um, first of all, one, for example, particle driven world is very inspiring uh, for many collectors, but 
again, in Beijing, the collector was like, can it be like a porcelain? Can it be, it's like, what? Like porcelain is so, I mean, no offense, but boring, it's a static piece. But we have the wind moving in real time, catching the, catching the life and you know, augmenting the invisible signals of wind. Yeah, actually, and, this is for a China project, but <laughs> I haven't mentioned the, the thing. But please, because yeah, I mean, then it's so getting inspiring, right? Like it's not just data moving purposefully, but also had a narrative of like, why, I mean, in real time, first of all, porcelain looking, I don't know, so pretty badass V4 power here, also wonderful, of course, and uh, developing, but just to say it's just, from a, from a really practical perspective, I don't know. It's super, super exciting to share. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you so much. We have uh, 15 minutes left, and I mm -hmm. wanted to, to take the chance to look into a project. Um, I think it premiered last year, Latent Being in, in Berlin. Let's have a look on this as well. Yes. And um, hopefully, Refik, you have some material to show that we yes. get a context of yes. what this was like. And then uh, maybe, um, Simon, you can explain a little bit about how you realized the tracking, because it, I think it was an interesting <laughs> approach yeah. that have been used there. By the way, one and, more. And one also, more. Ari, Ari, Ari did the laser. Um, yeah, he developed the, the software to control the lasers. And yeah, let's have a look into that. I, I just want to say, to, again, just before forgetting, like we are all, like, I mean, Luna, Ari, Simon, and Sebastian together. But again, Kyle just pinged me. I mean, again, just remind him his name and his contribution. <laughs> also, he did the project a lot with the wind data, but he specifically focused on EEG focused um, research. So, Kyle is really constantly also working with us mm -hmm. while all this uh, development's going on, and his contributions are significant last uh, almost three years. Uh, just quickly say the names and also like thanks, thanks, thanks. But also the Chanel Ebunte Builder, they also help a lot in the since 2015, just not to forget wonderful contributions in the V4 community and, and their wonderful support in the shading world, also like augmenting the um, many real time ideas. Just want to be sure not to forget. So, um, okay, if you can see, can you see my screen? Yes, we do. Okay, so uh, 2000, I think 18 summer, LAS, a light art space, opened uh, their doors, I think their ideas, and they invited for a project to really augment, their big idea was really speculate post-human. Like the idea of AI is growing, and the speculation between machines and humans are transforming, and they think that it's time to like, you know, commission a piece to speculate the idea of being in latent. Just to give a context, latent keyword is so much often used in our projects. It's coming from a context called latent space. When we use AI algorithms, the data most likely clustered and computed in a world where we cannot perceive. It's not like Cartesian or Euclidean space. It's most likely n-dimensional. And there's a lot of problems of how to see this invisible world. Um, the project really transformed, I think, one of the most challenging questions is like, can a building learn, can it dream? But also like the idea of like, can this building interact with the neural network that doesn't exist, but can create some performative world? We have so many great support as well that came from also uh, Solinger, uh, Mr. Mikhail Solinger, and he also worked, maybe we'll mention later, but we will see tons of exciting stuff. I think Ari will show you and Simon also will show you uh, we have so many exciting animated lasers, real time with the sound, but also like invented hardware parts that simulated a neural network. So what you are seeing here is a really representation of VGG 16 and 19, a neural network that I'm, I think, very obsessed with for a while. It's an open source, it's totally biased <laughs> image recognition algorithm, but it's also very well known. And Simon will mention, I guess, how we track the person. If you are into quantum mechanics, right? Observer is very important. <laughs> if, you, if you don't have an observer, quantum mechanics do not work. But we also speculate what will happen if we take the audience location, the amount of time where he or she is looking, and inspire a noise data, and that inspires the GAN algorithm, which let the artwork dream. I know it is a little confusing, but I think we will explain a little bit later, uh, and I'm sure you will see details. But it was a truly crazy <laughs> installation that in a very short time with heavy work uh, that everyone put together. So 
and and I'm sure now we will see more details of uh, from Ari and Simon as well. Mm -hmm. But it was really intense. And thanks to them again for a wonderful work. Simon, vielleicht? Yeah, maybe maybe we start with Simon. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right here. So yeah, I would like to talk about the tracking system we use there. So again, as Refix said, the idea was that um, how can the building, how can the installation, uh, let's say, um, use tracking data or use the position of the visitors and that the visitors can also be, be getting part of the installation itself and also manipulate and shape the visuals on the screen. So the idea was there that in the end of the, basically there was a huge LED screen in the end of the, of the, um, of the hall where you saw like a neural network dreaming some kind of faces. And the idea was that when you're working in the space, you can, you can manipulate, you can shape, um, yeah, the, the view, the look of those faces, or basically you can shape, you can influence the network. And the question came up, so how could we track people in this huge um, uh, Kraftwerk space? And we did different experiments. The first, um, well, idea was to use some kind of uh, blob detection, basically working with cameras from the ceiling and pointing downwards and uh, trying to capture them. But then we figured out that it's not going to work because um, we want to work with lasers and they need some kind of, let's say, dust in the, or we, we had to work with some kind of um, fog machines um, inside of the um, uh, exhibition space. And therefore, it was quite clear that we cannot um, uh, uh, work with um, camera systems. So, and after a while, um, we thought, okay, what, what else could we use? And we came up with the idea to work with um, Bluetooth beacons or Bluetooth tags. And um, where we did the research, and we found a quite interesting um, uh, yeah, company from uh, Finland, which is called uh, Kupa. You see that? Yeah. Yeah, we do. Cool. So, and they have, um, well, basically what they do is they are specialized in um, tracking people, for example, when it comes to, I don't know, sports like ice hockey, football, basketball, and so on, right? I mean, we know that especially in these fields, um, tracking systems have been or are, are being used um, to, um, well, make their sports more efficient and so on. And they are working really quite precisely. Um, well, you can literally say that, uh, I would say that the threshold to um, track the people was something like, let's say, 10 centimeters. And um, so we asked them, hey, would, would you be interested in to work with us together and to cooperate for this exhibition? They said like, yeah, sure, of course, would be super interesting for them um, to see their technology being used in an environment like this. Um, then yeah, after a kind of negotiation, we figured out, okay, we cannot get it for, for free. But they said like, yeah, look, actually we have some partners and one of those is uh, Lufthansa. And uh, they are using our system as well um, at the airport to track containers and also to track actually people, securities, and so on. So maybe that might be an interesting partner for you to cooperate with. So basically, we got in contact with them, and they said, "Sure, okay, let's do it." And then basically, I spent two time, uh, two days at, at at Lufthansa in Frankfurt, and there we developed together a system, and basically a language and a kind of communication between their system, let's say between the Cooper system and V4. And um, yeah, that's actually what we what we did. So we installed, um, we got 500 of those, let's say, beacons or uh, tags. Also um, uh, important to mention is that every visitor got some kind of badge when they went into the exhibition. And I think for most uh, of the visitors, it was pretty much more like a ticket. I think they had the feeling it's like a ticket, you know. But uh, once, <laughs> once they uh, stepped into the exhibition space and suddenly they realized, or basically, they, yeah, I would say they realized, okay, actually it's not just a ticket, it's actually also uh, a tracking device. Um, also pretty quickly to mention, like those are the tags. I mean, we had a much more on a card form, but the technology is the same. Um, also interesting here is they have a different, um, Technology, which is kind, of, which is called angle of arrival. If you're interested into this, uh, you should have a closer look into it because um, it means that uh, with those texts, you can actually use less antennas in a space, uh, especially in a huge space like this. That's what they are, uh, let's say, speci specialized or let's say known for. And yeah, and those are basically receivers of the um, of the Bluetooth text. And I think we had. 
think 12 or 13 of them in the in the in the exhibition and yeah so what happened was then i think maybe also Refik or, or also ari probably will talk about it that we had different chapters um during the whole show and one of the chapters was that um people have been tracked by the system oh by the way this was actually the operation room <laughs> um, it was that was the place how it looked like behind the scene also quite um Blade Runner-ish. <laughs> yes, truly, truly. <laughs> and yeah, so, um, and then in one of those chapters, people got some kind of squares and some ID and also an X and Y position projected around them. And uh, it was quite fun to see when they basically figured out, oh, wow, the square is actually following me. Or basically when I move, the square is moving. And this this moment when they experienced it was, was interesting to see. And how people started to interact to play with the let's say machine. So the the interaction um, the interaction was uh, when I'm informed correctly that by moving you were actually navigating and that addresses mm -hmm. the the question I raised before. Yeah, you were actually navigating through huge data sets. In that case, I think of the by the city of Berlin. Yeah. Um, yeah. By the way, we we had 19 million images. We totally hacked the Instagram very openly like download everything <laughs> available, but then um, specifically clean the uh, people part while focusing on the historic data sets. We have a street art data sets, we had a architecture data set, and also just human faces. So we had four individual GANs trained with Style GAN 2, and Alex Morozov also um, joined us and to really create this latent space um, explorer that connected to the VVV, which Kyle is not here, but Kyle was also responsible to get the data to the latent space that narrate this, you know, uh, real time. And, and what there's, did Kyle, I... there's Kyle, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> <He's> a... <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> so, and and what did the laser do? The the with yes. with the narration of the. Wow. Well, uh, so my role in this project was uh, uh, not only design the mm -hmm. the tool to control the lasers, but design also an application to manage all all these animations in an easy way. So, I develop a. A kind of uh, tool that uh, helps helps me to to design different laser patterns. So, and I met uh, Mr. Solinger in Berlin in his uh, fabric, amazing fabric full of lasers. Yes. And also, I was in in a very huge contact with a sound designer in order to to make an immersive installation. So. Also, I did the, the sound spatialization. So as you can see in this video that I prepare, uh, if we can see that on the screen. So basically, on the bottom left, uh, on the bottom right part, you can see uh, these little uh, squares. This is a representation of a, of a position of a sound, so basically. And, and you can see that was my my visualizer my visualizer like one month long. I was working on the on the whole narrative. Uh, yeah, based on the on the refic studies, I I prepare a nice narrative in conjunction with a, with a sound design. And now we can see some patterns. There is also some audio. I don't know if you can turn it on. But By the way, just, just to name Kerim Karolo, also from Berlin. He yeah. had been working last 10 years, all, every single project that sound is included. And I think he is interacting with Ari and many, many of us mm -hmm. while designing, composing. So just name his name quickly, mm -hmm. Kerim. Yeah. yeah. yeah um. mm -hmm. And for the, there is a lot of manual uh, animation, so made by hand, so fitting the, the audio. But there is also a lot of uh, uh, audio reactive uh, parts. So it's a combination of uh, linear narrative and, and generative narrative somehow. So we had the layer of the lasers, we had the layer of the projection, we had the mm -hmm. layer of sound, we had uh, the layer of music. And I know there's also the layer of the style gun, which I think we haven't really yes. seen in the other um, in the other video you just showed. Mm -hmm. And I know maybe that's the last thing we do now because we're running over time also. Uh, I think um, Kyle sent you some patches about the latest style research, is that correct? That oh, yes, 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 yes. Yes, yes, um, I can. Maybe maybe that's an interesting jump um, into latest developments of what, what you've been doing. Yes. 
Oh, actually, and it's then open we close book. It. <laughs> Probably. Just a second. Let me. Kyle, can you hear me? You did you open the page? It's awesome. I was... By the way, just one more to mention uh, before I forget. Latent being laser setup, I mean, Ari mentioned, will not be possible to animate without this really complex tool. I mean, animating a laser is way complex than moving a bunch of you know, pixels. Off. Mm -hmm. I mean, still, not I'm just exaggerating, but just the idea of there is no like connection between this world. So, I mean, I don't think that without this tool, we could animate that <laughs> all these layers of channels. So yeah. again, so just to, uh, OK. Uh, jumping quickly, we have four more minutes, but can you see my screen? Is it, it, can you see this? Uh, not yet. yet. Yes. Now. Yeah. Oh, okay. We see yeah. It. So, so this yeah, is a completely perfectly. different uh, maybe approach, but as you know, um, since 2016, the GAN algorithm is always in our um, imagination pipeline. But what is very exciting is we were trying to like create con connection between what GAN is, you know, what latent space is creating from the color to moving the form that the movement inside the GAN world. So Kyle have been working, um, I think now happy to say the name of the project, uh, not very publicly, but for Samsung, we are doing a research. And thanks to Yorek as well, very early we have an access to um, early VL studies. And Kyle have been uh, also in the very early touch up of like, getting some uh, feedbacks and, and directly with the VVV devs. And so what you are seeing is a new tool that we have been using a lot. Um, so what is this actually getting an optical flow of data, but also like, you know, um, so basically particles are very heavy used in, in the research. And if you can see that we can load different GANs and we can create um, um, different amount of like movements. Uh, maybe I can quickly show it is. Um, or maybe it was already open, but maybe it's good to say what is the what is the GAN? Yeah, yeah. So basically, generative adversarial networks uh, invented by Ian Goodfellow back in 2015 with his paper while he was at Google, and I was also doing my first residency. So DC GAN was one of the first um, examples. So what GAN is does basically look at the patterns of information in the image archives, and once it once it learned, it can create almost realistic outputs. And what is challenging in, I think, artistically imagination with the GAN algorithm, technically, if the machine learns that millions of images, you technically or conceptually have an understanding of that universe. So what was so fun, not the fun, maybe the, but what was challenging is what else we can do with the GAN algorithm. So for example, when, when a machine learns uh, this information, uh, let me show you, for example, this is an image archive of 70 million, um, if you can see my screen. Like, this is one of the raw uh, information comes from the GAN algorithm as a, as a 10 to 24 pixel uh, image sequence. So we are feeding this into VVV, and if you see behind that, and then get the data, optical flow of data from these movements, and also apply to the tons of other cre creativity. We sometimes get height maps, we sometimes get optical flow, I mean, also like in Houdini, we have an upcoming tool, hopefully in the maybe next node we will share, the data we'll be getting from the also Houdini's like um, in-house in um, optical flow, fluid sim data into the VVV, like there's so many research going on. And what we are seeing behind this is one of the, one of the uh, outputs, but I can show you more. Uh, maybe just to speed up because we have less time left, but just to show you we are what already you see over here. time, to be honest. Oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> yeah, we really have anyway. to wrap it, but... Uh, so all this universe oh, yeah. merging V4 to animate, to create artworks, thanks to these wonderful people here that is working all together. I and mean, I can buy more, but... So... Yeah. I think that's a good that's a good last word. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you guys for sharing, and um, I hope we we shed some light on 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 how this community works from bottom up. Um, I think oh, this. One, by the way, one more way from my heart. Thank you, everyone here and before help, and I'm deeply honored and deeply thankful to everyone touch these projects, be a part of it. I'm deeply, deeply emotionally thank you, thank you for everyone in V4 community, everyone in the team right now. Without okay. your support. We're, take, we're taking this as the thank you very much for everybody. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're closing it uh, at this very moment. Thank you so much. Thank you. Awesome.
Hello. And welcome back. Am I on already? Okay, cool. Hello and welcome back to the uh, fourth day of the sixth edition of Node 2020. Uh, we are back. Uh, I am back. And Jeremy Bailey is back as well, even for this short intermission. How are you, Baromi? Bar bar Baromi, <laughs> oh God. <laughs> it was a really good That's joke. Okay. No? Yeah, I'm actually. Uh, I was. My, I know I'm named after a bear. That's my my name, Jeremy the Bear. It's a children's TV show in uh, in Canada. Ah, so all <laughs> all comes together now. It makes all yeah, sense. Yeah, it all comes together. <laughs> yeah. So what so, are we gonna see? Do you, like what are we gonna see now? Which panel? Because it's gonna be our second panel on. Yes. Yes. Very excited. Obviously, we we did the in the morning TV. We talked about the next panel, which is taking action on agency and making your voice heard. And so this is about how artists and designers can help in today's environmental movements. And it's hosted by uh, Katia von Braath, uh, who is expert in sort of bringing people together um, in resistance and revolution using game design. And so I think this, this panel is gonna explore you know, how people with creative tool sets or other types of, of skills that they might not think maybe could help, could help and how they can come together and be a part of a solution or part of a better, uh, more hopeful future. So. I think we have a few people on the panel. Um, do you want me to go? Do you want me to talk, talk about all the folks on the panel? How, how much detail do we I do here? I think oh. I think that's what Katina Katia is going to do, and I think we should uh, give them the time, uh, the, the little time they have. We shouldn't probably take as much of this time. So I yeah. would say let's let's give the word to Katia and uh, okay. have a good panel. You yeah. too. Good luck with the panel. Bye, everyone. <laughs> or, see you soon. See you. <laughs> Hi, welcome audience at home, welcome speakers, virtual speakers online. Uh, my name is Katia, I'm really looking forward to this panel. I'm invited as well, uh, like the next, like the other four people that will introduce themselves soon. I'm really happy that I don't have to sum up what you are doing. Um, I will give like really short introduction what I am doing and then I'm really interested I'm interested what the guests will share. So um, we will have one and a half hours to talk now and you will listen to 10 minutes, around 10 minutes um, from every guest here, starting with uh, Joanie Le Messier and then followed by Dr. Samani Moafi and then followed by Matthew Plummer Fernandez and then followed by Teresa Schubert. And then we will talk about stuff together you're really invited to use uh, the Slido tool, which is uh, used here at Node to send questions on stage. So I will get your questions here if you send them. And to give like maybe a short idea, I have some ideas about what we could talk later. It could be something like art and art market. Could be also something like collective movements and authorship. Could be money. Could be politics and computers and biology which is all really interesting. And for me, I was here at um, 2017 Note Edition as an artist together with Jeremy that you heard uh, right now. Coming from theater, I, I'm doing a lot of different stuff um, recently. I'm le lecturing a lot on the topic of activating environments. So I have the theory that everything is connected with everything and feedbacks to everything. So it's really important to think about everything when you're doing something. Uh, this is why I brought this picture. We got a secret plan and it's called doing something. So what I like to create is something I call human servicing spaces. Environments for me is like including software, spatial conditions, other people, social conditions. And one example of how my work is done is at uh, last edition of Node, somehow through my practice, I made Jorek realize that I should get a recruiter's badge to recruit people for a revolution. And I don't know exactly how I did it, but it's part of my work that this happened. And yeah, I'm really excited to hear your self-introduction and your voice for the first time. And 
uh, enjoy the panel and see you with questions. So now we can hear Joanie. See here. And we have a sound problem. <laughs> um, I should be here. Ah, now. yeah, now I can hear you. Cool. Hi. Cool. Hi. Nice Hello, to I'm hear really you. glad to be here. Um, I'm going to try to make this introduction short. But um, yeah, bear with me. This is going to be about a year and a half of activism um, condensed into a few minutes. So it might feel a bit messy. Um, uh, but that's also how I feel about activism. I'm, I'm very angry, mostly against myself for not doing anything for the past uh, 36 years of my life about the ecology, environment, the social injustice and all this. Um, so I'm trying to, uh, to like, uh, get back and, and do a lot of things. So it's a, it's a bit of a mess. Uh, let me share you just a few ideas. I'm going to share my screen. Um, Let's hope this works. Please let me know if you can see my screen OK. Not yet, but it, we talked about it before. It's like using a walkie-talkie. First press and then talk. So soon I will maybe see your screen. Says now I can see your screen. Now you can oh, start. Cool. Cool. OK. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna, that's going to be a bit intense. Um, short introduction of my work. I'm a visual artist. I use light um, in space. I do a lot of projection lot of installations um, and um, I've been doing this for about 12 uh, to 15 years I guess I started doing VJing and then I then I moved on to a projection onto buildings and then uh, more recently I'm trying to get away from the screen completely and I'm projecting onto transparent screens and water particles and I'm trying to uh, to create these sort of floating images uh, and to create sort of, sort of spectacle about uh, the beauty of light and the beauty of, uh, of nature and water. Um, last year, I decided to stop um, doing all these projects because it was a bit of a race of like doing new things every month. And I, almost by accident, I heard about the Ambacher uh, Forest in Germany. Um, and I went there. I, 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 couldn't really believe uh, when people told me it's the largest coal mine of Europe. Uh, so I went on Google Maps and this is what I saw. I was really shocked, um, mostly that I've never been aware of uh, that coal mining was still a thing and coal mining was still very big and, and growing in Europe. Actually, 30% uh, of uh, German electricity is generated by coal and by the worst possible coal called lignit. So I went there and I used my drone uh, to make to document uh, my journey and my process. So I filmed the, the power plants that are burning the coal 24-7. I filmed um, the mines. There are a couple of mines. This one is Embach. It used to be the oldest uh, forest of Europe. It's about uh, 12,000 years old. Uh, so it's all gone now. Mostly there's like 10% left, but it's being um, cut and dried by the by the coal mining company. So I was really shocked. This, this landscape looks like mostly like uh, Mad Max and the end of the world. And, uh, and I, was really, I was really, really moved when I, when I went there for the first time. And I started going on a regular basis to document this place and to um, look at the, the, the crisis, the ecological crisis. Um, I think this particular place is the symbol of what we're doing to, to the planet. Uh, so yeah, basically I was so moved and shocked that I sort of, um, this, this picture is to give you an idea of the scale. <laughs> uh, the baggers are the largest machine on earth. They are like 200 meters by uh, 100 meter high. So yeah, I was just completely shocked to see how technology um, can, can destroy the, the environment. So I started documenting and going there on a regular basis. And I think after going there for the first time, I became um, a, a climate activist, uh, like a radical activist, I guess, like overnight, almost in a month, I started going and meeting people defending the forest. They, they, they live in the trees and they've been building tree houses to protect um, the forest from being cut. Uh, so I also started trying to do a bit of data viz. So these are the real time um, CO2 emissions from this location. It's just insane and unbelievable. Uh, so personally, I was trying to reduce my own uh, footprint by, you know, I stopped uh, flying. I, I do my best to reduce my consumption. And I, but um, 
after seeing this place, uh, I realized that all this is completely insignificant. Uh, all the individual effort that we should do uh, are just completely insignificant because uh, the larger industries are just doing, like 100 companies are doing, um, uh, are responsible for 70% of the global CO2 emissions. So we shouldn't blame individuals, but we should really go after those companies who are destroying, destroying the planet, but also they're destroying villages, they're destroying um, uh, churches. This is a church that was de demolished um, uh, two years ago. And you know, I love working with heritage and I love uh, doing projection mapping onto churches and cathedrals and I took that for granted, but seeing the destruction that is also uh, applied to heritage really broke my heart. So I was like, wow, fuck, I should really do something. I, I should stop my, uh, my sort of tech art projection stuff for a minute and think about the implication of, uh, of technology in, this, in the responsibility of tech. Uh, so now I'm going to skip like really fast. Basically, when I try to understand who is responsible for coal mining in Germany, I came across Autodesk, who's um, uh, providing software, uh, code, training expertise. They're basically helping to run this mine. The single largest source of CO2 emissions is, um, is operated by tech companies. Uh, and it's not just Autodesk. Here it's an example, but it's also... Uh, you know, Microsoft systems, and it's, it's um, uh, I think we're mostly responsible as like tech people of, of like looking away and not, not thinking about our, um, like what, when, when we do the promotion of software, we should be conscious. Um, so I started doing some research. I realized Autodesk does a lot of green PR, but it's all bullshit. They don't do any effort to reduce their impact. I talked to, um, um, the executive, the CEO of Autodesk, and then he stopped completely the, the dialogue. So I sort of, um, uh, so there was an exchange on Twitter and they deleted files. So basically they're like lying and hiding uh, information away from the consumers and investors. Um, I had a call with an executive for an hour and then they cut completely the uh, dialogue. Um, and then they banned me from the forums, they delete every attempt of um, sharing this information with employees and stuff. So they're doing like destroying the planet and also trying to, uh, to hide everything away from us. Uh, so I'm a bit angry. So I went there, I was lucky to be in Montreal. Uh, I had a lot of pictures that I've taken myself with the drone. I've printed them and I went uh, to buzz uh, at their office and um, they wouldn't let me in to just do you, you know a friendly meeting. So we did a pop-up exhibition, which I think it's it's interesting to use sort of creative ideas to engage, try to engage with them. So outside their office, we did this um, this pop-up exhibition. Um, there were a lot of people from New Tech, uh, lots of friends. Alexander um, Schultz was there, and it was very nice to you know just discuss about these these problems and the, the, the impact of tech. Um, so long story short, they still wouldn't reply. So I made a website, it's called autodesk.earth. So I use my HTML and CSS uh, skills uh, for climate justice. Um, hopefully, I don't know if this is gonna make a difference, but yeah, please check autodesk.earth. It's, um, I think web designers and web developers can use their skills to, um, to, to make a difference and to not just for environmental, activism, but also all kinds of activism. I think that there's a lot of um, need for skills and, and creative coders. Uh, so yeah, I'm gonna skip, skip all this. I actually use Autodesk tools to, um, to 3D scan the villages that are being destroyed. So I'm trying to use their own tools against them because they claim to be responsible and they love heritage and they love uh, churches, but they are basically helping the uh, erasure of, of these villages. 22,000 people have been expropriated to, ex to uh, take the coal. So I'm doing these 3D scans, which are memories of these villages that are being destroyed by the, by the tech companies. Um, I'm also, uh, I want to do something in, in real life. So I follow activism, uh, activists. So this is a group in Germany called Ende Gelände. They're really, really amazing. So I, they basically, they go to the coal mine and they block the infrastructure to get attention from the media. So I use my drone and my camera to document their work. Uh, this was actually last week 
we were blocked by the by the police just very close from um, being into the mine so i'm also trying to help documenting police violence uh, because I, I believe like uh, you said before everything is connected and um, racial injustice social injustice uh, disparities uh, all, all everything is, is, is connected and um, I believe now that activism for the environment can have um, also an impact on other issues. So this was, um, we, this was last Saturday, uh, like a week ago, and we blocked a, a coal bunker. That's where all the coal is being stored because it's be, before it, it's being burned. Um, so yeah, I think drones and um, the technology we use as Artists can be, can be used also for activism. My favorite shot, I think, I, had, I was hiding in the bushes so the police couldn't see me, and I was one mile away from this location, and I did this perfect shot of uh, the activist coming into the mine. Uh, so I'm working on a film. Uh, you can see here the police into the pit, uh, 200 meters lower, and uh, yeah, this is... Uh, this is new for me. I usually do like geometry and beautiful projections. So this is filmmaking. It's a bit weird for me, but uh, uh, it's one way, I, I guess, to do activism. Something closer to my activity, and I'm going to stop here. Um, I try to use portable projectors to support the activists. So this was my first rig, very basic, very tiny, but I can have it in my backpack. So I started doing this tiny projection um, in uh, in Brussels, and then I joined Extinction Rebellion in in England, and this is uh, Buckingham Palace. It was very fun. You can see here the projector uh, and the battery, and this is an extinction symbol uh, on Buckingham Palace. Um, also uh, on the government buildings, on the Parliament, um, and I made like since then I made a couple. This is the King's Palace in Belgium. Um, Refik was mentioning lasers la uh, earlier on. Actually, lasers are amazing. They're very bright, and you can project from very far. So I did a special projection about Autodesk into the, the mine uh, last year. And I'm going to close uh, with uh, those last pictures that were actually projected last Monday in Germany in, uh, on uh, Neurat. It's the, one of the most polluting coal, plants, coal power plants in Europe. Uh, it's responsible for 36 million tons of CO2 emissions. And uh, I did this laser projection at five in the morning, also like hiding in the bushes with uh, trying to uh, not be seen by the security. Um, so that was fun. That was a little stressful. But at the end, uh, um, I managed to uh, sort of support um, this movement. So this is the logo of Ende Gelende. And they are working mostly on trying to um, uh, bring an end to uh, coal mining and coal uh, electricity in Germany. Thank you. I was technically not able to see the videos, but I know so much police brutality videos that by the sound I could imagine what was happening. Yeah. Thank you for presenting. But it would be cool like for the rest if I can see the video also. Okay. Cool. <laughs> So I would just not interrupt you and you just go on uh, okay, with so taking I guess your I... space. Yeah, cool. Okay, mm -hmm. sure. Um, uh, thank you for having me. And so what I'll do is that I'll do a share screen so you can see the kind of like the images that I want to show. Um, Right. Um, I hope that you can see my screen. But so um, uh, to introduce, uh, I'm, my name is Samane Moafi, um, and I'm a researcher in forensic architecture. Forensic architecture is a research agency based here at Goldsmiths University of London. We undertake advanced spatial and media investigations into cases of human rights violations with and on behalf of communities affected by political violence. Um, uh, human rights organizations, international prosecutors, environmental justice groups, and media organizations. One of our research divisions in forensic architecture is dedicated to examining environmental violence through the lens of conflict. 
and um, and and this is kind of like this is something that that is um, uh, quite key. Um, we call this unit the Center for Contemporary Nature. Um, and what does contemporary nature mean? Historically, nature has been understood as a static, eternal back drop to human history, right? Um, so um, social, political, military, or industrial activities happen with their own pace, and nature is kind of like just in the background responding to it passively. And this is, this is the kind of like thinking that we have since Hobbes and the Leviathan. The sovereign power begins where nature ends. Now, today, with the and, and, and kind of like I, I want you to 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 look at the what what I'm showing you. So this is um, an NDVI um, analysis that looks at the um, the surface of the Earth, the black spots or areas that are static. So we have um, uh, stable forests or forests or, or um, stable deserts. So the black parts are the parts that are stable, but the parts that are shifting, the orange is the threshold of the desert and the blue is the threshold of the forest. And you can see how far this threshold moves. This is kind of like, um, uh, this is um, the, the month of April for the past 10 years. So you, you're just like looking at one month um, uh, year by year by year. Um, to um, uh, today with the rapid anthropocentric climate change, contemporary nature is being updated. Oh, um, uh, contemporary nature is being updated alongside human history, um, interacting and becoming entangled with it. One of the key influencers to our environment is conflict. Um, and so conflict is no longer something that is specific to human on human forms of um, violence, but actually involves nature inside it. And this is a shift that is kind of very much at the center of our work. The violence is a bit different though. Violence, it is here, the violence is slow, it's indirect, it's diffused, but yet enmeshed in colonial and military forms of domination. So looking at environmental violence through the lens of conflict opens up a very unique opportunity to kind of like be able to engage with, um, to, to kind of like be able to describe what this violence is. Um, and here, the contemporary nature is not only the kind of like the victim of a form of violence, it's sometimes a belligerent, sometimes it's a witness to it. And so in that way, how can we make nature speak um, about, about this violence? How can we bring it to, to speech? Um, uh, and so with that, I'll kind of like, um, I'll, um, I'll come here to, um, to the scale of one beef. So what you're looking at now is, um, is selak, which is a plant that is, um, local to Palestine. You cook with selak, basically. Um, there's a beautiful Palestinian stew that you can um, uh, make using it. You can use it the same way that but you would use um, wine leaves, for example. You can kind of like make a dolme and, and use it as a wrap for, um, for rice. You can make salads with it. Um, um, but maybe not this one. We showed this leaf, um, the, the, the mark, we showed this leaf to a toxicologist who was telling us the markings that we can see on the leaf, these kind of spots, are um, in fact the effects of a herbicidal burn on the leaf. Uh, this image was taken by um, Shuri de Molavi, who is um, a researcher in forensic architecture, kind of like is specialized in um, Palestine, who was on the field. So this is kind of like this image is one of the ones that she's taking together with this one, a zucchini leaf, a zucchini leaf, a basila, um, uh, or pea, 
is spinach. And so things that are kind of like leaves that are um, all for cooking, for food. Um, and, and it's very special when it, when, it come to, when you think about the economy of food in Palestine as well. So these are, these are um, uh, images that, uh, image, these, these leaves she has picked from the border um, of Gaza with um, Israel. And we know about the politics of food, um, of how controlled it is and how little and kind of like controlled amount Israel allows food to enter Gaza and how pressure it is to be able to grow your own food, right? And so these images, these leaves, um, the farmers were telling us were um, affected by Israeli herbicidal spraying. So yes, it is the effect of herbicide, but not their own herbicide, it's Israeli um, spring. To prove what they were telling, they were also taking um, films of, um, of the act of spring. So films like, um, uh, like this. You can see um, you can see this drone that is um, flying in the sky. You can see it turning around. You can see you can hear a wind in the background if you kind of like if you can hear it. The line that you can see here is actually the border. So the plane is really close. It's super close to the farmer who's standing on this side, and you can see now that it's there is a spraying of of herbicide. You can see an Israeli watchtower and you can see a smoke coming out of this um, Israeli watchtower. So this is one of the films that was sent to us as evidence that this is um, this is kind of uh, and it, the Israelis are, are spraying herbicide on the farms. We thought that's that we thought that we do have the tools to be able to um, take um, take this act to court. If the plane was in fact flying on the uh, Gazan side, uh, destroying the Gazan plants, then we could we could we could show that we have the video. We can map exactly where the plane is, and with that, um, we can show that the plane, the Israeli kind of drone, is uh, a, a plane is violating the border, is entering Gaza illegally, and is spraying herbicide. That was the question with which we engaged um, with this investigation. Now, we also asked for a, 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 an FOI um, to learn about, the, from the Ministry of Defense, to learn about the technique of herbicidal spraying, what are the kind of practices that are in place. For example, um, there is, uh, we learned that there is the width of the, uh, of the border is, is needs to be fumigated according to Israeli standards. There is a mix of glyphosate, oxyfluorphan, and duron that is used for, um, for the spraying. This is the particular type of glyphosate that they're using for the spraying. So, this, so let's do that. So we started with geolocating um, the camera. So this is a screenshot of a videographer. We know the location where he was standing in. You're looking at, um, so, so then in the video, we could see certain elements like the watchtower. We could measure it on the plan. And with that, we could calculate the camera's cone of vision. And then therefore we could really accurately understand where exactly things are in space with our kind of like with our technique of um, um, of understanding the camera coin and its geometry and its uh, mathematics. So we did that. We had the model built the model of the territory and we um, played the video in space and we modeled the path of the plane when it was spraying herbicide. You can uh, see that, and, and we use this to look at the plane very, very closely. 
like an insect. We wanted to understand its behavior. So you can see that now it's dipping down to the ground. It's getting closer to the ground. It's um, all of a sudden st starts uh, spraying herbicide. It then dips out and uh, goes up a little bit. Now it keeps doing it again. It dipped down again. Um, it's gonna. It, it it waits for like a few seconds. Then it starts her her uh, spraying herbicide. Each act of spraying um, goes on for a few seconds long, not too long. Um, and and so you know there is there is these uh, few seconds of spraying. Then there's a few seconds of spot. Few seconds of spraying. Few seconds of uh, um, of of not spraying. And then uh, you can see that it was a line that it was going now, but it's not only in one direction. We learn that the plane goes up, it turns around, and then um, uh, dips down again. And I also want you to think about the farmers now who are making this film. Who are who have their smartphones up, who are pointing it towards the plane? They cannot do anything. They know that two or three days after um, the spring, all of their crops are going to be demolished, uh, burnt, and so. So they're taking it with the kind of like hope that something could be done with this, that it could become an evidence and it could be used in the um, in the courts to bring liability and to kind of like stop this practice. So yeah, so this is um, um, now that we had modeled the path of the plane um, throughout this kind of like this, this procedure, we then uh, jumped into, uh, we looked at where these paths are. We learned that they're very close to one another, but they're all on the Israeli side of the border actually. So it was a big question for us that what is actually happening? Why is it that um, the planes are on the Israeli side, but uh, the um, the uh, uh, the herbicidal, um, uh, but but it's the Gazan farms that are being that that are burning. It's the Gazan plants that are burning. How could this be possible? And we thought about it over and over, um, looking at the videos kind of like forensically to understand what's, what's going on. And then we realized that there is one thing that we had overlooked. And that was the, um, that was the, um, uh, the agency that the wind was playing in this. So what we did to understand what the wind is doing in this kind of a scenario, we um, gave our, uh, uh, we put the uh, path of the plane that we had modeled in 3D into a simulation software. Uh, and we simulated the way that the particles of the herbicide would have moved according to the wind direction, the humidity, the kind of like the climate of the day, right? Because all of those things, the heat, the the, 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 um, uh, the, all of these things affect the way that particles move in um, in uh, uh, in air, and so our simulation showed that this is the, the bits, the kind of the, the dots that you're looking at. These are the, um, the the particles, and the bits that you can see on the ground are the bits that are absorbed by the ground. So it takes time for the particles to sit on the ground. We let the simulation to play for a few hours, actually, to kind of like have a good idea of to, to let all the particles to sit on the ground. And our um, study showed that. Uh, the, um, the, 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 the toxic um, uh, herbicide actually goes way deep, hundreds of meters deep into the Gazan territory. In fact, the regulation was that you need to um, and it, it, we realize that all the herb, uh, all the springs are happening very early in the morning when the breeze is going from land 
to the sea, from the Israeli side to the Gazan side. And so the wind was weaponized for to kind of like to carry um, the herbicide um, um, to the um, uh, to the Gazan side. Now, I know that I'm running short, but I just want to tell you about the way that different gazes um, come together and the way that we practice. So we don't only kind of like look at one gaze, but what but part of our work is to bring in sync different kinds of gazes and eyes that look at the same form of violence. So from here, we went um, to do um, a, a um, um, NDVI analysis. So look at the way that satellites can register um, uh, vegetation loss. And if the satellite was also registering, so if you have the farmers who are collecting the leaves and, shit and photographing them, um, that this is the effect of herbicide. If we have a simulation that is telling us how the herbicide is moving, and then if we have satellite images that are registering the loss of vegetation, then we're kind of like, you know, there is this corroboration. There is a three of them are looking at the same thing. And so with, um, with the NDVI analysis that we did. It's a technique that kind of like looks at um, the vegetation surface and monitors the losses and the gains. And we realize that this uh, loss of um, vegetation is not only in this one place that we had um, looked at with the video, but it's actually a practice that is all along the border. So it's a border um, practice in a way. And it goes um, um, hand in hand with other kinds of practices that, um, um, that, uh, that the Israeli military is doing, is doing to be able to secure the border. So this is the, actually, I'm um, given the time, I'm kind of like, um, cool. I, wanna, I, I wanna end with here, with this image that looks at the border of, um, of Gaza. The red is showing the loss. Thanks a lot. Cool. Yeah, I didn't mean to interrupt you. I could go on listening and watching this for hours. I think it's really interesting. But yeah, let's go on and take also your time. And we will listen to Matthew now and watch. And we have a sound problem, I think. Somebody uh, solving it. Um, oh, yeah, cool. Yeah, you now, can hear you. Me now, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so, yes, I'm really glad to be here in such great company. Those two talks were absolutely incredible and uh, really inspiring. Um, my talk is maybe a little bit different. I guess, well, the similarities with, with Joni's story, uh, you know, I've been a practitioner in media arts and digital art for a long time now. Um, but the last couple of years have really sort of resonated with me and to sort of inspired me to sort of rethink my practice and rethink how I can use my, my tools and, and, and my skills in a different manner. So let me just jump over to this presentation. Um, so yeah, I'm going to start off trying a, a, a bit experimental here, uh, which is um, being able to pass on a message. So I, in a way, I'm going to try and use my platform here to echo a message. So if you point with your camera, um, your smartphone camera at the screen to pick up this QR code or just go to the browser and type in echoar.org, um, you'll get to a page, and this page loads the augmented reality app. Um, it doesn't require an app, it's all in browser. Uh, and then, so hopefully you're on this website, and you can now point your camera at this AR marker. Um, so if you missed it, the, the website's called echoar.org, and you can now point your camera at this marker. And you should be able to see these protest signs now appearing. And these are signs that I've collected from, from young people at different events, um, at some of the first uh, <clears throat> Friday for Future protests, 
uh, that were initiated by Greta Thunberg, and also Extinction Rebellion events um, that I've attended as well. Um, and I think it's really important to, to echo these messages and to archive these messages. I think that the signage is, 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 is really poetic. There's something really incredible in, in how young people can use powerful and simple metaphors to, to explain complex issues, the, com the complex crises of our time. Um, like this one here, I can't swim. Um, so hopefully you can see some of these, there's some other ones uh, using the AR marker. And I, I really, I, I have to see these to sort of remind myself sometimes of what society is asking from us now. Um, you know, some are just quite blunt, like save me with, with an F uh, diagram. Uh, some are kind of uh, alluding to other mass extinction events. Um, but it's really incredible that the sort of the collective message here, it's, it's, it's almost like a mandate to do something, to act now. Um, and this, this project actually started in, in April uh, 2019, so not that long ago. Um, and I started with a series of workshops with young people around the same time as Greta Thunberg started doing her um, campaign, and that was purely coincidental. Um, but obviously, you know, this, this took and great inspiration from what young people are doing around the world. And at these workshops, um, you know, young people would just come up with the best slogans you've ever heard of, like, no plastic will be fantastic. Um, and so then I could go immediately to children um, in this kind of augmented reality world, so they could sort of run around with all their signage. Um, but then around the corner, there was this, you know, the when I, I think it was the second Extinction Rebellion uh, event in London. This was their sort of first uh, big London lockdown, which was April 2019. And I, my studio was just at the end of this bridge. This, this is Waterloo Bridge. I kind of took this app with me that I just made with these young people. Um, and um, it was just a great to sort of bring it to life and um, just see it in this context. Um, there was something sort of quite moving and empowering about this, the, the way that Extinction Rebellion had occupied the bridge. I worked and, and lived in London for a long time now, and, and this, this bridge has always been kind of awful. It's always been occupied by traffic, the pedestrian routes along one side is not complete. So there, there was always this uh, like end of the bridge in which you'd have to almost like jump onto the road to be able to complete the pedestrian journey. And it was just really moving to see it just reimagined as, as this, this kind of really peaceful, civilized space in which people could just chill out and, and have picnics and skateboard. And um, yeah, and then, you know, um, all these children were turning out with their parents, they were putting plants every, every day, it was kind of gathering pace. And the funny thing is this idea was, this idea of a garden bridge was seeded uh, by a totally different program, which was Thomas Heatherwick's Garden Bridge. Um, I think this, this, I think of this as the most expensive solar punk render ever made because this bridge was commissioned, um, but was never built. Um, so all we, all we have left of, of this project is, is this image. But it's quite a powerful image, clearly. It managed to inspire a group of people to come down to the next bridge along and, and sort of occupy it and create and say, you know, any, any of these bridges could be a garden bridge. Why does it have to be a new bridge? Um, we can just make a garden bridge in a day. Um, so I've kind of been really fascinated by, well, obviously Extinction Rebellion. I've been a member of Extinction Rebellion for a, for a while now. Um, but it really reminds me of the power of, you know, just, just good visualizations and images uh, to inspire new ideas, to inspire. Um, so I, 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 I see this as, as a need for imagination. And this is not something that I've come up with. This is something that many 
theorists in this field discuss Rob Hopkins, who's from Transition Sounds Networks, in his book, What If? He says, bringing about the world we want to live in, the world we want to leave for our children is substantially the world with the work of imagination. And yet nobody seems to explain why our imaginations are failing us so spectacularly. Why are we so incapable of creating a vision in which we capably address global crises? Um, George Monbiot, who you might may have heard of, he writes for The Guardian, uh, writes in his book Out of the Wreckage, Out of the Wreckage, despair is the state we fall into when our imagination fails, when we have no stories that describe the present and guide the future, hope evaporates. And I and I th and I think about this a lot. The, this this sort of crisis of imagination that uh, and Jane mentioned in her opening lecture for Node uh, 2020. Um, and it makes me think very profoundly about the role of art. Like, has art always played uh, an, an important role in, in shaping the world? Um, a sort of uh, placing itself in this feedback loop in between the world and our collective imagination. Like, do we understand the world, learn to, to sort of depict it and visualize it, and then play that back so that people can kind of uh, nurture their imagination. And by nurturing their imagination, they go on to, to reshape the world in that image. Um, and some of our earliest art, I mean, this is from 15,000 years ago, and it depicts the farm animals that, that people depended on, or maybe these were animals that were, were, weren't necessarily farmed but hunted. But it, you know, from, from, from this era to 19th century landscape paintings, you know, many artists worked on really mainly depicting nature uh, and, and to, to some extent going beyond that and idolizing nature. Um, this is the Aztec goddess of maize. Um, and even further than that, we have these like incredible monuments from the past that still inspire us today, like Stonehenge, that has this incredible capacity to, 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 to really inspire us by capturing the moment at which this, the, the, the earth completes the cycle around the sun. Um, and maybe it's just me, maybe it's, it's not necessarily so powerful at shaping our imagination and shaping our world. So I, I sort of looked to some evidence of this actually happening. And this farm here in, in Normandy was founded only in 2006, the Femme de Bec. Um, and this, this farm is now one of the most successful stories within permaculture. Uh, permaculture is a form of intensive, small-scale agriculture that's entirely organic and uh, self-sufficient in, in this kind of closed loop. And the, the, the couple that started this farm had never stepped on an organic farm before they started this project. They had, they had never been to an agricultural course. Instead, they took their inspiration from art. They said the Lucian Quedras unknowingly influenced the genesis of our farm. His works are imbued with a poetic charge that touched me deeply. I walked for hours in his paintings. And this is from a fantastic book called Miraculous Abundance, uh, written in 2016 that really sort of documents the whole project. Um, and these are the paintings that they talk about. And, and you can really see the similarities. The thing that someone spent ages walking through these paintings, imagining, visualizing uh, a, a different narrative of how they wanted to live, live their life. Um, you know, and these paintings you know, document um, practices that were forgotten, such as coppicing, collecting firewood. Um, but also these, these type of scientific images can really save, I mean, for me, this image is really powerful because I really struggled to understand some of the complexities of climate change. And yet this, this one image really describes, you know, how we can go from a rainforest to dry desert by decreasing uh, precipitation um, or, or by decreasing temperature to, to reach maybe a deciduous forest and so on. Um, so, you know, for, for ages, you know, artists have probably been really, really fundamental in, in maybe feedbacking and 
and nurturing that public imagination. But the last 100 years ago, we, we have been stuck in this new world art imaginary loop where this new type of artist emerges that is bound to commercial obligations to create a new narrative um, to be able to sell to people this, this totally other paradigm of, of depending on industrial production and commercial goods. And I'm not going to show this slide for much longer because we, we get bombarded by enough of this as it is. Um, uh, Rob Hopkins uses this quite a lot. If we lived on the moon, our imagination would be as barren as the moon. Uh, perhaps we should update this to say, if we, lived on, if we lived in Facebook, our imagination would be as ugly as Facebook. Um, so I, for my sort of motives this year has been really to sort of rewild this world, our imagination loop myself. This is my sort of approach to this. And first, I, I, I kind of work with kind of rewilding my own imagination. Uh, one of the first things that I did after joining Extinction Rebellion was just source 100 tree saplings. And then I had the, the task of having to plant these trees everywhere. But in doing so, I really understood much more about trees than I ever fundamentally had before. And every day, I'm constantly trying to sort of collect uh, photographs and references and understand the ecology of my surroundings. Um, just picking up the soil and understanding why you know plants can thrive in in the most unlikely of conditions uh, and likewise going to where these industrial foods are produced i mean this is a potato farm just before they plant the potatoes and this soil is dead matter there's nothing living in it um so again going back home i i've you know tried to just grow stuff again just kind of rekindle this imagination uh, a lot of my all the plants that I've grown, I've sort of just donated to local community, to neighbors. And all these kind of small little projects just end up with um, biodiversity, which is amazing. It's just being able to see rewilding in action by these small, small gestures. Um, and these are some of the um, um, areas of, of discourse that I'm really interested in uh, personally. And, very much interested in agroforestry, which is this uh, tree-based form of, of agriculture. Uh, so second, I really think about sort of re rewilding my artistic tools, my palette. And this is why I guess my practice is always centered on, um, traditionally I would make software to sort of um, parametrically design things or color things. Um, and this is done in processing and this has been the way I've managed to sort of achieve uh, certain visual aesthetics. Um, but now I kind of look at processing as like, okay, how can I visualize some of these things I'm reading about? So this is just me trying to think about how do you visualize um, successions? So when, when a land is clear, a forest is constantly moving and is sort of recolonizing that cleared land. Or, or how do we visualize, a, I don't know, a root system and um, ability to sort of, sort of uh, intelligently look out for minerals. Um, I've been really interested in Blender because Blender for me is, is like the complete visualization tool. It's something that I can, I can really sort of create a more photorealistic environment um, that I can use then to, to, to rewild other people's imaginations. So I spend a lot of time just sort of practicing small techniques and trying to close that feedback loop. So there was this one day in which uh, uh, me and other neighbors, we sort of helped this, this little um, goldfinch recover from, from a nasty accident. And so immediately it's like, okay, well, I need to have goldfinches in my tools now. I need to have a goldfinch in my, my personal library. Uh, and I've even started just to sort of experiment with rewilding my old previous works. Like this is every Mickey now covered in a, in a lichen texture. And, you know, here's some of the parametric textures that I made. So this makes it much easier than to draw trees. And then before you know it, you've got like grasses and solar panels and you can start putting all this stuff together and you can start really sort of and these, these whole new worlds um, because we just, you know, you just amass these, these tools to, to build it. 
And I've also started looking at hardware. So with Julian, uh, the Soir for Long Term Collaborator, uh, we're working on a, on a small rendering system using a Raspberry Pi, which is connected to the Raspberry Pi camera, um, which kind of combines rendering with what you'd get from like a, a time-lapse camera. So that when you're actually rendering an image, you can instantly import the, the environment that's, that's outside. So, um, so you know, you can, you can get the image um, from outdoors to use as, as a backdrop or as an HDRI texture, or even take the temperature reading from the Raspberry Pi itself to, to influence the shader. Um, Maybe come to an end, I would quickly interrupt you, because now we really have to see that we find time also for Teresa in the end. But okay. take, take some time to finish. Cool. Okay, thank you. So Thanks. I'll take a, take a couple of seconds now. Mm -hmm. um, so these are my, my last few slides. This is a project that I've been working on uh, using Willow. And it's really trying to, to close that feedback loop so that I'm designing things and drawing things, but I'm also experimenting and trying to build them with Willow. Um, and this is to create this kind of vertical uh, tower in which you'd be able to sort of grow Willow to grow these towers and, and then plant more objects so that it's, you know, like a, a more self-sufficient way of, of vertical farming. Um, I got really interested now in these kind of like living forms of, of, of towers, you know, this, this tree shaking practice. So inspired by that, I've really managed to sort of push this idea forwards and then through uh, more improved rendering techniques, you know, I can, I can start to bring this project to life. And I, I think, you know, these videos now, you know, they can disseminate them online. I can share them with people that work in agroecology and start having conversations and say, look, do you think something like this would be possible? And, and, and for me, this is now the, the, maybe the power of the artist is to help sort of activate and, and, and nurture our imagination. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Cool. And thanks for wait, waiting also, Teresa. And now we can experience your, what you want to share. Can you hear us? I can hear you. Oh, yeah, cool. Can you hear me? So you want to start? Yeah, I can hear you. Nice to hear you. Yeah, hi. Cool. <laughs> okay, so um, I have a few introductory slides, so if you can share my screen. Mm -hmm. um, well, I just say a few words about myself. I'm a conceptual artist and I work mainly with new media technologies and biotechnology, um, exploring unconventional visions of nature, technology and the self. A lot of my work is grounded in uh, post-human theory and questions the relation of humans to the environment as well as uh, the evolvement of matter and meaning beyond the anthropos. So... Uh, here, I'm just uh, getting the information that screen share is not reaching the people in the background with the technique. Okay. You can check if you're now? sharing. I'm sharing. Can you see it now? Okay, now I can also see it. Cool. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> that makes more sense. Um, so I just quickly run through a couple uh, of my older projects to finally arrive at the main project that I want to talk about. Um, so I have a background uh, for many years in uh, working with fungi and mushrooms. I cultivate them in my studio and I use them also in my artworks, in living installations, um, in experiments where I connect them, for example, here to sound frequencies. I make interactive generative installations uh, with them, such as this work um, at Futurium in Berlin. I make a uh, Immersive video environments uh, based on computation, or I also uh, discovered a big passion for 3D scanning because I really like the point clouds. 
And also for the last three years, I'm running uh, these kind of walks or performative walks in forests around Berlin and Brandenburg, um, where I introduce people to collecting mushrooms and I collaborate with scientists, explaining them how they can cultivate mushrooms and also with a research goal of uh, looking for new uh, design and building materials based on mycelium compounds. Um, the project that I would like to talk about today is called Meet Me. Um, I premiered that just at the beginning of this year, uh, in February, before uh, the corona pandemia became really uh, apparent here in Europe. Um, it's uh, talking about the topic of bioethics and body politics. Uh, the question, the main question that was behind this project for me was uh, what is actually an animal in our society? So animals are mostly used for our exploitation as products and materials. We use them for food, for fashion, cosmetics or science. Many thinkers of post-humanism stress a non-human centered perspective on the world and that we should assume a more modest role in our dealings with nature stop categorizing, and that we as humans are likewise animals. So the consequence that I have drawn is if we see the human as an animal, then we should also be food. This is of course a provocation, but it's not science fiction or some morbid dystopia. It's a possibility, at least technically. In 1648, René Descartes, one of the main founders of modern philosophy, came out with a weird, weird paper claiming that animals are non sentient automata. They eat without pleasure, they cry without pain. Their screams are not more than the squeaking of a wheel. When we look at the way um, industrial farming of animals is done today, this kind of background doesn't seem too far off from reality. Uh, um, according to the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, animal farming accounts for a significant share of greenhouse gas emissions, land use, as well as global consumption of water and energy. Another problem is that they estimate that the meat consumption will double by 2015 if it continues to stay this way, and uh, the uh, world population will rise. There's obviously different kind of numbers uh, depending on who um, collects uh, the data, um, but it's contributing to a big problem that we have today. So scientists came up with a kind of uh, solution to this problem by looking into cultured meat. So cultured meat means uh, we go to the laboratory and grow uh, meat in vitro. <clears throat> Thus, we avoid having to farm and kill animals. And um, in 2013, um, Mark Post, who is a professor at the Maastricht University in the Netherlands, he was the first to showcase a proof of concept for cultured meat by creating the first burger patty grown directly from cells. Since then, several cultured meat projects prototypes have gained media attention, but we haven't seen it yet on the market for several reasons. So on this nice sketch, you see um, the different steps that would be involved in one of the methods um, when you um, try to cultivate in vitro meat, which basically starts with a biopsy where you take muscle cells or stem cells from an animal, you take it to the laboratory, you put it in an incubator, you feed it with uh, serum, proteins, and nutrition. Then the cells continue to grow, they start to form larger muscle fiber, and at the end you end up with some kind of a meat uh, or minced meat, more or less, that you can use, for example, for a burger or sausages. Here is a second sketch <clears throat> um, that shows the same thing, but it has another um, important factor in, in this diagram, which is on number three which highlights the fact that you need growth serum to actually have uh, the cells grow. So 
In conventional production, this growth serum comes from, uh, it's called fetal bovine serum, which means it comes from the living fetus that is drained from blood while it's still alive and it dies during this removal. So the fact of trying to make clean meat uh, in vitro kind of becomes absurd as well when you look um, at all the other factors that are involved when, when trying to make it. So um, what I've done is um, for the last one and a half years is um, research this topic and developed a performance where I'm presenting this provocative notion of a biotech era cannibalism to raise awareness exactly for those issues that I prior mentioned um, to illustrate this better. I have a little video that um, the studio should be able to play now. If they hear me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we can hear you. I'm just waiting. Yeah, and then, now I can Some see kind you. of an autophagous dinner performance uh, with myself. Dehumanism puts an end to the need to consider whether eating someone is socially proper or not. Those who choose to reject are free of moral constraints. No, no, no. Then then can, can think. think. We can progress beyond a disembodied solid system people and start to have a fair and just society for With modern biotechnology, it has become possible to grow new organs or tissue from ourselves. Genome editing in theory allows us to construct a human as if it were a manual for a product. This has turned our bodies into a ground for engineering and to a certain degree made it reconstructable. In conclusion, I am treating my body as a material, an impersonal objective structure or architecture in the words of performance artist Stella to experiment with. is one of the big taboos left in our society. It's left for apocalyptic dystopian scenarios in popular culture, films, series, dark zones where we usually don't want to go. Historically, cannibalism was also used to justify the killing of the white western men of indigenous communities and to conquer new territories. Alleged cannibal tribes, for example on the Caribbean islands, were compared with animals. A human that consumes another human loses its humanity, it becomes animal, a beast without rights.
There is an odd feeling of uneasiness and discomfort to both. The thinking about the growth of the new beings of body parts and legs, as well as about artificial intelligence. Stem cells and units are invading the realm of the financial industry. In a world where all life on Earth is a threat to all life and must be eliminated or reduced, this position is unchallengeable, and there is no disputing it. For nature, a truly wild world, ideals of free thought, quality, spirituality, self-determination, free health care, it's all feeling and games until you look at the sky, we would all be better off without all of this. We hate Mother Nature. We hate we only see the destruction of something as if it were some kind of tribute to ourselves. You don't have to look so hard to see that there's nothing we were doing or willing to sacrifice to save Mother Earth, because we need her for our freedom and our health. Some kind of a autophagist. Maybe, Teresa, you can repeat what you... I saw you speaking, but we still had the um, audio of the video, oh, yeah. so maybe... Okay, okay. I'm, I'm back on. Can you hear me? Sorry? Can you hear me? Yeah, now I can hear you. It's like the oh, last okay, sentence okay. after the video was missing. It was nothing important. <laughs> um, just that you should finish the video, that was all. <laughs> so... Um, um, another quick... Uh, context about this project. So the COVID-19 pandemic that we are experiencing now has added another unforeseeable relevance to my project. An article in The Guardian from March 28 has linked factory farming to the coronavirus. It explains how the animal industrialization has required more and more space. And in consequence, those farms were pushed out of inhabited zones closer to the forest. Back in March, the assumption was that the coronavirus may originate from wild animals like bats, animals that are living in forests, and thus get in contact with nearby farmed animals, which as intermediate hosts of the disease have infected humans through consumption. Another article on the Chinese blog Chuang from February 28 gives more details about this so-called, quote, evolutionary pressure cooker of capitalist agriculture and urbanization. The virus behind the epidemic was, like its 2003 predecessor SARS-CoV, as well as the avian flu and swine flu before it, bred at the nexus of economics and epidemiology. It's not coincidental that so many of these viruses have taken on the names of animals. This is what is called zoonotic transfer, which is a way of saying that infections jump from animals to humans. So um, this is kind of a close-up of uh, my human in vitro meat um, in a larger glass container before uh, it was fried and eaten. And this is a tiny bit of the fried dinner left over. Um, and this is the end of my presentation. I would leave the rest for our discussion. Thank you. Thanks a lot. And also, we lost Joanny on the way, but hopefully he will be back online. So I will just easily sum up what we just heard. <laughs> I have like one thought I had is maybe we should all meet later in Speaker's Corner and talk about like 24-7 live channel where we invite other radical artists and all share stuff about their work and then we can all watch it all the time and get inspiration. 
Um, one thing I was also thinking is like there's a theater author, author he's called Simon Stevens, maybe some of you know him, he's like London theater author, and he, I li listened to a speech once about storytelling and why storytelling is so important these days. Because what a storyteller is doing is telling what was just happening, what is happening, or what might happen next. And I think each of this is like, for me, it's like also what we saw just now with the meat is like also an image of humans can do everything. Like technically humans can do everything. And I think art is also a really important sphere where technical possibilities can be like researched and tested and experimented on outside of capitalism. Because actually there's maybe like, Porn and capitalism, you know, experience new art techniques and new um, technical possibilities and media and all this stuff. And art is like really, really important sphere of trying out these techniques. And I see like it's it, like a huge part is for sure documentation. It's it's like telling telling to the people that are overwhelmed of complexity because there's a lot of complexity overwhelming nearly everybody now. So all the artworks that we saw now, I think, are helping to either sum up what was just happening or sh to show what can happen, like what could happen, what can happen, what is happening. Like, yeah, a person is eating their own meat. This is also like already possible 2020. Or like what could, could happen next, what is really something where I could engage with like this world art loop and how to tell stories and imagine stuff. And it's like, I don't know, it's like for me also really when I learned to solder, then I had ideas about soldering. So it's really also like what skill sets you find out and experiment with that it, this is what enlarges your, your practice and, and the ideas that you can have. So I think now we have like 16 minutes left because it was really interesting. Um, for sure, there are different topics we can talk about. You know, we can think like art, ah, we can talk about impact. It's something that I learned from Jeremy, like measurement of impact. Like, do you know when you have been heard with your voice? Or we could talk about what is your skill and what is actually your voice. It's also something that I was asking before in the appetizer. TV, like everybody listening, or to you people at home, think of what is your skill, not what is your job, because everybody here, I think, had a job and left the job into their skill and then became radical with it. So to share a bit of the thoughts, I mean, there's a lot more. I have all this funny paper with a lot of stuff we can talk about later, but what I think would be interesting now and the one question I would pose and see if there's uh, time for another is, would you want to, or what would change if you would all do all the stuff anonymously? Would you like to do your work anonymously? Maybe also to reflect on, I don't know if it's like part for every one of you, but for sure there was like an art career and then a political step and how much might this also be part of being heard and creating impact. So now I, kind of packed three questions in one. But I think this topic with working anonymously would be really interesting. And I don't know who of you wants to share. Um, uh, I want to kind of like come in with one clarification. Forensic architecture is not an artist group. So this is very important to understand. We are a research unit based in Gold Goldsmith University. And that's a kind of like very important clarification to make. Mm -hmm. We are a team. Um, so it's not kind of like an individual based um, thing. It's a team that grows and shrinks depending on the kind of like the time. And it's a team that is multidisciplinary. We have architects, my background is architecture, but we have um, um, architects, coders, web developers, um, uh, legal um, scholars, journalists, um, filmmakers. And so this really kind of like our practice is at the threshold between all of these things. And that's why um, all of our works are forensic architects architecture works, as in, you know, there's the question of authorship that you're also raising. I don't see it kind of like necessarily mm -hmm. applying to us because ourselves, we are a research unit and also every single one of our projects are developed in collaborations. And to kind of like come back to the question of the arts, um, I want to I want to say um, a couple of words about our relationship to art, and that's um, to say that yes, of course, we exhibit our works 
in uh, in the galleries and in uh, exhibitions but we use them as forums to discuss to kind of like exhibit uh, to to bring different types of sensibility we're not um as in we're not an artistic practice that thinks about producing an artwork that then would be exhibited in um in in an art gallery we um do investigations our 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 kind of like our mandate is to be able to um help claims of the kind of like our collaborators of people who've been inflected by violence. Um, a lot of the times we only show our work with, uh, with media groups when we're kind of like working on that side, when we're collaborating with journalists. A lot of the times um, we're presenting our work in the court of law. And kind of like the gallery is only one of the forums that we show our work in. It's not kind of like the goal that we kind of like we move towards or or um, or something. And I think um, it's, yeah, and I want to hear about kind of like yeah. what... Um, how, how you, how the others um, see. Um. Yeah, I think this is like, it's interesting for me. I would also say either I'm not an artist or everybody else is too. So this is also a point of talking about arts and arts here. And for sure, it's less dangerous to frame something as art in the first time, but then still it can create a lot of impact. And also I think it's, yeah, but let's see, maybe other people want to want to answer. We all do a lot of this. I like it. We all like everybody is like saying yes all the time. So you want to? Joanne looks really like you want to say something. Um, I'm, no, I'm not really sure how to to connect what I'm going to say, but um, about our impact and our role as um, either artists or people use or, or architects or creatives or people using technology. I, I'm just going to talk from from my own perspective because like a, a lot of the people here are doing very exciting things with technology and like moving using technology in, in the right direction. But personally, I feel like I've been scammed a little bit um, when I was taught the sort of ideology of, um, um, of like technology is good, uh, it's gonna solve problems, um, it's really important in life to 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 have a, a job, a good job, and and good money. You know all these things. When we are in a situation of crisis, you realize it. It's all bullshit. It it it's all it's a big scam. Like um, uh, I feel like in in the most uses of technology are actually pointless. Like uh, advertising. Um, uh, um, all, all these amazing uh, skills that we have in our community are very often, and, and I, I feel I feel I, I was in I, I had a problem in, in the past, uh, are really used in a bad way. Like it's not helping um, necessarily uh, uh, society or citizens, and and I, I only I feel like I've only realized this not long ago, seeing the world collapsing and seeing how uh, GAFAs and social network uh, by selling data to uh, shady corporations like Cambridge Analytica, how they actually manage to rule the world and, and push us out of uh, the democratic societies. And um, so, I, so yeah, what I realized lately is that technology is mostly used in a really, really terrible uh, um, usage. Um, and for me, it's the first thing to realize, to be sort of critical um, uh, about the, the misuse of technology and this sort of illusion that code, creative uh, 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 technology in general is, is a good thing. Um, by example, Autodesk does products get good thing, but they're mostly destroy, destroying the planet. They're working with the, with the 100 most polluting companies in the world. They're working in oil, in gas. They are, uh, so, so I feel really scammed when I see their PR, and uh, Autodesk is just, just an example. But yeah, for me, my, my first step was to look at reality and realize that it's not okay to work, to do advertising for cars, uh, to sort of push this ideology of consumption. Uh, we should think about uh, the amount of resources, electricity, uh, uh, computers, projectors, and consumables that we consume and, and use because this has an impact. Um, again, like I'm really angry against myself of just realizing this like <laughs> yesterday uh, when I, like I should have before. But yeah, for me, it's like being realistic that technology is mostly destroying 
the living world. Um, and I think we have collectively enough skills and ideas and, and creativity. And uh, Matthew was talking about imaginaries. And Teresa had shown this really amazing example of um, a possible future that is le has less impact. So but yeah, personally for me, it was like being realistic about that, how technology just, is just destroying uh, the living world. And uh, like direct question to you, would you enjoy to not have your website with your projections and your name on it, but only sit in the nature and do projections and drone videos and like totally get your authorship out of it? Would you enjoy the idea of this? Um, I don't know. Uh, could poss possibly, yeah. Uh, I've, I've completely changed my practice and now I'm refusing a lot of projects that are non-ethical. Um, like I would never work for a car company. Um, uh, so I, I have some sort of ethics. I've stopped flying, so I have to rearrange all my work and all the way I interact with potential projects and clients. And uh, I'm dedicating one third of my time to activism. Uh, with my savings, I can actually use the equipment I have and dedicate this to activism. Uh, but to be honest, I use my name and, uh, and, and my platform, my social networks now to share my thoughts about uh, climate change. And uh, I think anonymously would, I would lose a little bit of, uh, of that sort of impact and window. But uh, yeah, considering how everything has shifted in the world, like I'm, uh, I believe that capitalism is a big scam as well. Like it makes no fucking sense. Uh, and I'm I'm keen to have turned into an anti-capitalist like overnight because it makes no fucking sense. Uh, there's no infinite resources. We know science and mathematics and, and physics and just capitalism is gonna bring us to a dead end. So if it means uh, leaving authorship behind and like creating new kind of economy and new communities. And I'm, I'm like very much keen to, to try it because it might be our, um, one of the few chances we have to, 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 to save the, the planet and, and on the, yeah. Yeah, you said before like that you are really angry on your own and you're like on yourself and you're not flying anymore. And I know a lot of people that change like their consuming behavior and stuff. But this is, we had it before already, like it's like individualism and it's kind of a, Kind of also like for me, I'm I'm really having a problem of reflecting my privilege as an artist. Although a lot of people maybe may not see me as a really privileged artist because I technically don't use authorship that much, but it's a question of impact also. And then maybe to come to Matthew, like with all the visuals you create, because for sure the politics in your practice is really clear, and you know it's always interesting, like for. To listen to a political practice is also already inspiring, but in the end, how do we make sure that it's not social media, which is concepted to make us feel having an impact, make, pretending us having a lot of impact, and in the end, we're just reaching our friends. So like a question would be, do you maybe, or also like to your other people, like, do you have a good question, uh, story of when you have been hurt? Do you have a story of like, something you did that then left you and started a, an own life, like of your visuals or of anything? Do you have like a good being hurt story? Ah, now we have a, we're having a sound problem again. I can't hear you right now. But I can see already interesting answers coming in your face. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, no, so, okay, cool. Now you're over the mute button, mm -hmm. so I'm, I'm sort of always dependent on someone to press on mute. Um, but I think going back to your first question, it's I, I, I find it's uh, slightly a false choice this decision between working as an independent artist or or working anon anonymously. I find actually I can sort of sh shift between the two. A lot of the activism I do is anonymous. I attend Extinction Rebellion events. I help erect tents, I walk around, I film stuff, you know. Uh, it's, it's, it's part of being a collective. And I find that actually working in collaboration is, is by far the most uh, fulfilling and, 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 and um, the best use of my time in, in a way is, is sort of forging these collaborations. So for instance, 
Uh, to going back to your second question, one of the best outcomes that has happened recently is that I've been contacted by some Chilean directors and they want to collaborate on the story. They want to make a, a zero carbon a short film. So in a way, the, the successes for me is about forging these, these, these collaborations and these networks. Mm -hmm. So now I see we have like three minutes left that maybe go to <laughs> Teresa now. Um, do, do, you feel, do you have something to say on what was said before? Or do you want me to ask a question to you? Ask me a question. Okay. Because I was, I was thinking it's maybe a bit esoteric for me. I was really thinking how you felt with this like cycle of eating your own meat. Because for sure all the politics is in there, but then it's really personal. And for me, it's, a, it's I was really thinking about like, do you feel it changed something to you that you ate yourself? Do you feel like you gay or do you feel like you hurt yourself for your political art practice? And do you think it's part of the artwork that you did this? Yeah, well, in this project, the pain was definitely a big part in actually conceiving the performance and the dramaturgy of the performance and in developing the pace because it was actually quite painful for a while the biopsy after i couldn't walk uh, for some time um but um also of course eating yourself is a big emotional experience like a very unique experience uh, that not many people get in such a way. Of course, I guess there is um, people maybe eating their own placenta or couple eating the placenta after the baby is born or something like that, which maybe gets closest to to um, eating your own meat in a way. Um, but um, it is definitely uh, probably the most personal project I have ever done. And, uh, and um, changed me, I can mm -hmm. say that. So on this, I can really uh, now catch up and maybe make really 40 seconds closing. So what I think is none of you has a job, which I like. You are all doing things and you have a practice. And this is showing like it's, it's this personal. It's not about having a job in some sphere. It's like researching and using your skill and your personal perspective, looking on world. And it's really like I know also Node community and maybe people that listening listening here. There might be people working for car companies even listening. Maybe think about if you want to do it. But then this is also not all. It's not done by, oh, I won't work for this company. It's really a thing of getting into a poli political and reflecting practice with what you are able to do. And for me, and that's like then my propaganda also, everybody really needs to stop doing labor to come into this condition of thinking and reflecting the world. Because actually what you are all doing is thinking about stuff with your perspective and your skill set and then start doing things. And then sometimes there are artworks that come out of it, but also we heard people do a lot of stuff that they don't share. And I think we, I knew before we would need like one hour more, or two hours more. And this is like everybody come in the speaker's corner, maybe we can go on there, you can find everything on the website and check in. And now I'm really sad that I have to close the round. It was really interesting listening to you. I would really like our Radical 24-7 Artist TV channel. And I don't know, what I wrote down is uh, stay tuned, stay honest, stay radical, and never doubt alone. I think that's important. And thanks a lot. Thank you. Cool. Thank you. Thanks.
Hi, and welcome back to our last panel for today. Uh, I hope you had great workshops. I hope you enjoyed the panels before, and uh, I'm sure you will enjoy this one as well, which is a Petra Spotlight. Uh, I heard there are many hidden talents within the V4 community, and these talents should, shall be revealed now by uh, Randall Vasquez from Marshmallow Laser Feed. And uh, he will introduce to you uh, Alexandra Gav Gavrilo Gavrilova, Volna Art Collective, Jan Hendrik Hansen and Armin Sels, and the V3 Studio. But I'm sure Randall will know much more about these uh, rising stars of the V4 community. So have uh, fun with that panel. Good evening, and thank you for joining us. We're transmitting live here at the Broadcast Emergency Studio in Frankfurt during No 2020, and this is Patcher's Spotlight. My name is Randall Vasquez, and tonight we have a lineup of incredibly talented members of our V4 community joining us from all around the world to talk about their work and their inspiration and how VVVV helps them do what they do. Before we begin, I would like to invite everyone watching us through the internet at home or wherever you might be to join us for the conversation as well. You can send us your comments or your questions via the talk app. You, what I understand is you have to go into the schedule, find the Patcher Spotlight, and in there you should be able to find a means to send us your questions. So please do, se please do send us your questions, join the conversation, and I will do my best to address as many of them as I can. And with all that said, I would say grab a drink. I already have a beer over here for myself. Get comfortable while our amazing AR team takes us all the way back to Vladivostok, Russia, where Alexandra Gavrilova is ready to talk to us about her work and how VVVV helps her inside and outside the classroom. Alexandra, great to see you. Thank you for being here tonight. Hi. Hi. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, it's really a pleasure. I know you're, it's very early or late, depending on how you want to look at it, back home for you. For those who don't know, Vladivostok is pretty much on the eastern end of Russia. Is that correct? Yes, I guess. Um, it's later here than in Korea. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So thank you again for making this incredible effort of being here with us tonight. Um, nothing. My, um, I'm here for teaching and my students are understanding and uh, tomorrow we agreed to, to come at 11, not at 10. <laughs> <laughs> and now it's five. Okay, well, thank um, you again. Maybe um, grab yourself a bit of water or tea or whatever is uh, customary back home for mm, you. Um, it's fine. <laughs> cool. I had a cocoa just now, so nah, yeah, I'm great. ready. <laughs> so, Alexandra, tell us a bit about yourself and the work you're doing. Let's get to know you. Um, uh, I can call myself maybe media artist, mm -hmm. and I'm working with generative graphics and sound, um, and doing all the stuff with V4, except something with Arduino and lights and some hardware. But I am quite a long time in V4 community, First, I heard of it, uh, I think, in 2009. Okay. And then I just downloaded it and tried to help, um, to open all the help budgets. <laughs> I think most <laughs> of us began this And then I stopped for, for a while. And after a half, half of a year of experimenting like that, and feeling that I'm moving nowhere, um, I just decided to make a first installation, and then I forced myself to learn. So it was the first mapping <laughs> projection. Very nice. And then, yeah, fun started. 
And so you started as a visual artist, I would say, with playing with visuals and projections and these kind of things. Uh, yes, and um, maybe I need to say that I have a background in classical art education. Mm. Uh, I was um, studying in Stroganov Arts University in, in, in the field of ceramic works. And we had all the five years of uh, drawing and painting and sculpture and history of arts, etc. <laughs> but on the second grade, I felt that I'm missing something. Uh, and really what I missed was a bit of math, mm. because my parents are technical guys. I and see. so I missed that in my art university. So I just came and learned uh, Flash, uh, and that time it was Macromedia Flash, just to make some abstract things moving and be influenced by mouse <laughs> on the computer screen. Nice. So you, do you have a coding background at all, or just uh, coming from the Only art world? Only with uh, this action script language. Uh, and then I had to learn a bit of HTML and CSS just to make things available in the web. Right. Uh, and yes, and in school we have maybe two classes of basic. <laughs> <laughs> and when I was very small, I was just learning DOS and Windows and the old school games by myself. So just I mm, like have a kind of feeling of just uh, playing with some buttons and don't fear that something can break away. Mm -hmm. And this empiric method uh, leading me with VVV or any software or hardware mm, I'm working with. Great. And so what I understand is that even though you started playing with V4 uh, as a media artist, you somehow find your way into education eventually. Is this correct? Uh, yes. Uh, I think around uh, 1012 or 13. Um, yes. Um, first, I came to Node to Frankfurt in uh, 2010. And my goal was to learn shaders, shader coding, and mm. there was amazing workshops by Yorick and Tabian. Uh, so I learned how to make the displacement mesh index nine. Nice. And uh, then, uh, yeah, maybe I can uh, show something. Oh, yes, please show us. Uh, yes, like one of the old installations. So I, I can, where is this button? <laughs> I think there's a big green button at the bottom yes. that says yes. share screen. I can do it. Great. Okay, so I have some images and videos. Um, and yes, while I will, that's not that. Um, yeah, that's a picture. So uh, I learned how to make a simple uh, DX9 shaders. And then Kinect appeared and everything and cameras for tracking. So it was really very funny time. Uh, so we can do the interactive installations uh, that reacted to mobile phones via um, some web pages and be like multi-user things. Uh, and then I came again to note to for DX11 shaders mm. again, because right. uh, I felt the power in the GPU things. Uh, and there were workshops by Nathan and Vux and everyone. All the big uh, names. On, yeah. on, on the topic, yes. And mm. that was very mm, great. Uh, so we, we did some projection mapping, some interactive things. And uh, yes, I can uh, show some video of uh, a little bit more recent works. Uh, and we started to work with um, mm, photogrammetric stuff like uh, uh, capturing architecture and like landscapes and then uh, putting some generative things into that. Uh, and this is what like, year we're like talking about here. now. What we're looking at is around yeah, what? Yeah, this picture is a uh, work um, around two years ago. Okay. And it's, it is mm, mm, like we are thinking about how automatic um, 
changing of our physical reality mm -hmm. uh, is happening right now when uh, all the decisions, uh, all, mm, not, not all yet, but more and more uh, are mm, taken by algorithms. And so, yeah, maybe here is a little video. Like we see in landscapes and they are empty. Algorithms decide that empty, empty fields can be uh, like built up with some generative algorithmical architecture, and uh, this process is visualized by triangulation of flat fields and then appearing some structures. And yeah, I had some hard time with coding this um, to force myself to learn compute shaders, mm, not really fast because uh, all the shaders which are making geometry and working with geometry is fine but the shaders are really was very hard for me mm, okay but when i have a goal yeah i can learn <laughs> that's good determined uh, and asking everyone and uh, um, i can mention the community uh, and uh, yeah i know you mm, well, going to ask about the Russian community, and sorry that I'm jumping from topic to topic, but no problem. Uh, no. Our community is quite helpful, and uh, we have uh, from last year we have a Telegram group, and uh, people are really mm, answering and making questions there. Uh, but before, uh, one mm, feature that uh, was driving me to VVV and was forcing me to stay was the community on the forums on the site and on the node festivals uh, when I met uh, the people um, so yeah I just uh, didn't think about moving somewhere else mm -hmm. uh, and uh, since there is um, an audio available inside of V4 uh, before we had to connect with reactor on with pure data or with something, but um, it's, for now it's quite for some time. We have this we audio pack that I really love. Uh, and now I'm happy that it's uh, available in Gamma also. Yeah, so that uh, brings me to another question I wanted to ask you. Most of the things we're seeing here, I imagine, were done in beta, yes? Yes, all the things I've done for um, for now is done in beta because okay. um, it's everything familiar there. <laughs> but you have so played my, with Gamma, have you? Um, yes, I had. Uh, and now I'm trying to teach my students with Gamma. Okay, and how is that going? And I, 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 I can, uh, yeah, it's some just some screenshots, data visualization. I could just jump over them uh, and straight to gamma and there's also some data visualization and live performances but yeah it's nothing special um, it looks pretty amazing uh, I, I, I will return for um, here when mm, I will tell about the kids workshop but the last mm, the last uh, small video here is a small part that uh, we made with my students here maybe three or four days ago. Oh. Uh, uh, and and um, my students really love Gamma. And when uh, we do some experiments in Gamma, and then we return to beta because some of the projects just need some 3D stuff. And yeah, I learned about Stride only today tonight <laughs> on the workshop and yes I love it already but yeah we can uh, we are not familiar with that and we can just do the project uh, for example with VR with 3d meshes with geometry or with something that we are using for in beta for many years and we know how it works uh, so um, I just recorded it on my phone <laughs> from the screen of my PC and here is a very simple thing, but uh, what's um, important for me, uh, we have audio and graphics and uh, generators that are working together. Uh, and the students uh, 
just feeling all this um, loops stuff and some of them uh, who are kind of uh, nearer to programming and had some experience with programming they love not only the interface but also these features that um, they can do with algorithms uh, That's but great. yes we f uh, finally with some of them, uh, some of them stay with Gamma for realizing that their projects, if they are more logical or 2D. Um, but some of them uh, learning Gamma, but doing their projects with Beta. Well, now that we have the 3D engine, they can all switch to Gamma, surely. Mm, yeah, I'm sure, but not so fast. <laughs> we have to learn a bit. And so for switch. the people who are watching at home that don't know maybe about this, you're currently teaching a course at university, which is associated with generative graphics and creative coding, as far as I understand? Uh, yeah, the, they have two year master course and it's called digital art. Mm -hmm. And uh, during the first year, uh, I'm teaching the students of the second grade. And during the last year, they had uh, some small intensive courses like something uh, of VVV with Vadim Epstein, something with touch designer with our um, Russian artist, something with pure data and sound recording, something uh, with VR or um, I just don't remember. Mm -hmm. <laughs> A lot of small courses. And now uh, they have to go to their final projects. So I'm not just uh, learning the, them some uh, tutorials, but I'm trying to do their projects with them. Uh, small projects, pre preview projects, but their ideas, not just uh, examples. Oh, very nice. And I understand it's the fir like a few days ago you started to teach Gamma in this course for the first time, right? Yes, it was the first time. And it's really easier ah, <laughs> to, to, to introduce hear. Gamma for people who are not familiar with before than introduce Beta because it's more intuitive in, in the interface. Oh, I'm sure the devs are happy to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. And why uh, don't you show us a little bit about this project, because you told me about a project you did at a summer music camp with some kids, mm -hmm. and they ended up using V4 as well, in a way. So I'll be uh, very happy to hear about yes. this. Yes, uh, it was, but um, I was not, sorry. I was not teaching uh, kids uh, of V4, definitely, but because they are small, they, most of them not, don't know English and don't know math on the level. Uh, but uh, the workshop was like that um, they recorded some small abstract uh, fragments of videos, uh, and then I put all the things into the batch that was did only by myself, but uh, I did uh, what I did. I gave them to play with MIDI controllers, uh, which were bounded to parameters for um, some video effects uh, on top of these video files. And they intuitively felt uh, what their controllers do, and they can, could play with them. And they feel the spirit of generative graphics and uh, sound. So it has very positive effect on, they were mm, impressed and they were very mm, like uh, happy to mm. do it. That's great. And what would you say, like how did it help you, this technology V4 in this case, and you know, electronics and all these things, do you think it was helping you uh, approach the teaching process better, or how do you feel about that? Uh, oh, mm, yes. Um, yeah, I'm just happy that I have some such tools. <laughs> what can I say? And uh, the kids are receiving it very easy. I, I think maybe more easy than we could uh, do at their age. So it's quite organic um, and natural. But I'm very impressed because, you know, uh, something like this is very abstract. These kids were how old again? Uh, like from seven to, to 10. 
Yeah, so it's a, it, the very abstract concepts and ideas and getting, you know, music and images to go together for kids that age, it's quite impressive that you manage to uh, get them to engage know, with it. It's, it's natural for them. And uh, first, uh, I, I, I um, didn't remember to say, uh, there is a very nice, um, I had a slide, but yeah, I just, I just will tell, talk about that. Yeah, there is a festival. Uh, it's run running from curators uh, from Spain, and it's uh, completely about abstract audiovisual art. And when we started the course for kids, uh, we showed them some of these movies, uh, and uh, we also participated in, in this festival. And so we made a screening in Moscow, invite the three curators and. Uh, this our work in the selection. So when the kids uh, w were watching that, uh, they were received. Uh, they received it very natural. So they were laughing and talking with each other. How funny is that box and how nice is that line? So mm, we had not to to explain anything. Wow, that's incredible and very great to hear. <laughs> so you were telling me about the scene in Russia. You guys have your own group. That was what you were telling me to support each other. Uh, Is there a lot yes. of V4 users out there in Russia? I'm not very familiar of, with it. Oh, yeah, really? I, I think Russian people love V4. And uh, in St. Petersburg and in Moscow and, and other cities in Yekaterinburg and in Siberia also and here in Vladivostok. Uh, and yes, we support each other and uh, people who are in Moscow and in uh, St. Petersburg, uh, we share sometimes hardware and spaces and uh, our skills and patches. So, yeah, it's very supportive. That's great to hear. That's very good. Um, we're getting close to the end of our time here, Alexandra, but let me see. Ah, or of course. Have you attended any workshops here at Node? How is it going for you? Yeah, every every workshop that uh, <laughs> are were not in parallel. So today it was about stride, and before uh, about uh, the, the field trip, and yesterday mm -hmm. also about field trip and uh, visual effects. So yeah, every every day I choose about from the pair. That's uh, great and watching it and uh, with my students. Now they are sleeping, but in the evening, in the workshop time, they are watching with me, some of them. That's very good. Any favorites so far? Uh, you mean from the workshops? Yes. Uh, yes, Stride is impressive. Uh, and today, uh, Kyle McLean's explanation about field trip is also impressive because I just didn't believe that everyone except him can use it. And <laughs> now I, I believe and I think I will use it also. That's great. Well, Alexandra, it's really been a pleasure. Thank you again for joining us and for showing us your amazing work and this inspiring educational work you're doing with kids and adults as well. Thank you. It, it was a pleasure to answer the question and to share, to share something. Well, really. I hope we get to see more of you again and again. Thank you again and get some sleep, I guess. <laughs> Thank you. Goodbye. Bye. Bye, everyone. Well, I missed the question there, but I would like to tell our audience that if we don't get to all of the questions, we will have after the show, what is called the Patrick Corner, where we hope our guests will join us again. And we will be trying to answer more of your questions. You can just join in via Zoom and ask your questions yourself and interact with the people you'll see here tonight. So look forward to that and save some time for it. And of course, keep the questions coming. I'll try to do a better job of getting them in time on the next segment, which brings us to our next guest tonight, also in Russia, a bit closer to where we are now. We're going all the way to St. Petersburg now to meet the people of Volna Studio, 
The co-founders Nikita Golishev and Snezhana Vinogradova are joining us tonight to show us their work and just talk a little bit about what it is they're doing with lights and physical computing over there. Good evening. Good to see you. Hi. Thank you so much for joining us. How's everything back in St. Petersburg? Hmm? How are things back in St. Petersburg? Every, everything good, yes? Yes. Thank you so much. So, Volna Studio, tell us a little bit about that. I know your focus is mainly light, and I've been looking at your work, and it's incredible. I'm sure we will get to see a little bit about it tonight. But why don't you share with us a little bit about what the studio is doing and how it came about and who you both are and what your roles are in the studio. Um, yeah, yeah. Hi, hi to everybody. Yes, uh, Volna is an art collective uh, and it was formed in St. Petersburg 2016. Um, actually, uh, is a self-organized group of people uh, as, a, uh, as uh, usually uh, every art collective is, um, and uh, we. Uh, I will. I will share our screen. I think. Right. Um, uh, so, uh, Volna consists of uh, six creative individuals uh, who are all coming from different backgrounds uh, um, in the fields of architecture, engineering, engineering. Uh, um, Construction, design, art management, uh, really uh, very different people. And uh, we work um, mainly with, with light, as you mentioned, and technology, and also uh, with materials. So you can uh, uh, say uh, we, are, uh, uh, we are also constructors, not only... Um, uh, like we use technology and we use software for developing some uh, spatial things uh, like uh, like installations uh, or uh, uh, yes or stage designs uh, light setups uh, and yeah and I understand you you build everything yourselves like all the electronics and the physical you know, cabling, uh, all these things, you also take care of yourself, is that correct? Yes, yes. Can uh, you tell us a bit more about that process? How does that go about? Uh, I can uh, just, uh, I think, play one video, like mm -hmm. background, just uh, about our last installation, which we have built uh, um, in... Uh, in the beginning of 2020, and it was uh, not uh, publicly uh, opened yet. <clears throat> but here you can see uh, we, we are dealing with 3D printing, with uh, um, mecha mechanics, uh, with lights. Uh, we also molded <laughs> uh, things um, and made uh, like this pond of uh, water lilies, for example, and also programmed um, and made the design, wow. light design of this installation. So it's it's uh, <laughs> sometimes a very physical work. Mm -hmm. uh, and everything we're seeing we... here is being driven somehow by V4. Is that true? Uh, no, specifically this work it wasn't driven uh, by V4. We just made some kind of content for this. Uh, it's kind of uh, a work that uh, should be operated by some other people on the venue. So we just used more, I, I would say, simple uh, solutions just to make their life easier. Not be more beautiful, but easier. So, yeah. <laughs> But uh, uh, in our case, we actually use uh, V4, I would say, uh, quite a lot. Uh, I think uh, Snezhana can uh, show uh, some works, and after that I'll just uh, show some patches and tell how we, how we use it. Sounds great, uh, yeah. 
Yeah, I would, um, uh, I would like to start with our installation, which was made 2018 for the St. Petersburg Festival Present Perfect. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> yes, can you? Unpause the share screen or... I think uh, I see the website still. Ah, yeah, ah, we're oh. seeing the website ah, at the moment. Oh, 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 oh. I'm <laughs> sorry. No worries. Just, just, <laughs> just a moment. No, no, no. Ah. Wait. Ah. Yeah. Maybe, yes. And now I will share it one more time. Um, uh, this installation... Uh, I'm afraid we're still not seeing uh, your screen. Yes, yes. Uh, share. Ah, there we are. Uh, here. Can you see the video? Yes. Uh, this installation uh, was made... Uh, uh, it con consists of uh, 72 RGB laser models uh, that are mounted in a, in a cylindrical steel frame uh, and uh, they uh, are um, uh, all these lasers uh, make a continuous uh, high-speed animation from an array of colored laser beams and uh, these should create a effect of a spinning matter and mm -hmm. the idea of the installation is um, um, so-called tabular cylinder time machine concept um, and you can uh, feel yourself uh, um, uh, uh, in the front of this installation uh, uh, like being uh, isolated from the passage of time that was the artistic idea and um, this installation was presented also uh, in Rome uh, 2018 during the RGB Lights Festival uh, and maybe it's, it will, would be interesting um, to, uh, to show the patch. Uh, oh, yes. Uh, Let us see some notes, please. Okay. I will yeah, stop it now and uh, stop sharing. And Nikita can share. Ah, uh -huh. okay. Okay. Just a sec. Yeah, so it's... Uh, I think uh, this uh, work and the page uh, describes how we work with lights, uh, usually just because uh, you know, we mainly focus on uh, kind of physical work, so we, and we place our works in some events or festivals, so we need it's always just to, to work. So we heavily rely on some models and so on and so on and make it <clears throat> as much as reusable as possible. So here we basically make some kind of a preview of how installation should uh, behave. Uh, I mean, this uh, screen with the lines. Yeah, and uh, after that we just uh, have a, I know, quite a standard setup for programming uh, uh, some kind of uh, color uh, programs, uh, motion programs in terms of uh, wow, that's uh, a big installations. Patch. Yeah, yeah, just use uh, sub patches just to hide this because <laughs> it's a bit hard to for my old laptop to deal with all these patches. But anyway, it's just a modular system of patches uh, that uh, uses the same. Uh, mostly the same principles uh, along all, all, all our works, and uh, we just, uh, you know, adapt this system to the uh, new work every time. But usually, usually, yeah, it's uh, a set of uh, uh, scripted or I don't know some kind of generated patterns that we use uh, uh, with. Uh, in a company with uh, our playlist, and after that we, I know, uh, send uh, simple, in, in that case, quite simple, they make signal and, uh, and so on. Uh, uh, sometimes when dealing with, I know, lasers, for example, you need to, I know, to deal with some specific problem, problems like overheating, so for this uh, reason uh, we 
uh, made kind of or over heat control match, ah, just very interesting. Uh, to switch off the lasers and uh, prevent them to be broken. Uh, uh, yeah, Lovely say. stuff. What, what contributions would you say you find yourself using the most? This is beta, of course. And, uh, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, and what contributions are you guys using for your work, or is it mostly you building your own tools? How mm -hmm. does that go? Uh, we, we use BET uh, just because it's, uh, I know, for me, incredibly stable. Uh, I even don't try to update it very often just because if you update it before the event, it, maybe some nodes will be broken. It's not very good. It's known to happen, yes. Uh, yeah, but, but usually, yeah, BET. As we mostly work uh, and, uh, with light, uh, kinetics. Uh, we don't rely heavily on uh, visual uh, uh, features of uh, 4E, uh, but we definitely experimented with them. But mm, no, usually we use it like a very solid uh, and stable DMX controller or some controller of electronics. Uh, custom built or just based on Arduino or something like that. Yeah, okay. but mm, well, I mean, in kinetics, uh, Snezhana could maybe uh, show our another installation, uh, which is also, I think, worth mentioning. Just a sec. Let's just, have a look. Uh, uh, yep. I just, yes. Uh, uh, help me. Uh, Yes, I can. I can also share uh, our latest last uh, installation, on, on which was uh, publicly uh, uh, access, access, uh, accessed. Uh, this oh, oh. on YouTube. Yes, sorry. <clears throat> ah. uh, this is the 3D ah, uh, visualization made. For the wait, wait a sec, wait a sec. <laughs> now we just have a lot of windows here. Yeah. <laughs> um. yeah. uh, yes. Uh, uh, this is the 3D visualization made for a uh, uh, virtual game exhibition. Virtual game, uh, we did as an exhibition this year with our. Uh, uh, mainly works. Uh, this installation called 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 uh, Duel, uh, and uh, I can show you the real video now. Mm. Um, oh, sorry. Uh, uh, this installation uh, is inspired by the idea, by the idea uh, that conflict can uh, act as a driving force. And um, uh, you see 16 flat disks. Uh, they have two opposite sides, one black and white, one light. And they are uh, 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 existing in a continuous state of dueling with each other. Uh, so we used for this installation um, uh, a patch which is uh, uh, which um, uh, controls uh, the movement and the lights. Uh, also, this installation was without sound. Uh, so uh, yes, it was like a choreographed dance uh, with uh, shadows and lights in a space. Uh, was also presented in St. Petersburg, only one time. Sorry to interrupt uh, you. One second. Yeah? I'm afraid we're not seeing anything. I think, were you sharing a video with us during that time? Yeah, yeah, oh. I'm sharing a video. Oh, oh. Mm. Share, share again. Stop share. Share a screen. Uh, Just stop. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh -huh. There yeah. it is. Great. Okay. 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 <laughs> um, uh, yes. Uh, this is the real life presentation. Oh of, wow, that's beautiful. Uh, of this movement and um, and lights uh, and the shadows. Uh, 
uh, in a space. This is a former uh, factory in St. Petersburg, which turned to be a creative cluster and which hosts uh, different uh, um, exhibitions and uh, cultural and not cultural events. Uh, uh, and also have big spaces for installation like this. Of, um, and this installation, uh, 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 all these elements, the slide elements, was uh, mounted on the 30 meter um, firm, uh, which was uh, in a form of a parabola, as you can see. And you can see a ballet sense of uh, the spinning uh, um, elements. It's really uh, beautiful. Thank you. So I, I stop sharing now. I think um, it's the time to explain the page a, a bit. Oh, take us to it, Nikita. Uh huh. Okay, just a sec. So, yeah, here, as I said, we have basically the same uh, system with a preview which uh, represents all these rotating disks. Uh, but uh, the cool thing about this page uh, was that we, I know, we spent less money on uh, stepper motors and we bought with motors without the feedback. So we had uh, uh, to know uh, in what position our light luminaries are. Mm. So we know, uh, we knew all these technical specs uh, uh, and the speed of the motor, or all, all this velocity and so on. So I just uh, emulated uh, the logic of movement of this uh, motor in the, some kind of messy, messy patch. But uh, in, in order to simulate it and make it look like it behaves in real world, so uh, when we presented uh, this work, uh, we actually made it quite, I know, to work in sync, uh, despite the fact that we didn't have a physical uh, sy synchronization. So we just didn't have enough time <laughs> to, to make it actually. Yeah, and uh, yeah, so it's it looks amazing. I think uh, with a lot of IP uh, wow. address and uh, some kind of a DMX output setup. Incredibly clean patches, I have to say, Nikita, you should be proud of yourself. Uh, yeah, I, I, I do my best just because I mostly work with the patches and uh, I just need to, I know, know to where things are. So actually I opened uh, this patch first time in a year. So I, I still remember where the things are and what all these things are <laughs> talking me about. So, yeah. Very yeah. impressive. Well, we're getting close to the end of our time here, but we have one question for the, that came through from the community. Uh, mm -hmm. As you may know, we were just speaking with Alexandra, who is also in Russia, and she was telling us about this group. I was wondering if you guys are also part of this Russian uh, V4 community. Uh, well, uh, I can't say we communicate a lot with the community in terms of meetings and so on. I know just because we are maybe quite uh, busy uh, uh, in working. But uh, yeah, we definitely uh, watch uh, what other guys like Stain do and uh, keep an eye on all these Telegram chats and channels. And would you say there's anything the rest of the V4 community could do to, to help you better or to integrate you better in any way? Uh, it's, uh, to bring us to, to the nodes alive, I know, not in a virtual. <laughs> Fly you all in every node, that's, that's what we need to do. <laughs> yeah, I think so. I will talk to the right people and we'll see what we can do for the next node. Okay, okay. <laughs> well, I think we, we can wrap it up over here. Thank you so much again, very inspiring work. And thank you for joining us and sharing your beautiful thank patches. You. Thank and you your beautiful for the invitation. Work. Okay, well. Goodbye and hope to see you Bye. soon again. Okay, well that was truly inspiring. 
Volna Studio all the way from St. Petersburg. And I'll take this moment to remind everyone watching us that they can send their questions and we will try to get them to our guests for you. Now we're moving in the globe all the way to Zurich in Switzerland to meet Jan Herik Hansen and Armin Sels, who we are looking now at the screens, who are also doing mind blowing work with, well, I don't want to spoil it. Jan, I remember, well, first of all, thank you both for joining us. It's a pleasure to have you here. Well, so good. I remember meeting Jan a few years ago in Berlin in the V4 office. I was working on some harmony, music harmony visualization patch, and you immediately were drawn to it. And it became quite apparent that you were very into music. And I soon after discovered that you were also very much into architecture and blending those two things together, which is amazing. Tell us a bit about that, Jan, please. Um, yeah, I, I remember that uh, evening very well, sitting next to you and looking at your patch. And uh, our background is, is uh, you know, basically architecture, but also, also music. And I would have almost studied music, and then in the last moment I decided to do architecture instead, which also was very fascinating to me. And while studying, I realized that there's a big relationship between music and architecture, and I started to get interested to whether these two could be actually communicating with one another on the computer, these mm. two worlds. And uh, yeah, we were happy to, to be able to show something today. You know, we have some work in progress, some long year work in progress, and Armin and me will try to give you a, a little uh, demo of this tonight. Oh yes, so you have this incredible tool called Space Music, if I have that correct, which mm -hmm. uh, correct. also Tebian from our deaf community has been involved with, and Armin, I understand, is also a big patcher behind it. And of course, Jan, the creative driving mind on top of it all, I would say. Do we get to see this beautiful tool of yours tonight? Absolutely, yeah. We have uh, prepared some real music input. Ableton Live will be playing wow. some MIDI file. And Armin will give you um, an introduction with three scenes. Should we, should we get there right now, I think? I think yeah. maybe that's a good idea. What do you think, Randall? Well, before we dive right into it, Armin, tell me a little bit about yourself. Let, let us right, get to know you. Uh, hi, so uh, yeah, I'm uh, Armin, live in Switzerland, uh, from Germany originally. Uh, I'm an interaction designer, um, have been playing around with lots of installations uh, in the past and, and so on. And uh, I got to know uh, Jan Henrik uh, quite a few years ago, I think almost 10 years ago now. Uh, and. Uh, was really fascinated by the work he's doing uh, and then sort of slowly we started working together now I work for him full time for quite a few years and uh, yeah a lot of a uh, lot of v4 patching um, mm -hmm. I also do uh, other uh, visual programming tools we do a lot in grasshopper inside Rhino so more like the 3d uh, modeling kind of uh, patching so there's lots of that uh, some other coding and uh, yeah in and how did also you get into V4? A, how did that come about? Uh, I I think it was the the uh, uh, book that probably a lot of no, a lot of people know, Generative Gestaltung. Mm -hmm. So the the Bible sort of of uh, when I first got introduced into this whole generative uh, art and and what you can do with it, and I was really fascinated by it. Uh, and then I saw the processing code, and I was like, How the hell am I ever going to adapt this to do what I need to do? Uh, but then I actually found that there is a V4 versions of all of those or most of the uh, things that they show in there. And I think that's that's how I got into it. That's great. And then, uh, actually, I think still uh, what we're showing tonight is one of the first things that I started on immediately. And that is, yeah, many, many years ago. <laughs> Very good. Well, what do you say if we open up this beautiful machine of yours and have a look inside? Okay. All right, let's do it. I'll, right. give a, I'll, I'll give a very, very short sure. introduction of what you're going to see. Um, we've prepared like three scenes to uh, 
give a little spectrum of how you can use the tool. There is, a, a, you know, com starting from simple to complex, there is a, first a one-dimensional way of writing music into space. Then we'll have a, a surface two-dimensional way. And in the end, there is a loaded file from, you know, a CAD package called Rhino, Grasshopper, which is an important part of space music because you can import and export everything from and into the software. And I think now we're ready to get going. All right, let's uh, dive in. Let's get this going. All right, so I will share my screen. Let's do that. I hope you can all see something. And uh, here we have our... It's not up there just yet. It's getting kind of slow. Oh, my! it just... <laughs> <laughs> oh. I can just see that Zoom <laughs> quit unexpectedly. Oh no. But, but we still oh, see you. We have no. you here. Okay, you can see my video, yeah? I okay. see your face, yeah, I mean I can hear you. Okay. Oh, now I think we lost you. Well, can you well, still hear me? Uh, uh, he's back. Okay. Okay, I'm back. Let me try that one more time. Thank you. And hopefully it will work. Okay, so here we are. Yeah, I th think it's working. Aha. Uh -huh. So let me full screen this. Uh, <laughs> so you wow. can see there's uh, quite a lot of controls here. We actually have a big UI. So this is a a tool, it's like a 3D tool, um, and it combines, yeah, MIDI input and uh, 3D, as we shall see in a moment. So let me play some music from Ableton. Let me do that now. Uh -huh. So you can see there's some shapes appearing. Uh, so this uh, should be fairly s familiar to anyone working in a, a sound sequencer. You just see MIDI notes coming in and they're being recorded. One, one second, I'm only seeing the screen with all the controls. Ah, now there we are, yes. Okay, I think there's quite a delay. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, I will try to work around that. Um, Thank you. So now we have uh, this happening in 2D. We can actually say, okay, let's uh, make this a bit more three-dimensional. And uh, let's say uh, we want in the Z direction, we want our velocity to be mapped. So notes with a high velocity will be here. Notes with a low velocity will be on this side. Mm -hmm. um, and then let's say we want uh, the notes to actually grow in length. So they kind of represent the length of the note. So we can do that. I'm moving around with a 3D mouse, by the way. If you don't use one, I highly recommend it. Um, and uh, yeah, then you can start uh, with more fun things. So you can map something on the rotation. We basically have all the uh, axes and, and parameters of a 3D object. So now you can see things are starting wow. to rotate and, and move into place. Um, and we can do uh, a lot of, a lot more things, of course. Uh, you can map all these parameters, so you can uh, specify what goes on what parameter. You can, of course, change something like the color. So let's say we want every note to have its own color. So similar notes or same MIDI notes will have the same color. Um, and uh, yeah, you can do uh, a lot of things. So let me actually now switch to something a bit more two-dimensional. So let's get this going. Actually, let me clear it. So now we can see there is a, actually a grid that's being filled. Uh, I can actually show the grid here. So you uh -huh. see this is a grid being generated. Each node goes on, on one grid point. Um, and what's actually really cool is I can now switch to a second mode where we're not creating any notes anymore. So now we're in an animate mode. Uh, for this to happen, I want uh, basically notes that come in. I want to affect the notes that are already there. So I can do that. I can say notes that are coming in should affect the same note uh, to some degree. Um, and let's say, for example, we want these to grow in the Y direction. And because uh, this is an animation that we're doing, we need some ADSR curves. Uh, so getting a bit technical here. So let me put some attack on this so we can actually see something. 
And now you can see that we're actually animating the oh, notes. Wow. Um, and actually we can also make them sort of only appear when they actually play. So already getting quite visual now. Nice mm. little uh, uh, effects there. Um, and we can of course uh, also have some very different styles. So this is now a very different kind of shading, constant shading with some uh, sort of uh, textures on it. Um, so there's actually a whole nother page here. Wow. Where we have uh, all the settings. You can uh, mix different shadings together. Uh, so we have super physical shading, we have constant shading, wireframes and so on. Uh, you can change lighting, you can change stuff about the camera and so on. And, and all this yeah. is driven by v4 in the background yes this is all uh, v4 and vl yeah yeah uh, so you so have actually, a mixture yeah. of beta and vl running exactly it started out in, in beta and and uh, by now uh, quite a lot of it basically everything except for the 3d part is in in vl uh, thanks to uh, tone film by the way big shout out to him <laughs> um okay so let's uh, go on to another example and now we actually have uh, a 3D object that we've imported, like Jan said, from uh, Rhino. And also the grid where the nodes appear is imported from Rhino. So we actually have a little like exchange format there that we designed ourselves and to exchange these kinds of things. Now we can fill this sort of architectural space. Uh, once again, we can actually go into something a bit more crazy where it's actually animating the, the nodes. Oh, wow. Um, and uh, yeah, you have uh, endless possibilities. Uh, we can see now that we've been recording six MIDI channels at the same time. Uh, there is 16 that you can record at the same time, um, all in real time. And actually, uh, what we probably didn't see is that we've now been syncing all the different channels together. So they all have the same configuration, but you can actually switch here and have a separate uh, configuration for each MIDI channel so you can really go crazy you have uh, tons of options uh, of things to do uh, a lot of things that are still in progress a lot of things that already work but are <laughs> would take too long now to explain of course um, but uh, let me actually stop the music here um, something that probably most of our viewers don't know is that you don't just use this to, to get pretty visuals out of it, but you're actually exactly, building yes. physical things out of it. Exactly. Actually, actually, that is the the, the main purpose. The, the 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 nice visuals are just because we want it to look nice. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's just our own, uh, you know, for our own uh, uh, amusement and and because we like it. And visual visual things are, are a lot nicer when they're rendered nicely and so on. Um, but actually, this is yeah, this is. Uh, a, design tool so uh, we can actually take this uh, take these ideas and, and turn them into into real things and I think Jan will uh, show a few things uh, of things that have been done with either through the help of v4 directly or indirectly because this is yeah this is our research tool and our uh, toolkit to, to build uh, real things and to me it's very interesting because you guys are using this as part of your workflow, but you're also using Rhino and Grasshopper in combination with this exactly, to be yes. able to build out the blueprints and the technical documents that you would need to hand out to the people who were actually going to build this. Is this correct, Gan? Mm -hmm. This is this is correct. So let me actually stop sharing my screen if I can. Yeah, I will. Or you can just. I will give you guys a few examples of how we use this instrument, this tool. So the, the main purpose, as Armin said, is that we use this tool for our um, own work. We, we're doing architectural projects with it, and we're also doing you know, free, free projects, artistic projects, sculptural work with it. And I'll give you some um, impressions on that. Can you see the... Can you see the screen now? Yes, it just loaded up. OK. So just a short introduction into, you know, you had the interface, the tool, and the latest, the latest thing. Basically, usually we have a two-screen setup. And the latest step that we 
have now been working on is a control via a handy, uh, which we hope to finish soon. And so basically two main um, goals. One is sculptural work, other is architectural work. Um, where we, for example, inform space defining elements like screens or like facades. And now the latest um, step is to actually, how can we use this tool on a mobile device so that more people can interact at the same time with the tool. And that's not done yet, but we, we hope to get there soon. Those are some examples of possible um, results. You know, those are very organic, fluid. And this is all driven structured. by sound at some point. So the, the starting point is, is music. All this is driven by MIDI and sound and different interpretations um, of how we use this tool. Here, this is more architectural, more hard edged and another style. So basically the tool allows for any style, for any um, intention. We try to really come up with a tool that is very generic and, you know, foundational. And that was also what we spend most oh, wow. time with developing. So as is you could see in a render in the, or was that a physical object? Um, there's oh, there's there's cool. renders and physical objects. So this this is a real physical object. All of these I think following things that you will see now are physical objects here. For example, in this style that we have been using a lot, you can see for each note, one of those bars and the musical parameters um, have been translated into rotations, into scalings and so on. Um, this is one of the first architectural projects where we uh, introduced music to inform a wall, a wooden wall. Um, and this is another project that is uh, inspired by the first project. Here we could, were invited um, to redesign the entrance of the UNESCO building in Bahrain. And um, the uh, winning idea of the competition was to inform the facade with intangible heritage, which is the music of Bahrain. And so we we found it very interesting to play with light at day and at night. And actually for the night situation, I'm afraid we cannot show this with this then this presentation, but there is actually a V4 um, patch running still today. The project is from 2012 oh, wow. and interpreting the light in here every night. Maybe we have a chance later to find this. Maybe you can f find this, Armin. No, Another little lovely. impression here is a project that we could finish in January in Africa. It's a very modest uh, football stadium. And basically the exterior wall was informed with music and we designed a certain set of bricks, transparent or open bricks and closed bricks. And the way of the arrangement the orientation, the rotation, the transparency, all of these things were designed with the help of music. As you can see here, the transparency, um, for example, here changes along this facade. And within those kinds of projects, we're very happy to have music sort of as a partner in crime in designing objects like this, because it would be very hard to do this or to achieve this manually or maybe even impossible. That's and beautiful. Here you can see a, a more of a close up of the bricks that we could design. And like I said, the orientation, the rotation of these bricks, also the selection have been um, defined for each of those more than 50,000 bricks with the help of music. And this uh, reminds me of something we went through on our previous call when we were preparing mm -hmm. for this interview, where you were saying one of the hardest tasks, maybe, is to, because you can produce the mesh of this three-dimensional object, 
But if you want to build it, you need to think also about all the physical process that goes behind it and how all these pieces are getting built, shipped, put together. How does that, how does that work? Yeah. The thing is, once you deviate from the standard, everybody looks at you kind of mad and feels like, what are all the problems that you're producing? So when you want to realize something or build something that is not known to people, um, you basically also have to take care of the solution mm -hmm. for the problems that you create. So um, an important and integral part of this whole suite of tools um, is to also be able to prepare um, the whole, let's say, digital chain until the building documents, you know, plans for the, the people who construct elements or on site can also be produced in somewhat automated or, let's say, supported, computer uh, supported ways so that you can manage to actually control each and every brick of those 50,000 bricks, to give an example. Oh, here we have another example where we informed a facade in aluminum. Here you have a detail of the wave um, structure, and this is the perforated version of it. Mm. And so, if you, no, oh, wow. this is this is how this looks in in the staircase. So, if you come up with um, with specific ideas, it's it's a very integral hard to also be able to deliver the, the necessary information. And so this is also, uh, let's say, a large amount of time that we invest into this part, which is less visible, but also necessary if you want to carry things from the virtual to the real, to the physical, which is what we find very, very fascinating to have a bridge between both worlds, the, you know, the Absolutely. digital and the real. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Something that also uh, struck or held with me from our conversation the last time, I remember us getting very philosophical and excited uh, chatting about all these beautiful things. And something that stayed with me is a quote from you, Jan, that said, I love to create tools. And accompanying that, another thing you said, which is, it's very much about the journey. And in, yeah. I think what you were saying about it is like as much fun as, and beautiful as this all is, the real pleasure is going through it and building these things, the, the tools that allow you to carry on these ideas into the physical world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's really, it's, it's really interesting sometimes to look back and to see how long this, this development has been going on. It would have been impossible without Armin, without Tabian. Also for me, a big shout out. Mm -hmm. And a lot of patience is needed to make progress and to solve these, these problems. But um, we're very thankful for, let's say, the possibility to be able to play with these things because they open worlds or possibilities that wouldn't be possible without them. And that's really fascinating to us. And so we truly believe in, in tools being foundational for whatever you do. For example, the piano and music was foundational for the music then, that then was composed on the piano that would have been you know, possible before the invention of this wonderful instrument. And so that's a, that's a very important interest of ours to actually totally develop the tools that are needed to, to do what you want to do. And I guess in that sense, V4 is also somehow a part of this movement of tools that allow creation of more tools and, and expand on itself, which is Absolutely. a beautiful idea. Absolutely. V4 and VL is the tool that allowed us to build our tool on top of it. So we're very happy to have found it actually some eight years ago, like Armin mentioned, this project in Bahrain was the first um, situation where we could apply it. And it was a very small patch compared to the back end of, of space music. But uh, we're very happy to be able to use this amazing toolkit. And we're very, uh, let's say, interested in what's going to come with Stride and further developments that we're looking forward to. Well, we can't wait to see what you guys come up with when you, once you stick your hands into VL and Stride. I'm afraid we're out of time. 
but it's been incredibly inspiring to look at what you're doing, and I'm very, very grateful and happy that you made it to join us tonight. Thank you again for being here, and I hope... It was a big uh, pleasure. I hope you can yes, join us later you. in the Patcher Corner. I'm sure people will want to ask you tons of questions and look at this <laughs> more in depth. All right. We'll be there, and uh, maybe we'll, uh, we'll show some of the uh, messy patches in the back. <laughs> I'd love to see that. Thank you again so much. Thank, Thank you, Randall. Randall. And have Thank a beautiful evening. See you in the Patrick Corner then. See you later. See ya. Bye. Bye. And this... Oh, I missed another one of the questions. I'm doing a terrible job with the questions. But let us carry on. I, we can take that question to the Patrick Corner. And here I am asking you to send us more questions while I'm doing a terrible job at asking them. But if you have more questions, please do send it our way and I'll try to keep an eye out for that. And now we go all the way to Mexico City, very close to my heart, Latin America. Very proud to see F3 Studio, Jorge and Gabriela joining us tonight all the way from the federal district of Mexico City. Welcome F3 Studio, how are you guys doing? Hola. Hi everyone. We are, re we are, we are really happy to be here. Yeah, thanks for inviting us. Oh, it's We're a pleasure to, to have here. you. So, nice. F3 Studio, tell us, tell us what's going on. I know you're also interested in light, but I think you have a slightly different take on it. What is F3 Studio? What are you guys doing? What is it all about? Well, I'm going to share my screen so you can see a few pictures about our work and Gava is telling more about our practice. Okay. Well, F3 Studio are just for you and me. We are a multimedia art studio based in Mexico City. Uh, our mainly work is based uh, on light, sound, and space, and fusion these uh, elements to explore different concepts. And I think that's our uh, our thing. We are very focused on, on being monochromatic and minimalistic. We try to do that every in every project because uh, we kind of love the, I don't know, like the finding the good things and simplistic. And also that uh, we think that it, that is a thing that make things also complicated and um, fascinated. So uh, that's kind of the, our work. Very we make also, uh, we call our work multimedia because uh, we use uh, many things to do. We, we, we do performance, we do installations, we do also, we make um, sometimes drawings with machines, sometimes video art, sometimes mapping. So uh, we're not focused just on one media. So we try to use light in the, all the aspects that we can, uh, either as a graphic or as a physical element. We we'll love to see what uh, we can do with, with this element. That's beautiful. And how does it work? How do you guys split the work? Who takes care of what? Are you both doing everything? How does that work? Well, we're not hearing you, Jorge. Well, um, we both are, uh, first of all, we are designers and we both are, we both both learn to pro uh, coding and programming. If we both know how to control light and make uh, graphics, like to try, like generative graphics. But uh, lately, Jorge focuses on audio, okay. um, audio explorations. So lately, our, our work as F3 Studio has uh, been like a, a mix of. We both uh, develop a concept, and then we work. Uh, I focus more more when it's uh, light controlling, and sometimes the image. Her uh, 
also participated on image and light, but he focused more on uh, making audio. Very interesting. Okay, that's great. And how did you get your hands on V4 all the way out in Mexico? Because I'm a Costa Rican and I know where we live, it's not very known, VVVV. So I'm very surprised that you guys ran into it as well. How did that happen? Yes, actually, it's a little bit complicated a scene in Mexico because uh, actually we were talking about, uh, we know very few people that are into VVVV. We, uh, right after school, we enlisted, we took a workshop of BBVV for mapping, for video mapping. Mm -hmm. And after that, uh, kind of, it becomes in our mainly tool to, to, to develop every project. Uh, we had, uh, we had a different studio before, uh, right after school. And with that studio, we develop a lot of projects. Um, and Jorge and I, uh, almost 90% of our work, uh, we developed with VVVV. Mm -hmm. So now with F3, it's the same thing. Uh, so that's how we get to VVVV uh, through a workshop for video mapping. Um, and after that was like auto self self learning. Uh, we just jump into the uh, you know the the website and and tutorials and and that's it. We 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 just love it. And <laughs> yeah. And most you're working mostly with beta, is what I understand. Have you tried gamma yet? Have you been doing any workshops? How is how is yeah, that going? Yeah, actually, actually, we tried the first workshop with Jorek, the first like introduction uh, BBV for designers, and and yeah, it's it's another world. I mean, it remind me a little bit like a, a way of thinking when we start with processing. It's mm -hmm. kind of. Uh, object-oriented uh, environment. Absolutely, So yes. it reminds me a little bit like, like that. But yeah, we mostly work with uh, Gamma because we use, we use the, well, with Beta, mm. because we use a lot of 3D stuff. And also, also we like to, to mention all the contribution around the community and all, all these incredible people like, like working on that. What so, contributions are you guys using out of curiosity? We, we, we mainly use like instant noodles and field trip by Kyle. Uh, big shout and out to Kyle. We also, we also use like a super physical uh, and, and we use like, of course, the X particles and, and another, another contribution, but that, that's the mainly, the mainly things. So we, we now kind of show, show to, to you guys like the last work that we that we made so we can share like a patch and yeah let's look at it you're talking about uh, human talk about drama it. right yeah exactly and this was shown at node i believe if not last night the light the night before that is that correct yeah exactly the third and human drama is a project uh, which explores well maybe you tell me more about it but what i read uh, on your website was it explores the current condition of being human in the times we live in, in these crazy times we're in. Yes? Yes. We lost your audio there, Gabriela. Yeah. Ah, there I'm you back. are. Yeah, actually human drama is, uh, yeah, about uh, a lot how we feel since almost two years ago when all this uh, current situation about it's become a little bit complex we call it like is it, it is a difficult time to be a human because we don't know exactly what it is to be a human so i think that's a question that we all in, in the world we um, we have asked it to ourselves and um, this project project was the uh, our way to to go through this through this question so uh, these are some images of the work uh, it's all based on on 3d scans of ourselves our body and faces because we wanted to to 
yeah, based this uh, statement or this question on something that we felt real, and that is, uh, of course, ourselves. So that's why uh, we make it to, to this technique. And how did you go about scanning yourselves and all this? Is this like a Kinect or is it photogrammetry? How, how did that happen? It is photogrammetry. Okay. We uh, start to uh, exploring this technique so, like like a year, two years ago. Um, we love it. We just love it because it's very, uh, I don't know, it's it's enjoyable to 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 be like taking the photos and and you don't know what to expect and um, the results are very variable. So it is photogrammetry and uh, this is the most difficult, I think, photogrammetry that we have made because it's easy to, to scan objects, but humans are very complex because you need to be still, like, I don't know, for five minutes because every little m movement that you make, it becomes like a, you know, uh, the program and the photo will record that little mm. mo movement. Of course. So, yeah, so it was a little bit complex, but uh, at the end we can uh, obtain what we think uh, was uh, very good results. So... I looked at it was... and I loved this crackling effect you had on the skin around the mouth and the nose. That was absolutely beautiful. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that was nice. Actually, was using the math uh, contribution. contribution for the materials. Cool. Uh, yeah, and it it become like a huge difference on how how uh, to perceive uh, the texture of the three D elements. And um, yeah, that's human drama. And here's a little bit of the patches. Oh, uh, the patch is. Uh, we work mainly by synchronizing the graphics and sound because uh, we think that, uh, I don't know, like super important to, to have always mm, not just one sense, you know, uh, we as humans perceive with all the bodies. Uh, so we think it's important to remark uh, every movement, every sound every image that we see with all the elements so in this we can be able to show the audio because it, we have we work in two different computers mm. but but when Jorge plays the audio the image uh, suffers modif modifications so it's sound so reactive I, as I well cannot, yeah I cannot show you how really works. So I'm, I'm like sending me to Gabby. So at the time, I, and I'm sending something. The 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 crackling stuff around the body is is moving. So you can you can notice you you can't hear it, but you can. I see. So all these displacements and this mesh aberrations, you're making sound based on the sound that you're sending in. Is that it? That's very nice. Yeah, exactly. I, I can show you like really quick, like a short patch that, that I've made. Sure. Let's have a look. So. And how do you go about the audio part? Jorge, how, how, how do you approach uh, sound in this kind of work? Uh, I, I, my approach to sound is more like kind of a... Uh, ah, sorry. Yeah, you can hear me? Yes. Okay, my approach is more about like a, kind of a playground. So I'm not, I'm not a musician. I'm, I'm like a kind of weird person exploring sound. So I'm just tweaking around knobs and, and connect something that I think that sounds like great and, and, and that's it. So so this is this is just a short patch that I made. Is is uh, I work more like a modular synthesis, but digitally because I really love computers. So 
So in this patch, if you can see here, there is a OSC send. Uh -huh. So all the time we are sending us OSC through 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 MIDI through OSC, OSC to to take all the all this data from around the the my patch and the sound, and that's the way that we can like start to split all all these textures and displacements uh, from from the body and everything. Very so I, I don't know I don't know if you can hear it. Mm, no. No. Doesn't seem to like, be the case. No. I think I think he's just one second. While Jorge is figuring this out, Gabriela, tell us a little bit because I know human drama was also in the. Uh, let me get this right. In the oh, there it is. Can you hear it? Yes. So, well, while this this little square is like getting bigger, I'm I'm pushing my my keys. Uh -huh. So every time every time I, I send this sound, like this envelope of the sound, the displacement of the object is is getting around. I see. Very very interesting. And you guys were showing this on the Athens Digital Arts Festival, is this, is this correct? Yes. How did it happen? Because all the way from Mexico to get to Athens with your work must have been a bit of a challenge, you know? Yeah, it, well, in the time we're living right now, everything is going like through streaming and, and, and everything is like, seems to be like more connected. So we, we, we just like share all this work with 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 them uh, in a, in a form of video art. So all the communication and everything was just for mails and and, and meetings and everything. So, yeah. Actually, and I understand this is meant to be a performance rather than a, a media piece, right? You're you're meant to be on stage doing something. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the first the origins of this project is to be a performance, but actually we were like uh, finishing uh, this project uh, the early this year, but uh, with all the chaos and the pandemic and that stuff, so it becomes more difficult to even suggest it. So uh, we start to present it as a video art. In, in the Athens Digital Arts Festival. And also we presented uh, in a festival here in Mexico, in Morelia, uh, same, same thing as a video art. And now uh, we just presented it in note, but as a virtual performance, uh, just like a, a little show of what we pretended to be. But we hope to, we hope that we can actually present it as a, a real-time performance sometime, somewhere. Hopefully next note we'll have you here showing us Hopefully. how it's done. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and kind of to wrap it up, we have about a minute to go. I'm yeah. very curious, how is the, the, the scene back in Mexico for new media and particularly VVVV? And how has your work been received by the Mexican people? Because I imagine this kind of stuff is not happening all over the place back there. Yeah, well, the scene is, is growing up. It's, 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 not, it's not too big. Actually, in, in the BBB community is like maybe six people around Mexico that mm. I, know, I know that you, that you know a, uh, a few of them. And yeah, it's, it's not that big, but in terms of, of new media, it's, it's growing. Uh, there, is, there is a few of artists like working with, with visuals and working uh, uh, also with lights and, and, and a stage design and, and something like that. But yeah, it's, it's, it's in constant evolution, you know? It's not that big. Well, you're making it grow, I'm sure. Yeah, exactly. Well, thank you so much for having, for, for having the time, taking the time to be with us tonight, Jorge and Gabriela. It's been a true pleasure. Thanks to you for inviting us. And I hope we keep seeing more and more of your beautiful work as the years go by. Thank you. It's we been hope that too. Yes. Uh,
I hope also that we see you on the Patrick Corner in a few minutes after the show right. so that people can get to okay. talk to you. And yeah, thanks again and have a beautiful night. Goodbye. Bye. Well, that has been very inspiring and interesting work by many people from all over the world. And for a closing statement, of course, I just want to thank again all the guests we had tonight and all of you for watching us at home. And I would like to announce that we have a next episode of okay. the Patcher Spotlight coming next on the October the 7th at 5 p.m. And this is the Japan edition where we'll have the Japanese V4 community showing us what they're doing. And we have our special guests, Takuma and Mino, which will be moderating and helping us with the translation. And with that said, I would like to invite everyone to join us at the part Patcher Corner Patcher Corner, sorry, where we will keep the conversation going with everyone you met tonight and hopefully some of you. And that's it. Good night and see you around. Thank you. Um, I have like weird sound on my ear, so that's why I was a little confused. Uh, now it's better. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks for the panelists and uh, the moderator. And now we will have um, 15 more minutes, our little red wrap up for the Monday uh, Note 2020. Um, Jeremy is here, Jeremy Jamie, but um, now he, he looks different. And uh, with us as well, are again uh, Luna Luna Nane, yeah. That's right. Hi. Hi, and uh, Hi, Jeremy. Katia, Katia van Roth. And um, so I know Jeremy, you didn't. Uh, unfortunately, you didn't. Uh, you weren't able to take place in the discussion that happened in the speakers' corner because uh, there was one, and for the last two hours with uh, as well Katia and Luna. And uh, it mainly was about how artistic practice can affect, uh, can be used to be more, like, to have an activist approach to help, like, activist movement. I, I can't even sum it up because there were so many things that have been said. And um, it was super interesting, and I hope this co discussion will continue for the next days. Uh, but maybe we continue with what we were just talking about and kind of maybe all the three of us are going to try to wrap it up in a way not wrap it up like yeah to yeah um so i can try to wrap it up it was such a super nice discussion to um actually feel that vibe of community um here at node festival um, and yeah, there are like many people that that are into making art and politics, basically, and like thinking about how to combine these fields and how to engage in their communities and how to think intersectional and um, yeah, that was super interesting. Um. I, I remember this concrete, there was, for example, the concrete idea of um, networking with all your drone pilot friends and making the drones, um, um, filming police brutality from above and then using all the fear community node festival community skills to research on patterns and dots and stuff and to research about police brutality and how there can come tactics out of it for protest and then the thought of first the question would be how we bring back that knowledge that is raised there to people that need it and who are the people that need it and then if it maybe takes too long and it would if it would be better to stand like 
next to the people that encounter police brutality and about the possibility of artistic practice in the streets and how it can go wrong if you tell everybody to costume because that, then everybody will look stupid. But if you tell everybody, come as the best version of yourself, then it will have a lot of power, maybe how people are dressed up and that artistic protest should never be neutral, but open in solidarity. And if any of you knows rich people, then rich people could, for example, announce that they will give money for repression costs for protests beforehand. So people that go into a protest know about, ah, there's a person that will cover, I don't know, at least 50 of us being arrested and having repression costs. It can help empower protest. And we were talking about two concrete evictions that are up in Germany this week. So there's like one eviction that will clearly happen on Friday this week. And even there's press about how brutal the police will be. And it feels really stupid to see this and how it's really clear. And still, we are all facing it on Friday. And we talked a lot about solidarity possibilities with the people that are here. And about, yeah, Liebig 34, to name it. So, yeah, we, we, um, uh, we find that we as a festival having a reach and having a, like a coming together of many artists that are increasingly into activism and into, I mean, art essentially is always about um, like working at the borders of um, social change and um, and like artwork was always so important for social change and it is even more today uh, when we're facing global crisis like climate crisis and we're having like um, issues um, that are intersectional and um, yeah, there's like so many different groups of people that suffer from developments and you have polarization and um, social movements like racial justice movements, Black Lives Matter. You have um, queer people and trans people and people of color and women and women of color being increasingly um, discriminated in that world. Um, from from developments like mainly political developments where where right wing regimes chain power with the help of technology and like um, so we um, as artists working with technology we have increasingly a um, responsibility to to make these problems visible and also make it visible to people that are not directly affected, like mainly speaking white privileged people that are, yeah. Yeah, it, Maybe was, too. yeah. it was technically also really, I just remember it was really part, there was one question before in Speaker's Corner, like what tips we can share for people that want to be more political. And one for sure is like educate yourself, like nobody of us is perfect, no, there's no perfect activist on this planet and there will never be and maybe there are also two planets because maybe that's not only one planet. Maybe everything is different but you can research what other people did and other people wrote and especially now and going back to Liebig 34, there's a trans queer community house in Berlin that will be evicted or that people are telling they want to evict. I think it won't be evicted because we will be enough there. But then, you know, it's a point of there are a lot of people listening here that have a lot of privileges. Maybe you don't even know about this community. Raise your voice. Think about people that you know in Berlin. Invite them to go there. Yeah. Use the hashtag Liebig34 to get informed about people that are having like huge repression right now in Berlin. And yeah, educate yourself. Talk to other people. Don't like if you are in doubt, like exchange about it. And also if you like. If you want to find a group, stick to a group where you feel comfortable. Because that's a part of, if a group is working in its own with like being really strong and everybody is telling how they're really cool activists, you will maybe feel bad and you will feel like you have to 
be a really cool activist too, but it might just be the wrong group and the right group might be a group where you by, by the first minute feel comfortable with and can ask questions. And it's also cool to reflect on like where you focus it, what is around you, don't use too much Facebook around you, it will hurt your brain, have nice people around you. It's also like... Um, yeah, thank you. So um, this, this sign could be... Um, could be uh, for any um, social injustice and for any discrimination that is happening in this world. Um, but I am showing it especially because I am here, but my heart uh, is actually right now with my friends um, that were like a long time with this house and the community around it, um, fighting for rights of women and fighting for rights of queer people um, and they are now facing uh, uh, like a huge blow um, by uh, having the, this capitalistic system and this um, uh, money hungry um, immobilian mic had um, evicting this important house um, and yeah, so I wanted to bring it up um, since I can't be there in person right now. Um, if you don't know it, just go read about it. And like, also that doesn't really necessarily apply to that example, but to any example where you are not directly affected. Um, because sometimes it can be hard as a, and I know that because I have been a long time priv being privileged um, by being read as a cis white male person and probably without I wouldn't be here today um, because I had a lot of um, advantages in education that I could access and like companies that I could work with and um, that were things that I could learn, everything that I am sitting here today. And um, I know that it's sometimes hard in this position to actually get the perspective right, to get the perspective that is not everything fine um, and that in this world there's like a huge amount of people, namely, black people, people of color, black indigenous, people of color, um, women of color, trans people, inter people, non-binary people. Um, and I can continue this list um, being, being discriminated like in many different ways. And I think it's important to understand also as a person who mainly don't uh, face discrimination to understand what discrimination means. It means that you're that you're that you are less worth. It means that you're discriminated directly from person to person. Like as a trans person, I am encountering direct violence. People threatening me. Um, your gender identity is questioned on every corner, and um, people are make are ridiculing you, and you're laughed at. Um, and at the same time, um, you're trying to. Um, make your life like everyone else is supposed to do with bureaucracy and you're getting systemically uh, discriminated because you're not inside um, you're not inside um, their system their uh, heteronormative um, cis gender system binary male female system you know they are not having a place there in their formulas for you they don't have a place for you in their medical system well they have but you have to fight for it while every normal every I, I get rid of this normal every cis person don't have to fight for access to medical health a system. Actually, it's also wrong what I'm saying because women actually have to fight for that. And that's also something to understand as a cis male person that not everything is okay. There's like a lot of things that you can relate to that is really important to change. And that is like actually uh, um, right now 
um, the big problem in the world is that not only capitalism, which we are mostly aware of, but power structures, and um, and yeah, that's where we as artists need to take responsibility, even though we are not affected, or even though you are not affected, and just make your homework. <laughs> Basically, read about queer feminism and read about um, read about racial justice and and see what you can do, like in in front of your own doorstep, like what is burning there which people are in your neighborhood are actually affected and go have to fight on the street to, for example, not be evicted um, from a queer house project, which is the only safe space since the last um, two decades in the city, and like the most important one. And um, yeah, maybe you can continue. Yeah. Luna, thank you so much for these words and thank you for... And actually, I think it's really important to, <laughs> to point out what has been done here as well. It's again care work by people who always do the care work, which is in this case like women and trans women, like women, sorry, sorry, sorry so much. But like, no, I mean, by women. And... Um, and even if this is like, it's not out of the blue, but I really want to point out that Luna, and she was in the first panel today presenting her works, and I think they are amazing. And I think this is something that should have so much more space. And if she wouldn't have the urge, and it is an urge to say all that what she was just saying, there would have been more space to actually present the amazing work she's just doing right now, which is, Maybe you remember this, this bot like spiral who like bot visual, visualization, um, which even if I mean, yeah, but like if you want to still want to share, but otherwise like you can re like maybe we just yeah then let's have a quick look at at uh, at Luna's project and then we wrap up the wrap up. Is that okay with you, Jeremy, as well? Because you haven't yeah, yeah. the chance I'm to back. say one word. <laughs> no, 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 sorry, I had audio trouble earlier. And um, no, I'm really enjoying listening. I'm wearing some jewelry, which I, I think I, 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 are, is a reference to Peggy McIntosh. I'm not sure if you're familiar with this concept of the privileged knapsack, the invisible knapsack we all wear with our privileges inside of it. But I decided it would be better as privileged jewelry because it looks more fabulous anyway. <laughs> but, uh, and uh, scrolling across my jewelry are some of the privileges that I maybe take for granted. But you know, it's great to be here with all of you. And I think you know, I, I, I love these reflections. I heard reflections during the panels today about various people's privileges. You're absolutely right. We need. I shouldn't be taking up any of the oxygen in the room. But as um, as you know, a queer presenting person myself, I really do appreciate this conversation and. Yeah, I just, um, but I also have privileges. Like I can be in the company of a room full of white people and feel pretty comfortable. And then I also feel like, wow, I can be in the comfortable, you know, among among people who have shared beliefs with me. So thank you for having me. And uh, yeah, I'll, I'll hand over, sorry. No, not sorry. Thank you so much for uh, this words. I would say that all the other people that they don't have to make over hours that much, we like, we, we keep it short, but it's important, like, you just say what you need to say, and then we say goodbye. So stick with us for two more minutes or three, and and then you can research about the project probably as well. Um, not yet, because it's work in progress that I'm showing. Um, yeah, maybe we can have my computer on the screen. Um, so, um, okay, where to start? So basically, um, when, when in 2016, Trump won the US election, I think everyone might still remember there were like discourses about Russian interference in the election and there were like a long process of um, seeking the truth um, about that and a huge um, mud fight in U.S. politics, and um, I, don't, I don't want to go too deep into U.S. politics, but what I want to do is to say that 
I've been in part particular interested in that phenomenon um, because um, it's not a phenomenon, f no, it's nothing that happens only in the US, but there's a lot of election interference and um, basically the undermining of trust in um, in the in the um, in the in democracy and um, undermining of trust in institutions um, that is happening from actors like Russia or Iran um, or North Korea um, that are basically um, totalitarian regi regimes um, that are not profiting from um, free elections in other countries. They are not profiting from dem democracy and uh, liberal values. And I sometimes hate to say liberal values because it's such a just trashed um, word and it's, it's still ignoring all minorities that are discriminated. Um, but, but there's like certain things that we take, take for granted um, that actually um, these um, foreign actors are undermining and they're doing it since a long time, since, the, since social media um, are chaining so much popularity. They are abusing it. So what happened is that I used to um, get my hands on these nine million tweets that Twitter and researchers um, identified as bot tweets. Um, generated by, um, with content generated by Russian troll farms, like huge, huge um, think tanks where people are producing fake news and research about social conflict in different countries and how it can be more polarized, and then feeding this into, feeding this into their botnets and they have produced between 2012 and 2018 um, 9 million tweets and um, I have visualized them here and you can and, and you can see um, that visualization is starting here in February 2012 and it doesn't run yet but you see in, in 25th of February in 2012 it was all about Atlanta. So these are hashtags that bots are feeding into our political discourse. Um, there's probably most of you remember when protests um, in Atlanta, some of the first, I'm, I'm not sure if I'm saying right, but it was like the early Black Lives Matters protests that were starting in Atlanta and um, Already then, bots from Russia were using that hashtag to influence the political discourse. They were basically um, they were basically polarizing the um, discourse by addressing. At the same time, they were making um, fake um, Black Lives Matters activists account, as they were doing fake alt-right and right-wing accounts um, and feeding both both um, political directions with fake news and um, or or conspiracy theories or memes that are just um, encouraging individuals to be discriminating to the other and um, so it goes on, this visualization, and you're basically not just seeing how they operate. We're still like in 2013, when it's like pretty less twe tweets, like the bigger the sphere, the, the larger is the reach of the tweet. Um, is each sphere, each sphere is a tweet? Each sphere is a tweet. And um, all the hashtags are the hashtags that are in that day, or like around that, maybe even week, I don't even know. But in that time that we are looking at. And we can just 
I am actually made a video here. It's an interactive application for that I use in the ongoing um, progress of this artwork as just to figure out what is actually happening and um, to make a narration. And like I'm still not finished. I'm working on um, bringing in more context about events like the Atlanta protests or Ferguson protests. But also um, there is like often you see a AfD or you often you see Berlin. And um, it's all around the world. They are basically um, the, the um, like this ERA, it's the Internet Research Agency that is believed to be funded from Russian Secret Service. Um, they're feeding this in the worldwide political discourse. And why I find that important to know about and to have a closer look and not just talk about it in news in a side sentence is that this is ultimately helping um, conservative right-wing um, regimes to chain power. And this is ultimately affecting minorities. And actually, not, if you say minority, it's not about less people. It's just It just means that it's not benefiting anyone else than this white man. So um, this white man might not be so much affected, other than they might, might have cut their health care in the US, which is hard enough probably for families. But um, already the, the um, Trump re regime was um, cutting back transgender rights in the US and um, they they have um, with with the help of these um, of these um, like synergist this um, huge political discourse manipulation they have been able to to reach things like that um, transgender women are not allowed anymore to go into uh, women homeless shelters. So you have to see what that means if a transgender woman has to go in a man homeless shelter when they are not, when they are already uh, facing homelessness and unemployment and being living on the street. They will face rape in um, men homeless shelters, just to bring that example. And this is directly connected to um, conservative totalitarian regimes are influencing our elections. Um, and this is just one example, the same like with um, how these um, discourse alterings are uh, encouraging, um, for example, in the US, white militias to to counter Black Lives Matter, unarmed Black Lives Matter protesters, and how this is encouraging um, police to um, police in the U.S. to 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 be violent and to shoot Black people, and um, how it is downplaying that. There's like it might be not it's not possible now to see that here, but if you have a closer look. There's also um, many tweets that are downplaying, that are actually downplaying um, the experiences of discriminated groups. There's like many, many um, things like army woman problems. You see, there's like black history as a tag, which from is twisting reality. From as I understood you before, you don't, it's not, you, you, of course you said you're still working on it, but as well, it's not that there is already a place where you can show it, even if I believe it would be like super important to actually show it now, right before yes. the American elections. Like, I think it's really, uh, yeah, it's, it's super sad that this is not out now. But I mean, not like blaming you, you no. are like, but just like that. 
why did nobody realize this before that this is an important mm. artwork and I feel as well like it's so it's so right as well in this place because this is a potential for our community as well to work like yeah. the way to work. So what is needed to bring yeah exactly out, like maybe that we can chat here like what is needed to bring this to. Mm. Yeah, if anyone has an idea, just uh, contact me. Like I, I'm actually um, uh, honestly, I was having this um, the whole year in in progress. I was a bit on hold um, because I, f I felt a bit like um, too much um, fighting with my own existential. Um, issues after coronavirus, um, but I always felt like it's super important. Um, but at the same time, also like exhibition spaces were not accessible anymore. And um, so, yeah, I'm super happy to receive <laughs> ideas or maybe curators are listening and wanting to bring it out somehow. Or press. I would. Uh I would love this to happen. Mm -hmm. People who are in, in charge and in power, please uh, be quick. Be quick. Okay, be quick. <laughs> and if if it's okay for for you right now, because I really don't want to cut you off, and I yeah. for me, but like just to have like the other artworks that are so. This, this is interesting. Yeah. Sorry. No. This is, this is the inauguration of Trump. So oh, I make there. a stop here. This is the day of inauguration of Trump. And like, so it's so much um, hashtags that you have to, it's so hard to see them and you have to filter and move around a bit. But yeah, you can definitely see a lot of Trump here. And it will be potentially as well an interactive work where you can kind of go to like around the, the mm -hmm. spiral. I hope. Yeah. Can we go to yeah, sorry. Can we go to present? Can we go to present day? Like, does it go all the way till now, to today? Sorry. Can we go all the way to today? Like, is it? Does it go to present day, to the current day? If it goes Not to today. the current day, to till today. today. No, uh, the Twitter data that they released, they go until I don't know, two thousand eighteen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I I thought about sharing because I was a bit like also thinking about people listening. I wanted to share one sentence from the speakers' corners before because Matthew said like become an activist finally brought up the feeling of participating in society again and how it should be and how mankind managed for a really long time to live sustainable on this planet and finally things make sense again. And I want to use it and to share it to again repeat that it's not about making anybody feeling bad, it's about getting allies, getting people in, making, showing possibilities where to find education, giving buzzwords, giving information on like actual political topics where there might be a lot and there for sure will be a lot around you. So it's not about you sitting at home feeling shitty being privileged because we are not here to comfort you and we're also not here to educate you. This is what you can do on your own. There's a lot of awesome knowledge out there. Thank you. Thank you Thank both. You. Yes, thank, you. No, thank you so thank much. You. No, no, this was like, <laughs> well, I, uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you both for sharing all this. And uh, I think that was... Unbelievable important input. I hope uh, that everybody else who was watching this sees this as well. There's a camera. Um, I would close this wrap up if that's okay for you three. Yes, we should also though just um, uh, make some space for the next present yeah, yeah. presenters or the final final program of the evening. Can you announce so, them? Yeah, yeah, of course. Oh, my cat just went right in front of the camera. <laughs> this is not, that's not, that's not. No, shh, shh. Okay. All right. Um, yes. Yeah. So, uh, so coming up next, actually, we have a, a, another Node Mutech uh, program of screenings, and we have two presenters. We have, I don't know, I cannot get the pronunciation right on this, and I don't think I'm supposed to, but Zur.Glub <laughs> or Zur.Glub and Ground will both uh, be presenting programs. Uh, Zur.Glub is going to present Redshift, uh, an audiovisual performance project. Frankensteining real-time 3D visuals with improvised electronic music. And um, Ground is going to present something called Limit Brick. Um, the, it's a duo, actually, premiering um, 
uh, some new work that's audiovisual performance uh, inspired by the notion of limits. Actually, they presented it at MUTEC in Montreal. So again, this is uh, our, our collaboration with MUTEC out of Montreal and, um, and two programs coming right up. Perfect. Cool. So uh, stay, stay with the programs, watch the performances. And uh, for the panels or for the uh, appetizer TV, as we see you tomorrow at uh, 2, I believe. Uh, no, at 4 <laughs> or 4.30. <laughs> I'm confused, but 4.30. <laughs> at 4.30. Don't, the guy, don't ask the guy in Canada. I'm six hours behind whatever you just said. <laughs> okay, yeah, we see you tomorrow at 4.30. Have fun, have good workshops. And um, uh, I hope, yeah, take a lot to think with you. And... Thank you, too, again. Thank you so much. Thanks. Bye. Ciao.